I believe that we should join forces too, Jeremy added. Count me in for the alliance. Sure, Olivia gestured her agreement. And me, count me in. Bella Bridges suddenly burst into the room exclaiming, I overheard you guys talking about forming an alliance and me too. Bella, what are you doing here? Steve waved his hand dismissively. You're not familiar with these matters, so it's best if you don't get involved. Steve, don't underestimate me, Bella retorted with a furrowed brow. Didn't you guys just mention forming an alliance? I'm one of the seven families. What's wrong with me joining? Adding you would be redundant, Steve shook his head. Liv, don't blame me for not warning you. Bella is a handful, especially with the talkative butler she has trailing her. Aiden is an exceptional butler, Bella corrected him. He excels in talking nonsense, that's for sure, Steve said with an embarrassed smile. Would you stop? Bella pouted and scowled. She was well aware that Steve's words held little weight. She approached Olivia and held her hand. Include me as well. I have been thinking this whole meeting the last three days have felt very off. So if people are going to form a new alliance based on transparency and decency, I want to be a part of it. Initially, she came to find Steve and unexpectedly stumbled upon his discussion about an alliance when she got to his door. Her gut told her that this must be a significant matter. Usually, she was closely monitored and treated like a child. At 16 years old, she was on the cusp of adulthood. So now, she wanted to do something noteworthy to gain her family's approval. Well, this still needs careful consideration. Olivia struggled to resist Bella's eager gaze. Although Bella was brimming with enthusiasm, she did seem very ill-suited for this kind of endeavor. Afraid that I won't be of any help? Let me tell you, I'm skilled in many areas. Come with me and I'll walk you through them one by one, Bella insisted as she pulled Olivia out of suite 1703. She believed that Olivia would accept her offer once she realized she could contribute. Bella had a wealth of knowledge. No, I, I mean that... Unable to withstand Bella's earnest enthusiasm, Olivia found herself being dragged away. Watching Olivia being led away by Bella, Steve turned to Jeremy and questioned, Why did you reveal Kong's plan to live? I didn't expect you to be so fond of her. Jeremy responded succinctly with four words. When lips die, teeth turn cold. What the hell does that mean? Steve asked. If one important thing falls, everything that has interdependent on that thing suffers. With that, he exited the suite and returned to his own room. Jeremy knew that the Kongs were asking the Jarabaldis to help fight the Park family. Next time, though, it might be the Jarabaldis that the Kongs conspired to turn against. Jeremy's eyes harbored a deep resolve. If that were the case, he preferred taking the initiative to strike first. The seven families had likely needed a reshuffling of the deck for quite some time. In his room, Steve pursed his lips and murmured, So that's how it is. While he may not have cared about the fate of the seven families, he relished the chaos and tumultuousness. Ultimately, everyone would find themselves embroiled in confusion and conflict. Given the circumstances, he needed to involve the Shook family as well. It would be most satisfying if the Shook family faced bankruptcy he thought mischievously. The situation would only become more intriguing if everyone participated together alongside the parks. Unlike his usual demeanor, Steve now wore a sinister smile on his face. His eyes brimmed with unending hatred and coldness, as if everything he had displayed previously was merely a facade. Elsewhere, Bella pulled Olivia into her room, suite 1706, and proceeded to play the piano for a full seven minutes. Olivia watched on, confused. How was it? Bella asked expectantly after concluding the last segment of her performance. How did you like it? That was from my most renowned piece, Moonlight Sonata. It sounded wonderful. In her previous life, Olivia had also studied the piano for a few years to blend in with the upper class. She could recognize Bella's advanced musical skills. So, what do you think? Are you considering recruiting me to be a part of your alliance yet? Bella asked hopefully. Uh, Olivia struggled to see the connection between the two topics and found herself at a loss. Just then, Bella's butler, Aiden, returned. He nodded politely at Olivia before addressing Bella. Miss, 
Did you just play the Moonlight Sonata? He had happened to catch the last part of the performance. Yes. Bella immediately became more composed. Yes, I did. Could you play it again? The tempo seemed slightly unstable. The butler suggested. Of course. Bella agreed, casting a helpless glance at Olivia. She had taken advantage of Aiden's absence to go to Steve's room. Now that he was back, though, she had to return to practicing music. I'll take my leave then, as I can see you're both busy. Olivia saw her opportunity to leave and seized it as she stood up. Take care, Miss Johnson. Aiden nodded in farewell. Olivia made her exit, and while Bella didn't want her to leave, she could only offer a slight pout and a graceful goodbye. We'll meet again next time. Have a good day. You too, Olivia nodded. As she turned to leave, she heard the melodious sound of the piano from behind her. Stepping away from the music, she walked out of the room and closed the door. Strolling down the corridor, the afternoon sunlight filtered through the windows, casting its glow on her. An occasional breeze tousled her hair. Back in her room, Olivia retrieved the pistol and gun cover that Duke Lee had given her. This marked her first interaction with the firearm. The pistol was small, its exterior shimmering in a brilliant silver, and there was a rose design on the side. The more she handled it, the more Olivia realized she liked this handgun. It resonated with her on a deeper level. Before long, Duke Lee, who had seen Jed off from the city, returned and knocked on her door. Have you familiarized yourself with the gun I provided? Yes, Olivia nodded, her gaze keenly focused on Duke Lee. Today, you must learn how to use this gun. Duke Lee asserted with a grave expression. She read his thoughts and saw that his journey to the airport to drop off Jed had been perilous. They had switched vehicles midway to avoid someone who was trailing them when they reached the outskirts of the city, but Duke didn't mention this. I understand, Olivia replied, her voice resolute. This pistol is a compact automatic handgun designed specifically for women. It's lightweight, easy to carry, and suitable for ladies, Duke Lee explained. He removed all the bullets from the gun, disassembled the entire firearm, and began reassembling it step by step. You don't need to memorize every single part. I'll tell you only what's necessary for now. You can learn the rest later. The urgency of the situation left little time for extensive instruction. All right, Olivia nodded, paying close attention. This is the magazine. It holds seven rounds. The gun barrel can chamber one round. Altogether, you have eight rounds. I've prepared an additional seven rounds for you. Duke Lee noted. They're already in the second layer of the gun cover. The process of loading the bullets is quite simple. You'll see once you do it. After a demonstration, he unloaded the bullets and reloaded the magazine. Got it, Olivia responded, observing Duke Lee's hand movements. This is the grip, the magazine, the front sight, the trigger, the hammer, the slide release, the safety, the barrel, the target. Duke Lee pointed out the parts. Rack the slide to chamber around, disengage the safety, aim, and pull the trigger. Understood. Olivia listened intently. Duke Lee pulled the trigger. I've removed the bullet. Try it. Okay. Olivia took the gun and followed his instructions. With a click, Olivia pulled the trigger, and Duke Lee nodded in approval. Good. He took back the gun. Now I'll teach you how to aim. When you shoot, considering air resistance and gravity, the bullet's trajectory forms a parabola. Pausing, Duke Lee pointed out in front of them. Now, this pistol has an effective range of about 165 feet. The bullet isn't particularly heavy. My expectation for you is that you can hit a target. Okay, Olivia said hesitantly. She was nervous she might let him down. When you aim, line up the target at 3 o'clock on the site. At this point, Duke Lee took out a practice pistol and a box of rubber bullets from his bag. Practice with this. He stood up and affixed a special target paper to the wall. Load the magazine, chamber around, and aim. All right. Olivia followed the instructions, aligning the sight with the target. After she pulled the trigger, she felt a slight recoil that numbed her hand. This was a practice handgun with reduced power. She couldn't fathom the impact of a real firearm. 
Not bad. Don't grip the gun too tightly. Stay relaxed. Duke Lee nodded. Now practice diligently so you feel comfortable with it. Okay, Olivia agreed. Though it was motivating to acquire a new skill, she secretly hoped not to have to use it too soon. After practicing for some time, it was almost 11 o'clock. Olivia felt her arms aching and going numb, particularly her palm and thumb. All right, I think that's enough for the night. Make sure you rest well tonight, okay? Tomorrow might be a long day, Duke Lee said, stowing the practice handgun that Olivia had been using and tidying up the training area he had set up. I just loaded the bullets for you and remember, never point it at anyone under any circumstances, he reminded. Got it, Olivia affirmed. You can secure the gun to your right thigh using this holster. Even if you wear a skirt tomorrow, it won't be noticeable. Duke Lee advised, showing Olivia a holster. Get a good night's sleep. Good night. Thank you for today, Olivia expressed her gratitude. You're welcome. If your hands are uncomfortable, use cold water to alleviate the discomfort, Duke Lee advised further. After ensuring Jed's safety earlier, Duke knew tomorrow they would find themselves in a precarious situation. He had the responsibility of escorting Olivia, who had no martial arts skills, so he furrowed his brows slightly. He needed to strategize now. After Duke Lee departed, Olivia toyed with the pistol briefly before setting it aside. She entered her bathroom for a shower, using cold water to soothe her sore hands. Her palms were red and slightly swollen, the tendons in her thumb and forefinger throbbing painfully. Olivia let out a sigh, hoping she'd never have to use the firearm in her lifetime. Once she changed into her pajamas, Olivia was prepping to sleep when she heard a knock on the door. Who is it? It's me. Olivia sighed and rose from the bed again to answer the door. Chris, you visit every night, aren't you tired? Today, however, she noticed that Chris didn't barge in as usual. Instead, he knocked before entering. What time are you leaving tomorrow? Chris asked as he entered. We're leaving at 10 in the morning. My flight departs at 1.30 in the afternoon. Olivia replied. Duke suggested we leave early. Duke? Chris's brows furrowed slightly, as in Duke Lee. You should keep your distance from him. Chris scanned Olivia's room, coming to rest on the gun cover on the bedside table. He approached, took the gun from the cover and examined it. Whoa, a Walter PPK? You recognize it? Olivia looked at Chris. Sven is a movie buff. The Walther PBK is Jane Bond's signature gun. Chris noted, studying the pistol in his hand. It's even an upgraded version. Do you know how to use this? I've picked up a little. Olivia shrugged. A little? Chris frowned. Human lives were precious, and handling such a dangerous tool with just a little knowledge was concerning. Just a little? What if something happens? I practice under Duke's guidance tonight, Olivia replied honestly. Chris gazed at Olivia for a moment, then sighed. Tomorrow, we'll follow behind your car and wait at the intersection you'll pass. We'll ensure your safety all the way to the airport, so please don't resort to using this gun. Okay, Olivia nodded. She could tell from reading Duke's mind that she may in fact be in legitimate danger, so she didn't mind having Chris follow her. He had proven that he had her back in the past, and he'd even saved her life once, so she trusted him. Besides, if his presence meant she didn't have to use the gun, she was willing to have him with her. It's a deal, she smiled. She took the gun from Chris's hand and placed it back into the gun cover. She really did have no intention of using it. Elsewhere, in a bustling room in Philadelphia, Pete Pell surveyed two middle-aged men who lay lifeless before him. Sir, these two were the drivers that Jed arranged for Olivia's transportation tomorrow? Pete's assistant told him. Send our people to replace them, Pete commanded with a snap of his fingers, and ensure that our replacements look similar in appearance to these two, so no one notices. Yes, sir, his assistant nodded, right away. In the early morning of May 4th, Duke Lee had organized the convoy and meticulously planned the entire journey. Following breakfast, Olivia bid farewell to Jeremy and Steve and said, See you in New York. See you soon, Steve replied with a wave of his hand. I still don't understand. We're all from New York, yet we didn't all take the same flight. 
My dad's secretary arranged it. Even I find it annoying, though. Olivia chuckled. Anyway, I gotta go, but I'll see you guys back at school. Take care on the road, Jeremy advised, nodding. Olivia waved and proceeded to enter the idling car. Duke, let's get going. Of course, Duke Lee said. Steve and Jeremy waved at Olivia from the roadside as Olivia's black car peeled away from the curb. Just as the car was about to vanish from their view, a BMW SUV pulled up in front of them. The door swung open and Jeremy's driver, Albert, seated in the driver's seat, spoke. Sir, I hope I'm not late. Upon receiving Jeremy's instruction, he promptly booked the earliest flight he could to Philadelphia, hoping to arrive on time. No, you're right on schedule, Jeremy replied as he entered the car. Come on, let's go to the airport, he told Steve. Huh? Jeremy, what do you mean? Steve asked. Their flight home wasn't scheduled until that evening. Why were they going to the airport so early? Are you coming or not? Jeremy glanced at Steve. Actually, it might be better if you didn't. No way! Upon hearing Jeremy's words, Steve promptly joined his classmate in the vehicle. If you don't want me to go, that's exactly why I will. Hmm. <laughs> Jeremy snorted, closing the car door firmly. Oh my god, Steve, take a look! Seeing Jeremy open a pair of boxes at his side, Steve was astonished. Are these desert eagles? Do you know how to shoot? Jeremy asked, eyeing Steve as they looked at the guns. Of course, Steve affirmed. Most individuals from the seven families were proficient in the shooting. They had been taught at a young age as a means of self-defense because families like theirs were often the victim of ransom kidnappings overseas. Jeremy handed him another box and instructed, assemble it yourself. Okay. Steve popped open the box and examined its contents. Frowning, he commented, You gave me a Colt M1911 instead of the Desert Eagle? Aren't these two significantly different? Yeah. Jeremy rolled his eyes, exasperated with the excess chatter. Whatever. Steve complied and swiftly assembled the gun. At the same time, a few streets away, Chris's team converged on Olivia's car from various directions. Once they were on the highway, they entered a stretch of deserted barren land. As they reached the outskirts of this region, the driver discreetly activated a communication device hidden in his pocket. The designated starting point for their operation was merely a few miles ahead. Stop the car, Duke Lee abruptly commanded. What? The driver was taken aback. Why stop at this juncture? The signal had already been transmitted. I said stop the car. Duke Lee reiterated, his brow furrowing. But, but this is the highway, we can't stop. The driver's heart raced like a drum. He prayed he wouldn't be exposed in this situation. I need to use the restroom. Duke requested, stop the car, I need to urinate. This... The driver clenched his teeth and turned off the engine. He couldn't stop the car now. Duke Lee exchanged a glance with the security detail seated in the front passenger seat. The latter raised his elbow and delivered a powerful blow to the driver's temple. He then swiftly took control of the steering wheel and executed a U-turn. Everything unfolded in a heartbeat. The car swayed slightly as it jolted to a stop. Stunned, Olivia was clueless about what had just transpired. This isn't the driver I hired. Duke Lee explained to her. The car came to a halt by the roadside. The front passenger swung open the driver's door, shoved the driver out, and slipped into the driver's seat, sealing the door. We'll backtrack down the junction and take an alternate route to approach from the next intersection, avoiding the compromised road. Duke Lee instructed the man in the passenger seat. Understood. The new driver acknowledged, swiftly steering the car down the road. A few blocks away, Pete's operatives received the signal, but spotted no sign of the targeted vehicle. Suspicious, they launched a search and soon found the unconscious driver on the highway's edge. The operative immediately reported back to Pete. Sir, what's our next move? It's fine, continue ahead and block their path, Pete said, his lips curling into a sinister grin. They won't escape my grasp. 
He hung up and drew a diagonal line and an X on a map with a black pen. If there's no gate into hell, we'll break in. Heading further north, Olivia's surroundings grew desolate. She looked over and watched Duke Lee's brow furrow. Stop the car, he said again. Of course, sir. His driver complied, hitting the brakes. What's the issue now? Olivia asked Duke Lee nervously. This path is incorrect, Duke Lee said, swiftly drawing his gun. Simultaneously, the front passenger drew his gun and aimed at Duke. But Duke's reflexes proved swifter. He eliminated the passenger with a single shot before shielding Olivia's eyes. Close your eyes, there's nothing to see. Okay. Olivia clenched her fist, her palms sweaty. She should have understood the car's occupant's intentions, but she'd been more focused on how scared she was to use her gun and hadn't been reading the thoughts of the driver and the man in the front of the passenger seat. Her oversight nearly cost both her and Duke their lives. The weight of self-blame mingled with lingering fear, an uncomfortable sensation. Exiting the car, Duke Lee dragged the deceased driver out of the driver's seat and then got behind the wheel himself. Then he took out his phone, only to find an extremely weak signal. He couldn't contact his people. Though he had placed operatives along the way, this was clearly a signal dead zone. Damn it, Duke Lee muttered, striking the steering wheel with his fist. Live, hold tight. Waiting for death wasn't an option. All right, Olivia nodded. At that moment, a bullet shattered the rear window and whizzed past Olivia's face. Get down! Duke Lee roared and quickly started the car. He stepped on the accelerator and the car rushed forward like an arrow. Behind them, a military armored vehicle closed in. Olivia huddled in her seat as a hail of bullets whizzed by her. Her heart raced, fingers white knuckled as they clutched the cushion. Just as the car was about to be riddled with holes, Duke Lee gritted his teeth and said, Liv, jump out of the car. Olivia's brain issued the command to leap out of the car and jump quickly, yet her rigid body couldn't move. Finally, after some coaxing, her trembling hands managed to pry the door open, but her legs remained immobile, thwarting her escape. Observing this, Duke's expression soured. His brows furrowed and he turned abruptly, using the car's momentum to fling Olivia from the vehicle. Simultaneously, Duke hurled himself from the car, and moments later, it careened forward into an embankment and exploded with a deafening bang. The explosion sent the pair flying several feet away. Ah! Instinctively shielding his head with his hands, Duke curled into a protective ball as he tumbled forward. The blast shockwave launched him through the air. Olivia experienced intense pain across her body. Her chest in particular ached, and every breath felt constricted and agonizing. Her ears rang, her stomach churned, and the world blurred before her eyes. This marked her second encounter with an explosion, and the experience remained profoundly unsettling. Come on, we mustn't linger. Duke's demeanor grew grave. Scooping Olivia, who was still reeling from the blast impact, he sprinted toward a shelter. Let's go. Witnessing their car's explosion, the pursuing military armored vehicle also halted. Six armed figures got out, each clutching a firearm. How are you holding up? Duke readied his gun and questioned Olivia. I'm getting better, she winced. Though her body still throbbed with excruciating pain, her vision and hearing were improving. Olivia regarded Duke, her eyes full of uncertainty. What should she do now? Do you remember how to shoot? Duke loaded his gun and asked. I do, Olivia confirmed extracting the firearm from her thigh holster. Yet her hands trembled more violently by the moment. The cool touch of the gun helped to slightly steady her nerves. Load the gun, release the safety, aim, pull the trigger, Duke directed, firing off a shot that accurately felled an adversary. Okay, Olivia complied, loading her gun and releasing the safety mechanism. She intended to aim, but her shaking had intensified, forcing her to grit her teeth and shoot blindly. The bullet grazed the ground beside the enemy's feet. Another shot missed its mark as well. Don't be so tense, Duke urged, steering Olivia to dodge incoming fire while returning shots with care. As the enemy drew closer, Olivia yearned for more accurate shots. 
Even if she merely clipped an assailant's leg, it would suffice. However, the more she fixated on precision, the more her aim faltered. With four shots fired, she hadn't hit a single target. Her body continued to quiver, her hand and wrist throbbing from the recoil. She had bitten her lower lip so hard that it left a neat line of teeth marks. Damn it! Duke's gaze hardened. He spotted the two remaining opponents hiding, seemingly out of reach. Then his gaze shifted to the sight of three additional armored vehicles closing in from the distance. Shit, he thought. He had only one bullet left, and with Olivia by his side, the precision shooting seemed unfeasible. At that moment, a BMW SUV appeared on the horizon, coming from the opposite direction. It sped up to where Duke and Olivia were, and its doors swung open, releasing a flurry of bullets that efficiently neutralized Olivia's nearby enemies. The vehicle executed a sharp turn and came to a halt not far behind Olivia and Duke. Jeremy and Steve jumped out in quick succession. Jeremy! Olivia was taken aback by their sudden appearance. What were they doing here? Wow, do you really have to only mention him? Steve remarked sarcastically, though his expression was earnest. He tossed two magazines to Duke and said, Here you go. Thank you. Duke acknowledged accepting the magazines. The approaching armored vehicles drew closer, disgorging a group of assailants who unleashed a hail of gunfire. The cacophony was deafening, a sensation similar to the buzz when the explosion had occurred. Olivia's sight wavered, and her heart raced while her chest constricted in distress. Each breath seemed rapid and labored. This extreme tension left her feeling profoundly uneasy. Her limbs seemed to defy her commands. Suddenly, her legs gave way, causing her to tumble to the ground. Watch out! Steve saw that Olivia was dangerously exposed now and frowned. Reacting swiftly, he reached out, pulling her to safety. However, a bullet cruelly punctured Steve's shoulder. Damn it! Steve yelled out. Agony radiated from the bullet wound in his left shoulder, causing his complexion to turn pale. Steve! Olivia shouted, stunned. Blood surged from the gaping hole in Steve's left shoulder. Desperately, she pressed her hand against the wound, but the warm blood seeped through her fingers. It proved impossible to stem the flow. Her mind blanked, and all she saw was the red blood before her eyes. The torrent of blood grew, and she cried out, No, don't die! Don't worry, I won't! Steve clenched his teeth, squeezing out the words. He wouldn't yield so easily. Albert, come stop the bleeding quickly, Jeremy ordered. Got it. Jeremy's driver, Albert, said, Sir, cover me for a moment. You got it, Jeremy nodded. He quickly switched his gun's magazine, providing cover for Albert. Albert guided Steve toward his SUV, using the vehicle as protection while he tended to Steve's wound. The acrid scent of blood wafted through the air, churning Olivia's stomach and the sight of Steve's blood on her hands drained the color from her face and lips. She shut her eyes against the agony as images flashed before her. A night full of rain, a vision dominated by crimson, the searing pain of her arm being crushed, the fleeting glimpse of a speeding sports car. It merged with the sterile operating room, her brush with the precipice of death again and again. She had been transported back in her memory to that night she died in her previous life, after Pamela and Mark ran her over. Upon reopening her eyes, her gaze held a steely resolve. A ruthless glint flared within them, catching Jeremy and Duke off guard. They palpably sensed the transformation and even sensed a cold, creeping chill in the air. Load the gun, disengage the safety, aim, pull the trigger. Olivia repeated this mantra in her mind. Raising the gun, she targeted the nearest adversary, delivering a shot to their lower abdomen. A swift follow-up shot struck another opponent's right shoulder. As the enemy's shoulder gushed blood, Olivia's eyes turned even more fierce and intense. Resurrection hadn't come easy, and she wasn't about to meet her end in this place. The battle reached a stalemate, but Olivia, who had initially had zero combat training whatsoever, now found herself contributing effectively. While her accuracy wasn't remarkable, she managed to hit an adversary with every few shots. Albert attended to Steve's wound, applying a rudimentary bandaging before quickly returning to Jeremy's side, 
determined to safeguard his young boss. Drawing in a deep breath, Olivia steadied her gun-wielding hand, despite its numbness from recoil. Surprisingly clear-headed, she maneuvered the firearm more adeptly, though her ammunition was running low. After a magazine change, she turned to Duke. Do you have any spare bullets? I'm out. Duke shook his head and glanced at Jeremy. None left. Jeremy frowned. Limited preparation time had resulted in scarce weaponry, considering the hassle of passing security checks. Damn it. Duke muttered under his breath, noticing two more armored vehicles approaching. It seemed that during the ongoing confrontation, their adversaries had summoned reinforcements. Sir, what's our next move? Albert looked to Jeremy, sweat glistening on his brow. He held a single purpose, to shield his boss from harm. Jeremy clenched his teeth, begrudgingly admitting their predicament. Regrettably, options were scant. Their SUV had already succumbed to a barrage of bullets, mercifully avoiding an explosion. Now, escape was implausible, given their remote, desolate location. There was no town or establishment nearby for refuge. Olivia gritted her teeth. She wouldn't meet her end in such a grim setting. Her vendetta remained unresolved. She couldn't allow herself to die. Gripping the weapon, a figure materialized in her thoughts. Chris, she muttered. What? Jeremy directed a quizzical gaze at Olivia. Looking upwards, Olivia focused on the road's end. He would arrive without question. Sure enough, a fleet of vehicles converged behind the enemy's armored cars. The subsequent events unfolded dizzily fast. Bullets poured from the rear, raining down like a deluge, dispatching all adversaries. Olivia's eyes gleamed. She knew he would come. Understanding Chris as she did, his promise to protect her would see fulfillment. Chris got out of his car and made a beeline for Olivia. He gripped her arm tightly, wrestling with a myriad of words but unsure where to begin. He wanted to explain that he was late because he and his men had diverted the assailants' attention, obstructing them from hurting anyone more than they already had. Sven had cracked Philadelphia's Transportation Bureau's traffic camera footage so Chris could keep an eye on Olivia as she drove and knew where she was when her vehicle was cut off from them. Throughout the journey, he'd prayed countless times for a safe outcome for Olivia. He yearned to reach them in time. Now, face to face with Olivia, a deluge of words poured out. Ultimately, he managed only to move his lips, voicing, I'm late. Hearing his thoughts as well as his words, Olivia was touched. Not at all, she said, gazing at Chris. Perhaps just in time was the more fitting phrase. Chris, we'll handle the aftermath here. Why don't you two go over there and make sure you are both in one piece? Sven indicated the dismantled SUV. Chris's gaze swept Olivia before leading her toward the vehicle. Jeremy observed the scene, brows furrowing, yet refrained from comment. Duke Lee's gaze narrowed slightly, uncertain about the circumstances that led Chris Jones arriving here. Rumors of the Jones family heir abounded, hinting at a darker identity. Unaware of the dynamics between Olivia and Chris, Duke needed to confer with his European counterparts to find out what they knew. But at least for now, Olivia was safe he figured. Upon his return to Europe, Duke would find out more. Chris led Olivia over to the battered BMW SUV, where they looked at each other in silence for a moment, before Chris finally asked, Are you scared? Yes. Olivia nodded honestly. Her fear had immobilized her, almost costing her life on several occasions. Sorry, I was late. Chris apologized well aware that he could have arrived earlier, sparing Olivia from these harrowing experiences. You were not late, truly, you weren't, Olivia smiled. Despite the frightening encounter, she hadn't emerged gravely injured, and her shooting skills had notably improved within this short span. Chris held Olivia's hand, concern evident in his gaze. Your hand? I'm okay. Olivia shook her head, certain in her reassurance. I knew you would come. I was certain. His heart warmed. The trust she vested in him touched him deeply, leaving him momentarily speechless. Emotions he'd managed to steady now surged fervently once more. He extended his arm, pulling Olivia into his embrace. Meeting her gaze, he bared his soul to her. He had realized he'd truly fallen in love with her, 
no longer just due to her utility to him, but because he cherished her as she was, Olivia. Olivia found herself taken aback as Chris enfolded her in his arms and as she read his mind. Now it seemed her favorable impression of Chris from the hotel incident had returned, only stronger. Coughing disrupted their moment and their attention shifted toward the noise's source. I've been shot and wounded. Could you find a different place to display your affection? Steve's voice sounded somewhat exasperated. Even when injured, however, he seemed to somehow sound slightly teasing and sarcastic, but a beat. Oh my gosh. Olivia shook her head, shocked and slightly embarrassed, her cheeks flourishing as she hurried towards Steve. How are you doing? I'm still breathing. Steve grinned. Even in this state, you're talkative. Olivia rolled her eyes at him. You won't be able to return to New York today. You should rest in Philly for a few days. Then ask Jeremy to stay in Philadelphia with me, Steve suggested with a playful smirk. Okay, I'll call Jeremy over, Olivia replied. You can tell him yourself. No, you tell him. Steve's grin widened. If you let him know, he'll definitely agree. All right, Olivia nodded. I'll give it a shot. Olivia got up and walked to the opposite side of the car. Surveying the impromptu battlefield, she walked over to Sven and Jeremy and gestured toward the military armored vehicles. What's the worth of all this, now that it's basically scrap metal? These are all decommissioned military armored vehicles, and military supplies are consumable. Typically, the price is pretty high for these, Sven replied. Can they be resold? Olivia asked. They were out in the middle of nowhere, so if someone could arrange for the vehicles to be picked up, someone could probably do something valuable with them. Uh, I'll check. Sven responded. He proceeded to examine the condition of this batch of armored vehicles. Returning, he stated, each vehicle could be sold for approximately 400,000. They're relatively new, even if they're decommissioned. Then let's sell them, Olivia grinned, and we'll give everyone in our group a fair share of the proceeds. She required funds to kickstart a business, so she was thinking like an entrepreneur now, making the best of every terrible situation she found herself in. How could she profit from this trauma, she wondered. Finding buyers might prove challenging, Jeremy mused. It'll be a black market, but if the price is dropped to 300,000, they should sell reasonably well. Then I'll leave it in your hands. Olivia patted Jeremy's shoulder and said, may I? Sure, Jeremy agreed, looking at Olivia. Steve is injured. I doubt he can return to New York City today. Would you be willing to stay and keep him company for a few days? Olivia wasn't entirely confident when voicing this. One reason was her lack of authority, and the other was her indirect responsibility for Steve's injury. If she wished to stay, she should, but Steve was asking Jeremy to stay with him. Sure, Jeremy nodded. He had brought Steve here, making it his responsibility to see to it that Steve's condition improved. Thank you, Olivia expressed her gratitude. Can I entrust the car sales to you? After her journey to Philadelphia, she planned to ask Ansel Parr for help. Olivia hoped for a capable assistant like Michael had in Ansel Parr. Hey, um, Olivia, not to cut this whole debrief after the bloodbath thing short, but it's time to leave. Otherwise, you won't catch your flight. Sven checked his watch and informed her. Oh, wait, didn't your flight take off at 1.30? I don't think we'll be able to make it. Let's reschedule. Olivia consulted her watch and decided. I'll contact Ansel Parr, my father's assistant. She'd prefer to hand this matter to Ansel anyway. Olivia aspired to have a personal assistant like Ansel one day. How long does it take from here to the airport? What's the time now? She asked. Well, the fastest we could get there would be like two o'clock, Sven estimated. So I'd change your flight to the four o'clock one so you have time to check your bags and get through security, he suggested. He and Chris were also on that flight so they could keep an eye on her and make sure she was safe. Olivia reeled, thinking how odd it was that they were acting so normal after just going through something so strange and dramatic. She'd basically been in a war zone on a distressed stretch of country road in the backwoods of Pennsylvania mere minutes ago, and now they were talking about changing flights like nothing had happened. Maybe Sven was talking about mundane things on purpose to keep her brain from reliving the trauma. Hmm, she thought suddenly appreciating the kind gesture on his part. All right, I'll do the four o'clock flight. Olivia nodded. 
turning to make a call to Anselpar. Meanwhile, Chris remained beside the damaged BMW SUV. Steve sat before him, appearing worse for wear. Chris regarded him in silence. Chris, you're staring at me so intently. I'm worried you might fall for me, Steve quipped, breaking the silence. You're really in a sorry state right now. Chris squatted in front of Steve, noting his condition. Really? Steve attempted to shrug, but found it arduous. You don't look like someone who would stab his grandmother three times in a row. Chris said with a sneer. Steve froze. How does he know about that? Steve asked himself. Nobody here knows about my past. Then again, he thought, maybe he shouldn't be so surprised by Chris's knowledge. Despite the Shook family's attempts to keep the matter under wraps and relocate him to New York City, news about Steve's past would inevitably reach the Jones family in London, wouldn't it? Since both families were based there. Similarly, the Kong family must have caught wind of it. Still, Steve chose to bluff. I don't recall having a grandmother in her 20s. Chris pursed his lips and refrained from further commentary. Well, not your grandmother by birth, but your step-grandma, the one your elderly grandpa married. It was indeed unusual for the elderly head of the Shook family to marry a 25-year-old at the age of 60. So Chris remembered it well when it happened. All the London tabloids went wild with gossip, but which wealthy family didn't have its eccentricities? Of course, not all the families had a grandson who was then accused of stabbing the step-grandma. Do you wish to speak to me privately, or is that all you wanted to say? Steve asked Chris. What do you think I want to tell you? Chris countered. Well, it seems you want to tell me that you believe I'm a ruthless killer. Steve retorted with a scoff, continuing. Do you see my presence by Olivia's side as a potential threat to her? Huh. Chris chuckled. People say you stabbed your grandpa's wife three times in a row. Did you really do that? He stood up, turning to leave. You don't strike me as a fool who'd commit such an act. Stabbing a family's matriarch like that? How foolish would one have to be to undertake such a risk? I remember hearing that you were the leading heir of the Shook family. You have no reason to jeopardize yourself in such a manner. As Steve watched Chris depart, the smile on his face gradually faded. Even an outsider like Chris believed in him. Yet his own family members turned against him, banishing him from London when people started fingering him for the murder of his step-grandma. Throughout the ordeal, the only individual who had faith in him was his younger brother, Daniel Shook. Upon Steve's expulsion from London, Daniel had vowed to sever all connections with the rest of the Shook family. His determination led to a brutal beating, and he subsequently fled in secret, hiding in Steve's car, leaving their family behind together. Strangers trusted Steve, while his own blood denounced him as a ruthless, heartless devil. They were swayed by the actions of a woman who had acted on her own accord. Steve, someone said. The sound of his name snapped Steve out of his revere. He focused on the speaker. Huh? What's the matter? I'm heading out. Olivia crouched down, facing Steve. You should rest and recover in Philadelphia. Jeremy agreed to stay by your side. Sure. Steve smiled. Travel safely. Watch out on your journey. I won't be able to swoop in and shield you from bullets anymore. <laughs> Olivia chuckled. She kneeled down to express her gratitude, saying, Thank you for today. What are you proposing to me? Steve laughed. Why would I offer myself to you? You clearly have enough on your plate as it is. Olivia retorted, trying to keep things light to distract him from the pain. Then she patted Steve's hand. I'll see you when we all get back to the city. Have a good time with Jeremy. Steve remained rooted in his spot for a moment, processing the situation before wincing in pain from his injury. Olivia got in a car that slowly wound its way back from the deserted backwoods of Pennsylvania to the highway before finally shakily arriving at the airport. As soon as she was safely inside, Olivia rushed to the restroom to change into a fresh dress. Her arms and legs bore severe abrasions, so she opted for a loose bohemian ankle-length dress to hide the bruises and cuts on her limbs. As she gazed at the gun strapped to her thigh, a sense of unease crept in. The mirror revealed bloodstains on both sides of her neck, prompting her to tidy her hair, letting it cascade over her shoulders. Having tidied up, she approached Duke Lee and asked cautiously, 
Will my gun really go undiscovered if I wear it like this? Yes, don't worry, Duke assured, making an okay gesture with his hands. We have TSA agents who work for us in the security line. All right, Olivia nodded in response, relieved by his reassurance. She rearranged her boarding pass, and though her heart was racing, she passed through security smoothly. Her relief only fully set in when she finally boarded the plane, though. With just one bullet remaining in her gun, she reserved it for only the most dire emergency. Once she sat in her designated seat, Olivia discovered that Sven and Chris were on the same flight. She remembered Sven told her to change her flight to this one. After some seat rearrangements with the flight attendant's help, the trio convened, exchanging lively conversation and laughter, eager to put the traumatic events they had just endured out of their minds and behind them. During the flight, they relished the provided dinner, followed by delectable pudding and ice cream. The two to three hours in the air passed without much strain. As they touched down in New York, night had blanketed the sky. Glancing out of the window, Olivia observed the twinkling city lights below. A mix of belonging and weight settled in her chest. She had returned to New York, her home and battleground. She felt like a soldier re-entering the fray. Despite feeling like a barrage of bullets possibly awaited her at some point once again, she couldn't retreat. To step back was to live only as a lifeless shell. She felt as though she had crossed an invisible threshold into a new phase of her life, one where her life's mission had taken on a new dimension. She would not just silently seek revenge on those who had killed her. No, now she would outwardly be fighting larger circles of people, organizations, who had been responsible for destroying her entire family. And I'm going to make them pay, Olivia vowed. The plane landed at JFK Airport. Stepping into the baggage claim area, Olivia spotted Ansel Parr waiting for her. Waving farewell to Sven and Chris, she approached Ansel and greeted him. Hello, Ansel. Welcome back, miss. Ansel Parr beamed, taking Olivia's small suitcase. I hope you had a wonderful trip, and it wasn't too bad. It wasn't difficult, it went well, she replied. At least she returned alive. Ansel, how's my father doing recently? She asked. Um... Ansel Parr hesitated briefly before responding. The company has been busy these days. Your dad's been occupied, often skipping meals. Understood. Olivia nodded. And you enjoyed your trip? Ansel Parr asked. Any highlights? Nothing comes to mind. Olivia kept her reply succinct. Upon their return to the Johnson family mansion from the airport, Olivia found her dad, Michael, reading a newspaper on the couch waiting for her. Spotting Olivia's entrance, he stood and greeted her. You're back. Yes, father, Olivia acknowledged. Have you eaten or are you hungry? Michael asked. Um, Olivia answered. I ate during the flight. Very well. Michael reached out and ruffled Olivia's hair. Get some rest then. Dad, there's something I need to talk to you about. Olivia fixed a deep gaze on Michael. Certain matters demanded her action and intervention now that she was aware of them. Sure. Michael surmised that the events might have occurred in Philadelphia that she would want to discuss, so he suggested, let's head to the upstairs study and have a conversation there. All right. Olivia agreed with a nod. Ansel, you can go home and get some rest, Michael instructed. Yes, sir, Ansel Parr responded. Ansel, thank you for the ride today. Olivia acknowledged, giving Ansel Parr a nod. You're welcome. It's my duty. Ansel Parr responded, his gaze carrying the hope that Olivia could urge Michael to maintain a healthy eating routine. After all, his well-being was a priority. Olivia grasped Ansel Parr's intention without a word, nodding almost imperceptibly. Seeing this, Ansel Parr laughed reassured. Michael directed one of the maids to carry Olivia's luggage upstairs before guiding her to the study. With the door closed, Michael asked, What's going on? What do you need to tell me? Dad. Olivia rolled up her sleeves, revealing a sizable arm wound, and then pushed up her hair, exposing the bruised sides of her neck. More shocking than what was visible at the airport. Lifting her skirt, the leg wound had already scabbed over in an unsightly state, 
What happened? Michael's eyes widened. Dad, I barely made it back. Olivia attempted to sound casual. There was an ambush on the way to the airport, so we changed our flight to later. An ambush? Who would do such a thing? Michael was startled. Why would someone attack his 17-year-old daughter during the gathering of the seven families? Olivia was but a child. I don't know. Olivia shook her head. Some matters couldn't be revealed now. Olivia, don't be scared. Michael gripped Olivia's hands and guided her to a chair by the desk. I'll arrange bodyguards for you immediately. No need. Olivia shook her head. Dad, that was in Philly. I believe they won't pursue us now that we're in New York. Who are they and why target you? Michael's brow furrowed. His thoughts were in turmoil. He couldn't fathom the reasons. I don't really know who they are, but... Olivia hesitated, then continued. I have a vague idea why. Why? Michael looked at her, intrigued. I met someone in Philadelphia. He was also attending the meeting. Olivia explained. His name is Jed Park. Park? Michael composed himself, his heart sinking, as in, the Park family is back. It explained a lot. Yes, Olivia nodded, aware of what Michael was thinking. Dad, did my grandfather, my mom's dad, upset the seven families? Is he a bad person? No, Michael shook his head. While your grandfather's temperament is eccentric, he's not evil. Quite the contrary. He's a remarkable man. Michael held a deep admiration for Andrew Park. Dad, then why would someone want to kill me? Olivia pressed. It's not just me either. Jed was ambushed too. Really? God, how's he doing? Michael asked. He's all right. Olivia shook her head. He managed to escape as well. He's probably back overseas by now. Is your grandfather's family abroad? Michael mused aloud. The thought of Victoria's potential joy upon learning the Park family was alive and well came to mind. He wished he could see her face when she learned the news. Yes, Olivia responded, offering Michael a playful look. Dad, the people from the Seven Families seem really strange. I don't like them. The Seven Great Families have been separated for so many years. Michael sighed. Olivia, you'll have to interact with them frequently in the future. Just be civil when you're around them. I understand, Olivia nodded. But the Park family is also one of the seven big families. So why does it seem like they're all distancing themselves from my grandfather? When someone's intellect is remarkably brilliant, I can't help but invite jealousy from others. Michael furrowed his brows slightly. Olivia, how's your grandfather doing? I heard from Jed that he's doing fine, Olivia affirmed. Dad, they were quite surprised about your separation from mom. Jed and the rest of the park thought you two would still be together. Michael's head dropped slightly at the mention. He had pledged to Andrew Park that he would care for Victoria for the rest of his life, but he had broken that vow now. Right. Olivia shifted the conversation, inquiring, Dad, have you found the 20 million? Not yet. Michael's gaze flickered. Let's not discuss this right now. Why not? Olivia could tell Michael was evading her. She surmised that he might have discovered the involvement of his own father and Bruno. 20 million is a significant sum. I'm aware. Michael glanced at the stack of papers on his desk. Olivia, go back to your room and rest. I need to work. All right, all right. Olivia stood up, not pressing further. She knew the anguish in Michael's heart. He was an adept at expressing his emotions. The ones causing him pain were now his father and his own brother. Even if they had repeatedly acted against him, Knowing Michael's nature, he wouldn't retaliate. He could only feel hurt and seek introspection. At present, Michael was likely struggling to face this harsh reality. Olivia understood that changing Michael's perspective wasn't something that could be accomplished in a mere day or night. The more challenging it seemed, the more she couldn't give up, however. Shutting the study door, she inhaled deeply. It was apparent that it was time to help reshape Michael's mindset. As she descended the staircase, Olivia crossed paths with Monica and Rachel. Seeing Olivia's returning demeanor, Monica grinned. Wow, Olivia, back already? Yes, Olivia replied nonchalantly. Olivia, was Philadelphia enjoyable? Rachel asked, also directing her gaze toward Olivia. 
She had anticipated Olivia's downfall when Bruno informed her of his plans to attack her on her way out of town. Yet, Olivia managed to escape with her life. Absolutely thrilling, Olivia responded with a hint of mischief. She paused, regarding Rachel thoughtfully. I heard quite a bit of gossip in Philadelphia, though. Pretty juicy gossip, too. Olivia shook her head. Initially, I thought having a daughter-in-law and father-in-law affair like the Cooper family was already salacious enough. To my surprise, I heard tales of certain affluent families engaging in inappropriate relationships, including sister-in-law and younger brothers. She said this while giving a pointed look to Rachel. The wealthy circles are truly rife with all sorts of scandals, aren't they? Rachel's face drained of color, shock evident in her expression. Does Olivia have inside information about me and Bruno? She worried. Olivia, the Cooper family scandal passed a long time ago. There's no need to bring it up anymore. Monica chimed in, unaware of the connection between Rachel and Bruno. She simply presumed that Olivia was intentionally mentioning the Cooper family matter to embarrass Rachel and Monica. True, it's been a while, Olivia acknowledged, her gaze shifting to Rachel. Monty, Rachel, you must be disappointed that I returned alive, aren't you? Rachel's heart raced, and her palms grew damp. She couldn't tell if Olivia was simply pretending to have heard gossip to mock the Cooper family's past, or if she genuinely knew something. Rachel forced herself to appear composed. You're tired, my dear, that's just your imagination talking. My mom's right, Monica added with a light smile, nodding. While she secretly hoped Olivia wouldn't return, she couldn't express such thoughts openly. You really like teasing, don't you? Then take it as a joke. Olivia offered no further words and walked past Rachel and Monica to retreat to her room. Rachel clenched her fists, unease gnawing at her. Monica pursed her lips. She believed her recent performance had endeared her to Michael. If given more time, she was certain she could solidify her position in Michael's heart. However, just when she was gaining ground, Olivia returned like an unforeseen specter. That was annoying. Monica muttered under her breath before taking a deep breath to quell her frustration. She couldn't afford to let her emotions show. She needed to mimic Olivia's demeanor flawlessly. Monica, it's time for you to head to bed for the night. Rachel's expression soured. Mommy has some matters to attend to. All right, Mommy. Monica acquiesced and returned to her room. See you tomorrow. In the empty garden, Rachel dialed Bruno's number. Olivia's survival and potential knowledge of Rachel's affair were both deeply unsettling. As soon as Bruno picked up the phone, Rachel said, Does she know? He didn't even have time to say hello before Rachel added, About us, does she know? Bruno remained silent for a prolonged moment before stating, She doesn't know. Bruno had been cautious in their past dealings. His involvement with Rachel, she shouldn't overthink it. Your focus should be on instructing Monica to perfect the tasks I assigned. We can't afford any delay, he emphasized, aware that time was running out. Fine, understood, Rachel replied, though her concerns persisted. Can we eliminate Olivia in New York just to be safe? My father won't approve of that, Bruno asserted. Don't worry about this. Concentrate on training Monica daily. Everything needs to be executed flawlessly by July. Okay, Rachel complied. After ending the call, Rachel stared at the moon in the night sky. The moon, round and glowing and high in the sky, was veiled by clouds and slightly dimmed. One wrong step. One wrong step at a time, Rachel repeated to herself. She had erred 15 years ago, resulting in a lingering disaster involving Bruno. Why had she repeated her mistake this time, despite loving Michael deeply? Closing her eyes, Rachel bit her lower lip gently, displaying a hint of remorse. When she opened her eyes again, her expression had transformed into one of determination. This secret must not reach Michael, she told herself, even if it meant opposing Grandpa Jack. Olivia's lips had to be sealed, permanently. Rachel couldn't allow Michael to know what she had done with Bruno. Her love for Michael surpassed everything else, and she would not let anyone take her beloved away from her. No one. In her room, Olivia cleaned her body and used the medicine Jeremy had provided to tend to her wounds. 
Luckily, they were all pretty superficial injuries, but they were numerous. The force of the explosion had been quite intense when she landed. She remembered tumbling several times. At that moment, her phone began to ring. Setting her medicine aside, Olivia picked up the phone. Hello? It's me. A male voice came from the other end. Jeremy. Olivia responded eagerly. How's Steve? He's doing all right. He's already asleep. Jeremy replied. His wounds have been treated. We're scheduled to return to school on May 10th. That's good, Olivia said, relieved. She glanced at her nails, which had grown slightly longer these few days. Despite Steve's sarcastic remarks and friggly demeanor, he's genuinely a good person. Agreed, Jeremy acknowledged and continued. I've listed the armored cars for auction on the dark web. We've set the initial bidding at $250,000 per vehicle. The firearms have also been posted at a lower price, and we should get some bites by tomorrow. That's great, Olivia smiled. Just remember to share some profits with me when the time comes. All right, Jeremy replied. How are you feeling now? Me? I'm fine, Olivia answered, then glimpsed at her bare upper body in the mirror, covered in scattered blood stains and large bruises. She hesitated briefly, offering an awkward smile. Mostly. Then get some rest, Jeremy said before ending the call. Good night. After hanging up and taking an Advil, Olivia donned a soft cotton nightdress and organized her school bag. She'd be returning to school tomorrow since she was back home. With her things neatly arranged, she settled down to sleep early. After all, she needed to recover her energy. For almost the entire last month, one thing after another had kept her busy. Finally, back in her own space, Olivia felt a sense of relief. Before long, she drifted off to sleep. But while Olivia finally slept soundly in the safety of her own bed once again, there were individuals elsewhere who wouldn't find rest for several nights. Damn it! Pete Pell yelled in frustration, hurling his cup to the ground. His resources had been seized, and even the weapons and armored vehicles were being advertised on the dark web by his enemies. All of it belonged to him. Sir, what's our next move? A concerned subordinate asked Pete. What else can we do? Buy them back. Pete's tone was grim. Those items were brand new investments and assets. Olivia and Jed were alive and well, and Bruno had made a mockery of him by slashing the ten million down to five. It was a blatant humiliation. At the same time in New York City, Sven balanced a bowl of freshly cooked ramen noodles in one hand while keeping his eyes on his computer screen. Chris, Jeremy has listed the vehicles online, on dark web and elsewhere. Is anyone bidding yet? Chris asked. Yes, there's one person as of right now, Sven reported, glancing at the list. Look into them, Chris said with a smirk. I have a feeling it's mostly Pete Pell. Sven chuckled, taking a big bite of instant noodles before setting the bowl aside. While chewing, he rapidly typed on the keyboard. After hitting the enter key, he grinned. I think this really may be Pete. Let's join the bidding with him then, Chris suggested, a playful glint in his eyes. Those items are new. Let's engage with him gradually. We'll match 80% of the starting price. Chris, you're quite cunning, Sven chimed in with a mischievous smile. But that's exactly what I was hoping for. In Philadelphia, Pete's subordinate was informing him about the situation. Sir, we're being bid against by someone. Let's match their bid, Pete responded, his brow furrowing. As the bidding reached 80%, Pete hesitated. Are we still continuing, sir? The subordinate asked. No, don't bid anymore, Pete replied, his expression tense. Despite his anger, he understood the situation. No matter how high the bidding went, it wasn't worth it now. He could use the money more wisely to acquire new equipment. Sir, the opposing party has withdrawn from the bidding, the subordinate informed him. In that case, let's proceed, he decided. Understood. The subordinate nodded and processed the payment on the dark web. Jeremy met the dark web personnel the following day. He handed over the payment and received the items. Who is the seller? Pete asked when the goods arrived. I'm sorry, I'm only responsible for delivering the goods. If there are no issues upon inspection, please confirm receipt. 
The man handing over the goods replied with a smile. Though Pete was irritated, he gestured for his subordinate to proceed with the inspection. Once it was confirmed, he nodded. Thank you, Pete expressed his gratitude. As the man left, Pete turned his attention to his subordinate. Why didn't you capture and interrogate him? He's not just a delivery man, but likely connected to the seller. His subordinate quickly lowered his head upon being scolded. After receiving the payment, Jeremy checked the amount. The total value of the armored vehicles, firearms, and ammunition amounted to just over a million dollars. He texted Olivia how much he would give her after splitting the profits evenly, and then requested her bank account details. $160,000? Olivia read the text message on her phone, taken aback. She had initially hoped to make a few thousand dollars at most from the sale. Who would have thought she'd be getting such a substantial share? Hey, Liv, you're up for the 800-meter run soon, Millie said, pulling Olivia's focus. Ready? Olivia looked up, remembering she was at track practice. She immediately put her phone away. Always ready, Olivia feigned seriousness, giving a playful salute. Sorry you have to run an 800-meter test as soon as you return from break. Quite unlucky. Wendy noted, resting her chin on her hands. Since sports practice had started up again, she had developed a liking for running. Running 800 meters was quite manageable for her. Group 4 gathered the starting line? The sports teacher called out from a short distance away. That's me. Olivia clapped her hands together and walked toward the runway. Here goes nothing. Standing on the track... Olivia noticed Pamela Cox approaching as well and preparing to run the 800-meter timed trial, too. Pamela, donning a yellow pair of running shorts, was warming up next to her, moving her limbs in preparation for the test. Olivia, where were you last week? Pamela's irritation surged as she recalled her absence. Pamela thought back to her own past week. Mark Delillo had visited from Chicago because Pam coaxed him here using Olivia as an excuse claiming she had plans with her that Olivia bailed on last minute. Pamela had then spent two days with Mark. By May 3rd, though, the ruse could no longer be upheld. When Pamela called Olivia, she discovered her number had been blocked. Getting Olivia's number from the Johnson family mansion was no simple feat. It turned out that Olivia had been out of New York City altogether. When Mark departed from New York, Pamela couldn't imagine how she would explain his absence. Frustration surged as she mentally berated Olivia countless times. Why should I tell you? Olivia cast a glance at Pamela. You! Pamela bit her lip. A notion struck her, causing a smirk to curve Olivia's lips. How about this? If you can run faster than me, I'll spill the beans. No. Pamela's face reddened. That's not fair for me. Today marked the beginning of her menstrual cycle and she was already feeling uncomfortable. She needed to run this race to make her coach happy, but she didn't want to give it her all because her cramps were so bad today. That's your problem, Olivia said, hearing Pamela's thoughts and understanding her reasons for not wanting to race Olivia. But that's why Olivia made this proposal. Don't push it, Pamela clenched her teeth, finding Olivia more repulsive than ever. Olivia gestured toward her temple, remarking, you were the one who wanted answers. You expect to gain something from me without exerting any effort? Do you believe the entire world revolves around you? <laughs> How absurd. Pamela stared at Olivia, reluctantly conceding to her point. She realized that if she wanted to make Mark happy again, it would help if she could tell him exactly where Olivia had been this past week. So this race might be her only option to find out. Fine, if I can beat you, you must tell me where you were. You also need to clarify things with Mark DeLillo since you essentially stood him up when I told him you and I would hang out with him. Pamela didn't want Mark to believe she'd been playing games with him or stringing him along. It wasn't her fault that Olivia had left New York City. She didn't even know about it. Clarify? Olivia sneered. Pamela, is your language teacher the same as me? What you want isn't an explanation, but lies. Regardless, are you agreeing to do what I want if I win this little race or not? Pamela lifted her chin challengingly. Fine, I agree. Olivia snorted coldly, a hint of a smile playing on her lips. At that moment, their coach called out. 
Students from group four on your marks. Upon hearing the signal, Olivia and Pamela both positioned themselves on the starting line for the race. Get set, go. At that moment, both girls sprinted off at full speed. Pamela had previously been part of the track and field team in middle school. Though she hadn't continued training in high school, her foundation remained. Her experience and skills were still intact. While Olivia had put in effort to prepare for the sports event, she had since stopped. Running now proved strenuous for her. Both girls exerted themselves to reach the finish line. Only within the final 50 meters did the gap appear relatively small. Finally, as they crossed the finish line, Pamela was 0.35 seconds ahead of Olivia. Panting, she raised her chin, declaring, Olivia, now you have to tell me and make things right with Mark. For the first time, she had triumphed over Olivia, and a surge of pride filled her. This was just the beginning. She intended to repeatedly surpass Olivia in the future, asserting her superiority. God, Olivia panted heavily. Her physical stamina fell short. It seemed she needed to incorporate daily exercise into her routine. All right, Olivia admitted defeat, willing to bet and disclose the information. I'll tell you, I... Before Olivia could finish her sentence, a girl's voice interrupted. Pamela, you're bleeding! All heads turned to Pamela. She too was taken aback and quickly touched the back of her leg. Sure enough, she saw blood. Oh no. Olivia drew in a sharp breath. Pamela's shorts from her buttocks to her thighs were entirely saturated in red, the blood spreading rapidly. Pamela's face instantly went beet red. The flush that had colored her cheeks moments ago then began to turn crimson as embarrassment washed over her. The boys on her team pointed and laughed at her. Quick, cover it up! A girl who had just crossed the finish line rushed over, stripping off her sports jacket and tying it around Pamela's waist. Um, yeah, you can keep this jacket. No need to return it to me. Sensing the stares of those around her, Pamela's mind went blank. A buzzing noise filled her ears, her vision blurred, and she toppled backwards. The last thing she heard before losing consciousness was the girl who had offered her jacket, exclaiming, Coach, this is bad. Pamela lost a lot of blood and fainted. One girl yelled. Why, why did they have to mention be my name? Pamela came to and thought. So now everyone knows. This was her final thought before she passed out again. Observing the scene, Olivia couldn't help but feel slightly bad for Pamela. It seemed like Pamela's luck was truly unfortunate. During this year's physical fitness assessment, all the student athletes were assembled on the sports field. So Pamela lay on the track at the center, enshrouded in front of everyone in what would be quickly coined the field of blood. I didn't even have to do this one, Olivia thought. It seems the universe is working its own karmic magic against Pamela without me even having to lift a finger sometimes. She smiled slightly, seeing this as a sign that Pamela deserved everything that was happening to her. I suppose, Olivia thought, it's meant to be then. After having lunch, Olivia's plan was to take a nap in the classroom. However, that plan was quickly disrupted when Francis approached her with a thick folder in hand. Hey Liv, mind if I join you? I'll sit in Jeremy's spot and discuss something with you. Francis said. Sure. Olivia gave up on her afternoon nap and stood up to make room for him. Thanks. Francis took a seat in Jeremy's place and said, I'd like to show you Wendy's designs and ideas. He extracted a pile of papers from his folder. These are Wendy's drawings. I believe they have a lot of potential. Absolutely. Olivia accepted the papers and examined them. Wendy's distinctive style was unmistakable, reflecting her cute yet industrially inspired touch. Wow. After evaluating them individually, Olivia nodded. These are quite good. Great, so now that you've seen these concepts, do you prefer 2D or 3D for the game? Francis asked. Let's combine the two. Employ 3D for character modeling and 2D hand-drawn environments. This should streamline the production process considerably, Olivia suggested after a moment of consideration. Another issue is the challenge of game development. Francis admitted with a furrow brow. Doing it on my own is proving to be quite tough. Programming alone isn't sufficient. Hmm, 
Olivia acknowledged the difficulty. Just then, a male voice from across the room broke in. Olivia, can you step out in the hall for a moment? I need to talk to you. The voice requested. Zach? Olivia turned in the direction of the voice. Sure. She signaled for Francis to wait momentarily before following Zach Colston out of the classroom. Once they found a quiet corner at the end of the hallway, Olivia said, Zach, what's going on? My sister's surgery was successful. Everything went well. Zach expressed his gratitude with a deep bow. I owe this to you. Thank you so much. I'm relieved the surgery went well. That's fantastic news. Olivia replied with a smile. Just please make sure your sister gets plenty of rest. And if you guys need anything in the future, please, please let me know. My parents have always wanted to repay you, but I'm not sure how to go about it. Zach rubbed his hands together, appearing somewhat distressed. Repay me for what? Olivia patted Zach's shoulder. I just lent you some money. You can return it whenever you're able. There's no need for you to feel obligated. I overheard you and Francis talking about the need for some programmers for a game you're developing. I understand you're involved in it, right? Zach said as he looked up at Olivia. I'd like to help. Wait, really? Olivia brightened up. Do you know programming? Yes, Zach affirmed. My father is a programmer and my sister and I picked up some knowledge from him. Additionally, my sister works in a research and development company. I've learned a bit about game development from her insights. I figure maybe this is how I could pay you back by offering my expertise or well, what little expertise I do have. It's the least I could do. That's fantastic, Olivia exclaimed. You're welcome to join us. We'll provide compensation for your contributions too, of course. You don't have to pay me. Just the opportunity to assist is rewarding enough. Zach responded with a quick wave of his hand. And to repay you in any way I can. Olivia smiled, her heart warmed. Come on, follow me. After Olivia finished speaking, she led Zach back to the classroom. Francis, I found you an extra pair of hands. Hmm? Francis looked away from Wendy's artwork and turned his attention to Olivia. You found help? Exactly. Olivia gestured towards Zach. Zach here knows how to program. Really? Oh my god, that's fantastic news. Francis's eyes brightened with enthusiasm, realizing this could significantly ease his workload. Do you plan on creating a computer game or a mobile game? Zach asked. Computer game, Olivia answered. To monetize, we can sell in-game items like weapons, magic, equipment, and unlockable levels. Zack thought for a moment before remembering something. There's a mobile game competition scheduled for July, too. Participating might save us some advertising costs. I'm familiar with that competition, Francis nodded. However, we're still in the initial stages of design. I'm concerned it might be too late. We can make it if we work together, Zack affirmed. As long as we provide the core technology and original design, we can outsource other aspects of the project. Outsourcing? Wendy, who had just come over to find Olivia, was taken aback. Is that really an option? Of course, the market has numerous game outsourcing firms. Zach explained to Wendy. With our core game elements controlled, we can directly handle character modeling and embellishments while outsourcing the rest for a faster development process. What about the costs? Olivia asked. It might be pricier to hire directly, but I can seek assistance from my sister. Her company specializes in online gaming research and development and has connections with various outsourcers. Wouldn't your sister still be recovering from her surgery? Wendy expressed concern. It doesn't seem appropriate to disturb her. I recall your sister recently underwent surgery for a benign tumor. She should rest. It's not a problem. A simple phone call will suffice. Zach reassured. He knew his sister would be glad to help Olivia, considering all she's done for their family. Thank you. Olivia expressed her gratitude. Then let's set our sights on the July Mobile Game Competition. Agreed. The others nodded. Given that, let's delegate responsibilities. Zach proposed after a brief pause. Things are a bit scattered right now. Assigning roles will help streamline our efforts. Sounds good. Olivia glanced at the time. We have a class soon. How about this? Jeremy and the others should be back this Saturday. 
we can convene then and discuss further. She remembered Jeremy was also part of their team, and she felt bad leaving him out. That works, they agreed. Zach then turned his attention to Wendy's design drafts, making some adjustments to accommodate the transition to a 3D model. Most changes were to prevent awkward intersections in the 3D environment, and Wendy was receptive to his suggestions. As the small team's dynamics improved, Olivia felt a genuine sense of satisfaction. By the way, what company does your sister work for? Olivia asked Zach. Confluence Technology, Zach replied. She's part of the research and development department there. Confluence Technology? Olivia was taken aback, glancing at Wendy. The one on the fourth floor of the Flatbridge building at 276 Commerce Road? Wendy asked. Yeah, you know about it? Zach wondered. My mom used to work there. Olivia stated after a brief pause. She was in the finance department. What a coincidence, Wendy chuckled. Indeed, Zach concurred. Speaking of the finance department, my sister mentioned that the department manager there was pursuing one of the employees. The employee seemed to be more senior than the manager. He revealed that his sister often shared tidbits about the company with him. Apparently, the whole company knew about it except for the employee. Olivia and Wendy exchanged glances again, finding the situation quite awkward. Liv thought of Nate Evans, the manager who seemed to have a crush on her mom, but she let it go for now. She had more important things to focus on. On May 10th, Steve and Jeremy returned to school for reporting. Steve's shoulder was still in the process of healing, but he had managed to avoid any bone injuries. Now, with the healing process underway, his main issue was the itching from the new tissue. To prevent anyone from accidentally touching his healing shoulder, he stood at the front of the classroom on his first day back and announced, I injured my shoulder during my family vacation, but please refrain from giving me overly enthusiastic hugs or anything like that. I might not survive it. He wasn't sure if his reflexive reaction to pain would lead to a potentially fatal collision with someone else. Is it that bad? Everyone looked at Steve, noticing that he still appeared a bit pale. Just keep it in mind for now. Steve's dealing with an injury, so let's all be mindful of that and offer our support in other ways. Just avoid touching his shoulder, their teacher explained. What happens if we do touch it? Someone asked with curiosity. It might start bleeding, Steve replied. Haha. <laughs> Both Olivia and Millie burst into laughter simultaneously, remembering the incident with Pamela during the sports test. A few feet away, Pamela's face turned sour wanting nothing more than to forget that embarrassing memory. The rest of the class remained silent, recalling the incident as well. Perplexed, Steve glanced at everyone, unaware of his blunder. What did he say wrong? What was wrong with mentioning the bleeding? He exchanged a puzzled look with Jeremy, who also seemed baffled. Their teacher, Adam, was pondering how to shift the topic to avoid any more awkwardness in his classroom when Steve interjected. I'm weirded out by the sudden silence in the air. What is going on? Steve's words amused everyone and they snickered. All right, all right, Adam said. Everyone, let's get started on our lesson. You two, get back to your seats. They returned to their seats. Wendy had been anxious since learning about Steve's injury. She kept her eyes on his shoulder and fretted, her hands anxiously interlocking. Wendy found it difficult to concentrate during the lesson, her mind consumed with concern for Steve. As the class concluded, students gathered around Steve's desk, inquiring about his well-being. Despite Steve's subsequent transfer to another school, he remained cheerful and amiable, making him quite popular in the class. Wendy was eager to ask, but her courage faltered. Instead, she approached Olivia and whispered to Jeremy. Jeremy, do you know how Steve got injured? Jeremy glanced at Olivia, who nodded, and signaled for her to come closer. Step over here and I'll tell you. Wendy leaned in, and Olivia spoke in a hushed tone. It was a gunshot wound. What? Wendy's eyes widened in shock, her heart racing. A gunshot? What was happening? Why did he have a gunshot wound? Her voice unintentionally grew louder, attracting the attention of those around her. Horrified, Wendy covered her mouth with both hands, casting anxious glances at Olivia. To her, guns were something she only encountered on television. Wendy, don't look so surprised or you'll attract more attention, 
It's as though you've never seen the world. Oh. Wendy was taken aback, her understanding dawning as Millie came in and started listening to the conversation too. She heard everything that had been said thus far. After class is over, let's go outside and talk, Olivia suggested, as there were matters they needed to discuss with a little more privacy. Sure, Wendy agreed, though she still felt a sense of unease lingering within her. Don't overthink it, Wendy, Millie comforted, putting her arm around Wendy's shoulder. Just because he was shot doesn't mean you are going to be. If there were any real danger, why would he even come to school? Would he be foolish enough to attend school just for some trivial test if someone were after him or something? You're right. Wendy nodded, temporarily reassured. After the second period ended, Olivia led Millie and Wendy out of the classroom, heading to the rooftop of the building. In truth, Steve got hurt because of me. Olivia explained after a moment's thought. I was scared and didn't move in time. Steve got shot trying to protect me. What? How did this happen? Wendy was incredulous. Olivia, did you make an enemy? No. Olivia shrugged helplessly. It's probably that my existence is causing trouble for others. Will more people try to harm you? Wendy's anxiety grew. A gunshot was no small matter. If not for Steve, Olivia could be dead. I think I'll be okay. But I know there are people who are out to get me ever since I moved in with my dad. Olivia told her friend, reaching out to ruffle Wendy's hair. But don't worry, I won't just sit back and wait for it to happen. I'm not sure about that. Wendy still felt uneasy. Don't worry about it. Millie waved her hand dismissively. In New York City, no one would be stupid enough to harm Olivia. After all, she's a Johnson. Who would be that foolish and throw their life away trying to take aim at someone as powerful as her? Millie really didn't understand how depraved and awful the world really was. Olivia thought. To Millie... Everything was just high school tests and college applications. But underneath the pretty veneer of Manhattan society, a dark underbelly lurked, and Olivia was learning all about it now. But promise me you won't leave the city, Wendy anxiously implored. As long as you stay here, things should be fine, right? I won't leave for now, Olivia reassured. I'm not going to die, don't worry. Seeing Wendy's mood gradually stabilizing, Olivia shifted the topic. I've had to ask you, what's going on with you? It's been strange since May 1st. There, there's something. Wendy evaded her gaze, avoiding their eyes. Yes, go on. Both Millie and Olivia nodded in unison, prompting Wendy to speak the truth. If I tell you, just don't scold me, all right? Wendy hesitated, the secret she had been harboring for a while finally bubbling to the surface. Tell us and we'll deal with it together. Millie assured her. Here's what happened. Wendy confided to the girls about the incident when she asked Jeremy to retrieve the love letter she wrote Steve for her. But then, I don't know why Steve suddenly showed up, but he did, and he took the letter from Jeremy and thought it was a love letter that I had written to Jeremy. So now Steve thinks I like Jeremy. Wendy, I used to think that Pamela was the unluckiest person at our school. Millie sighed. But now I see that you're not that far off. Yeah, Olivia chimed in agreeing. Don't say that. Wendy covered her face with her hands. What can I do? I feel so helpless. So that love letter is still with Steve? Millie asked. Yes, Wendy replied gloomily. He thinks I gave the love letter to Jeremy because I like Jeremy. I see. Olivia suddenly grasped the significance of it all. Wendy's crush was pretty intense and Wendy felt she'd totally messed up right now. This really was a huge misunderstanding. Millie felt the urge to shake some sense into Wendy because her friend was acting far too foolishly, but she refrained. Wendy lamented weakly. I'm a coward. I can't even bring myself to talk to him. I don't want to remain a coward forever. Well, Millie finally spoke up impatiently. What do you plan to do? I don't know. Wendy responded blankly. Initially, she had put a lot of hope in that love letter, entrusting her first love and youthful feelings to it. But after hearing Steve's words, she realized her youth had died. Her first love had ended, and everything had crumbled. I'll retrieve the letter first, Millie declared, rubbing her temples. 
Regardless of who has it, it's a love letter from Wendy. So I should be able to get it back if I say she wants it back. What's your plan after getting it back? Olivia asked with a sigh. Wendy, are you planning to confess your real feelings to Steve? No! Wendy shook her head vigorously as if her life depended on it. Absolutely not! I only asked for Jeremy to deliver the letter on my behalf. And then I lied and told Steve it was for Jeremy after he took it from him. But if I confess to Steve that I actually intended it for him, he'll surely think I'm fickle. Then explain the situation to him. Clarify that you intended to give him the letter. Tell him it was a misunderstanding. Millie suggested. No. Wendy rejected the idea again, her head shaking like a metronome. Even just handing him a love letter has led to this unfortunate incident. He'll probably see me as a complete idiot. Olivia and Millie exchanged glances before turning to Wendy and inquiring, Is that really so? Absolutely not! Millie crossed her heart with a large X. It's just a big misunderstanding, like I keep saying. But whatever, let's retrieve the letter first. Millie adopted a hands-on-hips pose, appearing exasperated. Okay, fine, Wendy replied, lowering her head. However, when she looked at Steve, her voice faltered, and she couldn't articulate her words clearly. Olivia, can you help me? No, Olivia immediately refused, asserting, You should handle this yourself. Don't be overly timid. If you keep on like this, you'll miss all your chances for happiness. Happiness is something you have to chase after. We'll create opportunities for you, but you need the courage to seize them. Olivia knew how being timid could kill a person, and she wasn't willing to let herself or her friends be that way in this life. That's right, Millie chimed in, sharing Olivia's sentiments. Still, with her head lowered, Wendy stared at the tip of her shoe. She understood their rationale, but fear still held her back. Olivia shook her head. Wendy's approach wasn't a solution either. Therefore, when they returned to the classroom from the rooftop, Olivia found Steve and informed him that Wendy needed to talk to him during lunch break. Steve could roughly guess that it was about the love letter. His eyes flickered with a mischievous gleam, reveling in the chaos that he loved so much. During their lunch break, when Steve suddenly proactively sought out Wendy, she found herself utterly dumbfounded. Hey, Wendy, didn't you have something to tell me? Steve observed Wendy's surprised expression and found it amusing. What's up? Is there something on my face? I have something to say to you? Wendy was at a loss, struggling to remember what she had mentioned to Steve. Yeah, Liv told me you did. Steve gestured towards Olivia, who promptly feigned sleep, as if she had no knowledge of the situation. Wendy couldn't help but inwardly scold both Olivia and Millie for their lack of loyalty. Hesitating briefly, she finally stood up and decisively said, Yes, let's go. At this point, she couldn't afford to be excessively timid. After all, all she wanted was to retrieve her belongings. All right, let's go. Steve replied with his hands casually in his pockets, his lips curling into a smile. Wendy lowered her head slightly and led Steve to the rooftop, where Olivia and Millie were conversing. The two of them stood facing each other. Wendy gazed down at her toes, struggling to find a way to initiate the conversation. Wendy, you didn't invite me up here to enjoy the view and the breeze, did you? Steve teased with a twinkle in his eye. No, it's not that. Wendy replied, looking up at Steve. I, how's your injury? It was not a big deal. I'm not about to keel over. Steve grinned. He might not have many merits, but he certainly counted luck as one of them. I see, Wendy responded, nervously clutching her clothes hem with her hands. I, I want to. What is it you want to do? Steve's amusement grew as he noticed Wendy's intriguing behavior. He playfully asked, Is it possible you want to treat me to a meal? He recalled Wendy's love for food. Everyone in school knew she was a self-proclaimed foodie. No, no, not at all. Wendy shook her head, her face reddening. She also recalled the awkward scene during their last meal together. Then what do you want to do? Steve asked, a smile playing on his lips. I want to, I mean, I wanted to... Wendy struggled to meet Steve's smiling gaze, only to find herself stumbling over her words. 
She silently berated herself for failing to live up to her expectations. As embarrassment, anxiety, and impatience overwhelmed her, she looked as though she might burst into tears. You want your love letter back, right? Steve, seeing Wendy on the verge of tears, decided it was time to offer a helping hand. Yes. Wendy nodded. You, could you return it to me, please? Sure, it's not out of the question for you to want it back. Steve replied, his lips curling into a mischievous grin. But there's one condition. You help me with something, and I'll give the letter back to you. What is it? Wendy looked at Steve, which to her surprise seemed rather handsome. At that moment, Wendy's heart raced and her breathing grew erratic. It's quite simple, Steve responded. Help me pursue Olivia and, in return, I'll give you back your love letter. What? Wendy was dumbfounded. Her racing heart slowed to a standstill. Her breathing turned shallow and her mind went blank. She couldn't decide on an expression to match Steve's request. You... you want to pursue Olivia? Indeed. Steve smiled, his eyes twinkling. You don't have to do much, just create an opportunity for me. Recently, Steve had noticed Jeremy's increasing fondness for Olivia, and he was curious to know whether he stood a chance with her. And if he were to be around her all the time anyway, it would only be a matter of time before his proximity to Olivia caused Jeremy to lose his temper, right? He found the whole thing sort of amusing. Wendy couldn't recall how she returned to the classroom, and everything after that seemed to blur together. By the time her senses returned, the school day was almost over. Millie and Olivia stood around her desk, and half the students had already left the classroom. Hey, Wendy, why are you so lost in thought? Olivia waved her hand in front of Wendy's eyes. Are you all right? Huh? Wendy snapped back to reality, focusing on Olivia and Millie. I'm, I'm fine. Fine doesn't seem like it. Millie scrutinized Wendy. So did you get your love letter back? No. Wendy murmured, her gaze lowered. He wants to make a deal with me. A deal? What kind of deal? Olivia was puzzled. Steve had wealth and influence, so what could he possibly need to negotiate with Wendy for? Steve sure is something. What kind of deal did he propose to you? He said... Wendy's eyes welled up with tears as she recalled the situation. What was she supposed to do? Why are your eyes red? Millie was taken aback. He's not trying to force you into something bad, is he? It can't be. Olivia comfortingly rubbed Wendy's head. Don't cry. Don't cry. Just tell us what's going on and we'll figure it out together. Wendy bit her lip and felt a heavy ache in her heart. She gazed at Olivia with longing. It was true. Olivia was always prettier, smarter, more popular, and came from a better family background than her. It was evident to anyone with eyes that people would prefer Olivia over her. This disparity ate away at Wendy's heart, but Olivia was also her dearest friend. What's Steve up to? Olivia observed Wendy's distressed expression and knitted her brows. Suddenly, she recalled something and exclaimed, Oh, you know what? Steve told me something in Philadelphia. What was it? Millie looked at Olivia in confusion, struggling to follow their conversation. Why did I forget about this? Olivia smacked her forehead and turned to the remaining classmates. Let's go get a coffee or something outside of school. I'll treat you and tell you guys about it off campus so no one can eavesdrop. Ooh, okay, let's go, let's go. Millie urged eagerly, ready to hear some potential gossip. Pack up your things. Come on, Wendy. You've been lost in thought all afternoon. Not really. Wendy pouted apologetically and began to pack her school bag. She overheard Olivia mentioning something she had forgotten, but she also realized that whatever it was, it probably wasn't crucial. After all, she wouldn't forget anything significant. After packing their bags, the three of them exited the classroom together. As they descended the stairs, Steve, who had been in the bathroom, returned to the class. Steve noticed the empty classroom and surveyed the deserted space. He muttered to himself, This Wendy, didn't she promise to give me an answer after school? Where is she? Did she escape from me on purpose? Meanwhile, Olivia and the others left the school premises and went to a shop to enjoy some fresh cups of warm coffee and tea. During the stroll, Olivia shared the situation she encountered in Philadelphia with them. Wait, really? Millie was caught off guard. 
nearly spewing out her tea. Seriously? Why are things so complicated among the rich families? That's how it is. Olivia sighed, shaking her head helplessly. Wait a second, hold on. Wendy's mind struggled to process the information. This is all a bit overwhelming. Wendy, if you keep clutching your tea, you'll crush it. Olivia took the straw from Wendy's hand and inserted it into her drink. Drink it, now! What's there to be puzzled about? Let me break it down for you. Millie took another sip of tea and explained. Steve told Olivia that Jeremy is a deviant and advised her to stay away from him. And when he got injured, he asked Jeremy to take care of him. Isn't it clear? Millie shrugged. Maybe Steve likes Jeremy. So he saw you delivering a love letter to Jeremy and got jealous. That's why he took your love letter and stopped you from confessing. Then he mentioned those conditions about helping him date Olivia just to give you a hard time. That can't be. Wendy blinked her eyes in disbelief. I know this is hard to accept right now. Maybe drinking some tea will help ease the shock. Olivia consoled, patting Wendy's shoulder. Wendy took a large gulp as her cheeks puffed up. With big eyes, she looked at Olivia and Millie, making unintelligible sounds. Swallow first, then talk. Millie interrupted Wendy's muffled words. She couldn't help but laugh. After swallowing, Wendy managed. It can't be true. If he's gay, why would he ask me to help him pursue Olivia? Maybe as a diversion? Millie suggested. She turned to Wendy, saying, Wendy, are you naive? He knows very well that Liv's engaged to Chris. Why would he ask you to help me pursue her? Clearly, he's trying to make things difficult for you. Olivia found Steve's actions frustrating. He took the joke too far and was hurting Wendy in the process. No wonder you seem so absent-minded this afternoon. Millie shook her head. Good thing it's not a cheesy drama, otherwise you'd been caught up in a tangle with Olivia. I would never actually fight with Olivia over a guy, Wendy said. She lifted her chin. I will always put my friendships before a guy. I love your loyalty, Olivia smiled. She never doubted their friendship. But Steve isn't very clever. If I were him, I'd have you pretend to be my girlfriend if I were actually gay. That way, I'd not only hide my sexual orientation, but also sabotage your relationship with Jeremy. It's a win-win. Millie finished her thought, sipping her tea contentedly. She had a particular fondness for the vanilla bean honey she put in it. No. Olivia shook her head. That would be too shady. But his behavior isn't any better, right? Millie raised an eyebrow at Wendy. I'm sorry you're caught in the crosshairs, Wendy. Yeah. Olivia nodded in agreement. This was Wendy's first true experience with love. It was a shame that it ended up being so unpleasant. Suddenly... A male voice rang from behind them. Wendy, why did you leave after school? Didn't I ask you to wait for me? Wendy abruptly turned her head, remembering what Steve had told her earlier. Wendy, I'll give you time to think about my proposition. How about this? Why don't you wait for me after school, and then you can give me an answer? Is that okay? Back on the rooftop, fear had rendered her mind blank preventing her from paying attention to Steve's words. But now, face to face with him, the memory came rushing back. Hello, what's going through your mind? Steve walked up to Wendy and waved his hand in front of her. Why are you spacing out? Steve, you're quite impressive. Millie scrutinized Steve from head to toe. I've always had my moments. Steve grinned, then turned his gaze to Olivia. Would you mind if I borrow Wendy for a while? Wendy, it's up to you, Olivia addressed Wendy. Since her love letter was still in Steve's possession, Olivia was reasonably certain about his character. He had saved her before, yet when it came to this relationship, things were far from clear-cut. Sure, Wendy nodded. I'll go talk to him. Regardless of the circumstances, she had to retrieve her love letter. It had been an innocent and inexperienced mistake, and one she needed to rectify as soon as possible. Go ahead. Millie patted Wendy's shoulder, sensing that her friend was taking her first bold step on the path of life, talking to her crush on her own. Wendy, it seemed, was further behind than her other friends in terms of maturity, so this step was necessary for her. With a solemn nod, 
Wendy resolved to confront Steve about his unethical behavior. She was determined to retrieve her love letter, and her fear was rapidly diminishing. Steve smiled and guided Wendy down a different route. As they turned onto a street, they stumbled upon an automated vending machine nestled in a narrow alley. I'm thirsty, Steve remarked, heading straight to the vending machine. However, as he tried to purchase a drink, he noticed a piece of paper taped to it. It read, coins only. Despite searching his pockets, Steve couldn't find any change. He turned to Wendy. Do you have any coins? Change? Wendy unslung her school bag, rifling through its contents. No, she only had $10 and it was all bills. Shoot, Steve frowned. Um, listen. Wendy took a deep breath to muster her courage. Steve, I seriously... Before Wendy could finish her sentence, a loud noise startled her. Her gaze darted toward the source of the sound, and she spotted four well-dressed young men approaching. The leader among them kicked the nearby trash bin, causing Wendy to tremble with fear. These guys must be troublemakers, right? Wendy thought. They looked so intimidating. Listen, kid, I'm Otis. The leader addressed Steve with a condescending tone. My friends and I are down some money for the subway and a little bit of cash could help us out a lot if you'd be so kind as to lend us some. I'm sorry I can't, Steve replied still absorbed by the vending machine. His thirst was real and growing more intense by the moment. Who do you think you're fooling? If you have cash, you can take your girl out. If you're broke, then it's ours. One of the young men next to Otis sneered at Wendy. Jeez, you're really plain looking. Wendy shrank, aware of her lack of distinctiveness. She didn't need it pointed out. Adjusting her glasses on the bridge of her nose, she felt a pang of discomfort. The closest thug knocked the half-full tea from Wendy's hand onto the ground. You with your plain looks you even dare look at me? The others burst into ruckus laughter. Wendy gripped her school bag tightly, bowing her head. So what if she was ordinary? Though angered, she couldn't challenge these delinquents. Enough already, I'm through laughing, Otis declared, his mirth subsiding. He believed Steve was a coward. Kid! Hand over the money, I'm talking to you, can't you hear me? Otis gave Steve's shoulder a shove. Steve hissed, pain flaring from his shoulder. Drawing a deep breath, he met Otis's gaze with a fiery one. This man was asking for trouble. Damn it, what kind of look is that? You're asking for a beating. What's wrong with me pushing you? Otis's fist clenched in anger, aiming for Steve's face. Swiftly, Steve intercepted the blow with his palm his leg then striking out toward Otis's abdomen. The force behind the kick was considerable, propelling Otis backward until his body collided with the wall. A loud thud echoed. Ah! Otis crumbled to the ground, clutching his head in agony. Blood stained his palm where he touched it, igniting his panic. You! How dare you hit me! Get him! Teach this jerk a lesson! Huh! <laughs> Steve uttered disdainfully subsequently flooring the other assailants who'd lunged at him. Wendy gawked in astonishment. How could Steve be so skilled? Empty your wallets, did you hear me? Steve's voice dripped with coldness. Having spent their days as muggers, these delinquents found themselves on the other side of the equation this time. Though resentful, they submitted to Steve's demands, aware they couldn't beat him. Steve produced all the money from his wallet, discarding the now empty wallet on the ground. He strode over to the vending machine, slotting the money into the coin slot and procuring a bottle of drink. He twisted the cap, sipped, and let out a satisfied, <sighs> that hits the spot. Wendy observed this scene, perplexed about how to react. What would you like to drink? Steve turned to Wendy, a few coins still in his possession. Um, it's alright, I'm not thirsty. Wendy hastily waved her hand. She wouldn't dare use the money to buy a drink. Who knew if this ruffian would retaliate? She lacked Steve's fighting prowess. Steve chuckled and inserted a few coins. Coke or Sprite? Hmm, Wendy mumbled. Coke, I suppose. All right. Steve pushed a button. A clank followed and a Coke bottle dropped. Steve retrieved it, twisted off the cap, and handed it to Wendy. Here. Thank you so much. 
Wendy regarded Steve with mixed emotions. She had to admit, his chivalrous behavior had its appeal. Let's go. Steve led the way forward. Sure, Wendy responded, glancing back at the few hooligans still sprawled in the alley before hastening to catch up. Wendy's hard-earned confidence and courage dissipated as she watched Steve single-handedly handle those troublemakers. Once they arrived at a nearby park, Steve paused, regarding Wendy. Let's talk here. Coming to a halt as well, Wendy noticed the proximity between them and instinctively took a step backward. Steve chuckled. <laughs> afraid of me? No, she replied. Even if she was afraid, she wouldn't admit it openly. Chuckling again, Steve took a step toward her. Wendy reflexively stepped back, taunting him. Aren't you the one to fear? He continued unfazed. Have you thought over my proposal from earlier? What? Wendy hesitated, thrown off by his question. About helping me pursue Olivia, Steve explained, crossing his arms. What's your stance on it? I'm not interested, Wendy replied, her apprehension showing. When she saw he didn't appear angered, she added, Liv and Chris are engaged, it's not appropriate. Although she initially planned to sternly admonish him, Wendy's boldness had waned. They're engaged, not married, Steve retorted, smirking. Who knows what the future holds? What if Olivia realizes I'm a better match than Chris? Wendy muttered, unconvinced. Protective of Chris, aren't you? Steve scanned her from head to toe. Don't tell me you have a crush on Chris. No, I don't, she immediately refuted. Oh, how could I forget you're into Jeremy? Steve grinned. Wendy, still yearning for your love letter? I... Wendy began, dragging her response. She truly wanted it back, even if she regretted writing it. Since you're eager, just promise me obediently, Steve goaded, noticing her trepidation. If you don't, I might just post your love letter on the school bulletin board for everyone to enjoy. How does that sound? Absolutely not, Wendy scolded him. Steve, don't cross the line. It was perhaps the boldest statement she'd ever made in his presence. Oops, my bad. Steve chuckled, taking in Wendy's unusual assertiveness. Even a kitten knows how to unsheath its claws. You! Wendy flushed. What a peculiar analogy. In any case, the choice is yours. Help me create an opportunity to get closer to Olivia, and I'll give you your love letter back. Steve gestured casually. I only need like 10 times alone with her, little opportunities to talk to her one-on-one, -on -one. then we'll call it even. 10? Wendy was taken aback. She could manage one or two opportunities for him to get close to Olivia, but 10 times? That would be challenging. No, she thought, recalling Olivia's advice and feeling displeased. Steve was here to make her suffer. How petty could he be? Her favorability for him plummeted by more than half. She pouted unhappily. Steve was indeed too much. Seeing her expression, Steve's spirits lifted. He realized there was someone who could wear their feelings openly on their face. Without a doubt, Wendy's expression was a clear condemnation of him as a bad person. Observing her shoulders dropping and her sigh of resignation, Steve knew she'd acquiesce. All right, Wendy looked up at Steve. Just ten times after that, you return my note. Deal. Steve extended his right hand, palm open. Wendy blinked and shook his hand. Let's go. I'll walk you home, Steve said, sliding his hands back into his pockets. No need. I can manage on my own, Wendy retorted, her frustration still simmering. Steve's threat had left a bitter taste in her mouth. She huffed, turned her head in disdain, and strode away. Steve chuckled unfazed and followed her. As dusk settled, he had no reason to let a girl walk home alone, especially for safety's sake. Throughout the journey, Wendy seethed in anger. She reached a street corner and almost stumbled into a group of skateboarding kids. Steve acted quickly, pulling her back. Be careful. Steadying herself, Wendy mumbled softly, thank you, before resuming her solitary walk. This time her steps were slower and her eyes occasionally flicked towards Steve. Passing by an elderly man playing the violin on the street, Steve paused. He took out all the money he'd taken from the delinquents 
and deposit it in the man's collection box. With a genteel bow, he paid his respects, and the old man acknowledged him with a nod. This scene left Wendy momentarily taken aback. She admitted that she held a fondness for Steve. This incident, though, had been disillusioning, shattering her initial perception of him. She couldn't believe Steve had threatened to show her a love letter to the whole school if she didn't help him. She had never imagined Steve could stoop so low. Yet, despite this negative experience, Wendy couldn't help but be occasionally entranced by his actions, like when he unscrewed the cap of the Coke bottle before handing it to her, or moments like these where she found herself getting drawn in. But each time she considered the matter of Steve being gay, Wendy's spirits dropped. In his world, perhaps he perceived romantic attraction between different genders as fundamentally distinct, a sentiment she could never share. Being together seemed improbable if they couldn't bridge that gap. Silent for the remainder of the journey, Wendy walked back into her neighborhood, lost in thought. Standing at the building's entrance, she gave a wave to Steve, trailing behind her. This is my home. I'll see you at school. Take care, Steve replied, nodding and waving. Seeing Wendy off, he left the neighborhood himself. A few streets away, he spotted a woman who had dropped her grocery bag of produce, with a few apples scattered on the ground. Kneeling down, he began gathering the apples. Ma'am, there are a few more over here. Thank you so much, the woman expressed her gratitude, offering him the largest red apple. Here, take this. With a smile, Steve accepted the apple and continued on his way. What a thoughtful young man, the woman complimented him, overhearing a conversation behind her. Desiree, someone called out behind her. Victoria, you're back early today. I know I got off work early, Victoria said. Shall we head inside? On Saturday, Olivia arranged a gathering for her video game project at a coffee shop in the city center. Once everyone had settled down, Millie's brow furrowed slightly. Steve, what brings you here? She hadn't expected Steve to show up. After Wendy's incident, Millie wasn't particularly fond of him. Why can't I be here? Steve grinned. If there's something interesting going on, I'd like to be included. Today's main agenda is discussing the game. Olivia interjected, not bothered by Steve's presence. After all, even if he couldn't contribute significantly, he had financial resources to offer. Got it. He nodded. The game was a significant project for everyone involved, apparently. Let's start by dividing our roles, Olivia suggested, opening her notebook. I've already outlined some preliminary responsibilities. Take a look. She guided them through the roles. Currently, my family has invested 50000 and Francis has contributed the same. Hence, Francis and I will be overseeing the team. Additionally, Francis will handle game planning. The story and design are Wendy's creations, so she'll be our game screenwriter and designer. Wow. Wendy's eyes sparkled upon hearing her assigned role. It felt like quite a prestigious position. She hadn't anticipated being able to contribute in this manner. Zach will handle research and development of the game program. Olivia continued, addressing Zach. All right. Zach nodded, content to leverage his skills. Millie will manage any calculations that need to be done, Olivia stated, directing her attention to Millie. I'll be handling public relations in collaboration with Millie. No issues, Millie agreed, knowing this was within her skill set. Jeremy, Olivia hesitated momentarily, pondering Jeremy's potential contributions. She admitted she didn't know him that well. As far as she could tell, Jeremy excelled in precision shooting, but that didn't necessarily translate into usefulness for the game company. I also have programming skills, Jeremy nodded. Dealing with computer-related matters wasn't a challenge for him. That's great, you and Zach can take charge of the core technology, Olivia affirmed. What about me? Steve looked at Olivia. What role do I play? I'm not entirely sure of your capabilities, Olivia shrugged. Steve smirked. Well, I can also put in 50000 if that helps. All right, Olivia agreed. It was a good time to bring in more funds so she didn't decline his offer. 
As for your role, you'll be responsible for testing. Sounds simple enough, Steve nodded. A simultaneous scoff echoed from Francis and Zack. Even Jeremy couldn't help but twitch his mouth a few times. What's up? Steve wasn't particularly invested in the game, but he had grasped the essence of the situation after witnessing the reactions of these three individuals. Game testing wasn't as straightforward as he had assumed. No worries. Olivia suppressed a smile and took a sip of her coffee. She steered the conversation. I'm hungry. Does anyone want anything to eat? Vanilla latte is pretty good, Millie said, and the muffins. Despite Millie not being well-versed in game development, she was impressed that Olivia had cunningly drawn Steve into the conversation and gotten him to invest in the company. Wendy, what kind of dessert would you like? Olivia inquired. I heard their blueberry ice cream waffles are delicious too. Would you like to give them a try? Sure, Wendy agreed, intrigued by the prospect of trying something new. Waiter? Millie beckoned the waiter over and ordered. Add a blueberry ice cream waffle and a whipped cream topping to our order, please. Of course, is there anything else? The waiter inquired politely. Two servings of cinnamon streusel, please. Olivia looked over the menu and glanced at the number of people. And a matcha-flavored eight-inch cake. With this many of us, we should be able to finish it. Certainly, the waiter affirmed before heading off to prepare the order. Just then, the coffee shop's glass door swung open. Chris walked in and approached Olivia's table. Observing this, Millie smoothly shifted her seat, creating an open spot. Apologies for being late. Chris settled down next to Olivia. Then he quickly called the waiter over and ordered a sandwich and a piece of angel food cake. No problem at all. Olivia gave him a quick glance. Seriously, was he here solely for the food? How was that his first priority upon sitting down? Hmm, what's this notebook? Chris picked up the notebook from the table and flipped through it. It's mine? Olivia retrieved the notebook from Chris and stowed it in her backpack. I'm just jotting some things down. You're going to be running a game studio. You should start getting accustomed to using a computer. Chris suggested. He had visited Olivia's room before and noticed her laptop was an older model and seemed out of place in her bedroom. Computers are undoubtedly vital these days, Millie chimed in. She owned a laptop, which was incredibly convenient for her. Especially in game development, Chris added. He and the other three families had selected and assembled each component of his laptop. Right, Olivia acknowledged, understanding that computers were indispensable. Her future life would likely revolve around them. While she hadn't paid much attention to this aspect previously, Chris's reminder encouraged her to consider it more seriously. Is Chris involved in game development as well? Steve questioned. To some extent, Chris confirmed. What role are you responsible for? Steve probed further. Not determined yet, Chris replied. How did the game testing go? Steve asked Chris, doubtful that Chris knew enough to even answer. Despite not comprehending the specifics of the game test, he could gauge from their reactions that it hadn't gone well. That's probably why they were trying to ensnare him in the project. I'm not a fan, Chris swiftly declined. Game testing is tedious and bothersome. You have to play the same level dozens or hundreds of times just to detect the tiniest bug. Even if you play until you're nauseous, there's no guarantee of finding it. It's a colossal nuisance. Listening to Chris's explanation, Steve's expression shifted. What on earth? He had definitely been taken for a ride. A pained look crossed his face as he glanced at Olivia. He had contributed $50,000 as well. Did he have to be tricked like this? Just then, the waiter brought the cake they ordered earlier. Here's the 8-inch cake you requested. Everyone, let's dig in. Olivia swiftly diverted attention to the cake, sidestepping Steve's gaze. Wendy surprisingly burst into laughter, seeing Steve's defeated look. She was no longer as tense around him as before, and now felt much more at ease. Ugh, oh, I really thought this company was further along when I pledged that investment money. Steve sighed as he stretched his back, walking alongside Jeremy. But at least those desserts are genuinely delicious. 
Jeremy marched forward, deep in his thoughts, not responding. Jeremy, what do you think? Steve subtly glanced at Jeremy. What are your thoughts about Wendy? Though asking such a question might make most people uncomfortable, he still wanted to gauge Jeremy's interest in Wendy. After all, he felt bad for interrupting Wendy's confession to Jeremy about liking her. She's all right, Jeremy replied. He felt that the people he had met in New York City were decent individuals. They were all fairly good people. Despite Wendy being a bit naive, her purity and kindness were commendable traits. Just that? Steve sounded a bit disappointed. She confessed her feelings to you after all, is that all you have to say? Pausing his steps upon hearing Steve's remark, Jeremy looked at him and asked, What are your thoughts about Wendy? What do I think? Does it really matter? Steve was taken aback. Seeing Jeremy's serious expression, he squinted and contemplated for a moment. Wendy, she appears to have a full stomach and a demeanor that invites bullying. Whenever he saw Wendy, he had the impression that she was an easy target for teasing, even though her appearance was rather unremarkable. Despite her somewhat foolish and adorable personality, he always sensed an air of vulnerability. I see, Jeremy responded, resuming his stride. It seemed that Wendy's journey of love wouldn't be a smooth one. Hey, that's it? Steve saw Jeremy walking away again and quickly caught up. Jeremy's behavior was truly something. The two young men continued their peaceful interaction, with one walking leisurely and the other engaging in conversation. Their camaraderie appeared harmonious. Little did they know that this innocent companionship would take on a different interpretation in the eyes of three individuals sitting in a private car across the street. Maybe they like each other. Millie squinted her eyes, observing the two figures growing distant through the car window. Right, Olivia nodded. They could be cute together. They're equally good looking and seem to have similar interests. Even though Jeremy didn't seem overly concerned with his appearance, he possessed a certain charm. Oh, Wendy felt sad for herself in her heart, but she also understood. She sighed. I hope they'll be happy. There was little point in persistently dwelling on the matter. She chose to silently wish them well. The driver, Morris Brad, followed their gaze for a moment before withdrawing his attention. The world of young people was intricate and beyond his comprehension. First, Morris dropped off Wendy at her home and then took Millie to the intersection where she'd switched to another car. Finally, he returned Olivia to the Johnson family mansion. It was slightly after four in the afternoon when they arrived back. Olivia, you're back already? Monica was seated in the living room reading a book. Upon spotting Olivia's return, she stood up, closing the book in her hands. Usually, you hang out with your friends longer after school. Yeah, Olivia replied briefly, then headed straight for her room upstairs. Monica didn't utter any more words. Glaring at Olivia's retreating figure, she casually tossed the book onto the sofa and made her way into the kitchen. In about a month, Bruno and Chef Mario Vincenzo one of Bruno's mentors in the culinary world, would arrive to select their next apprentices. This time, she couldn't afford to fail. Success was her only option. After arranging all the ingredients, Monica stared at the knife on the cutting board. Clenching her teeth, she muttered, Olivia, I must surpass you and trample you mercilessly. Gripping the kitchen knife, she brought it down with force onto the ingredients. The cut was precise and clean, she didn't need to measure to know that it matched Bruno's requirements perfectly. For so long, she had been diligently practicing these monotonous tasks day after day. Each night, even in her dreams, she would be measuring weights. The relentless repetition felt like a form of agonizing torture. But she couldn't give up. She persevered all along. Her goal was to showcase her culinary prowess before the master chefs, making herself stand out at a glance. She yearned to become either Bruno or Chef Mario Vicenzo's apprentice. She aimed to surpass Olivia and prove to everyone that she, Monica, was the rightful heiress of the Johnson family. Her determination intensified. Monica continued her rigorous practice. Rachel descended the back staircase from the second floor and observed Monica diligently working in the kitchen. 
Her heart swelled with a mixture of heartache and pride. Monica had matured. She understood that true strength wasn't something to be flaunted, but something that brought inner contentment. Witnessing her daughter's tireless dedication to self-improvement was a joyous revelation. In her room, Olivia browsed through computer models on the internet while jotting notes in a small notebook. Considering the possibility of frequent outings, she decided to prepare a laptop. Although desktop computers boasted more functionalities and completeness, they weren't conducive to portability. After an indeterminate span of time, a maid knocked on her door, informing her that dinner was ready downstairs. Feeling that she hadn't fully digested the afternoon's dessert, Olivia declined the offer, stating she wasn't hungry. Having checked the information she needed, Olivia then perused real-time news. At that time, her location setting was still in Philadelphia, which is why she continued to receive news pertaining to that area. The identity of the individual tragically killed near her hotel had been identified. Olivia clicked on the article to read more. The report revealed that the victim hailed from Chicago. Police speculated that it was a vendetta-related crime. A photograph of the deceased, despite being blurred out over the eyes, was recognizable to Olivia in an instant. This is the man who broke into my hotel suite that day, she thought, eyes widening. Her heart seemed to skip a beat. How had this person met his end? Recollections of the scene she had witnessed in Greg Kong's room that night surfaced in Olivia's mind. Could Greg have been the one to kill him? Such a ruthless method seemed inconceivable when associated with the gentle and well-mannered Greg Kong. All ten fingers were broken, and the victim had been brutally mutilated. It was truly horrifying. No, Olivia thought, wincing. Olivia paused, her thoughts racing. Greg wouldn't be that foolish. She had seen him as a somewhat even-tempered man previously. Under such circumstances, it was implausible for him to commit such a murder. Moreover, Greg was connected to Philadelphia, and considering the Kong's family influence in that city they would surely suppress any reporting on a murder case involving him. The reporters there wouldn't dare publish such news if he were involved. So the Kong family couldn't be responsible, Olivia reasoned. Realizing this, Olivia's thoughts turned to another person. Pete Pell of the Pell family in Chicago. It seemed that Pete was the prime suspect. Contemplating him, Olivia felt a shiver run down her spine. She'd nearly lost her life to him on the outskirts of Philadelphia, in the backwoods on her way out of town. Seeing news of him harming one of his own subordinates now, Olivia's brows knitted together. Pete Pell is a truly merciless individual, she thought. In the future, they would inevitably cross paths and meet face to face again. Then we'll settle our old debts once and for all, she smiled, and this time, I'll be ready for him. Olivia looked down at her notebook. She had a new name to add to her revenge list, and this one was going straight to the top of the list. Olivia didn't go downstairs for dinner because she was busy fantasizing about Pete Pell's demise, but by nine o'clock, her stomach was growling. Oh man, I'm starving. Olivia rubbed her stomach and made her way out of her room to the kitchen on the first floor. The lights were off, and two maids were conducting a final check in the pantry. After completing their task, they would head to their own rooms to rest after their shift. Miss, one of the two maids addressed Olivia. Are you hungry? We noticed you didn't come down for dinner. Yes, Olivia nodded. What ingredients do we have in the kitchen? In the fridge, there are mushrooms, vegetables, chicken, beef, eggs, and seafood. One of the maids replied, What would you like to eat? The other maid inquired, No need to trouble yourselves. You can go off duty. I'll prepare something for myself. Olivia said, walking over to the sink to wash her hands. Are you sure? The maids hesitated. They were meant to handle such tasks. It didn't seem appropriate to have her cook her own food. We insist. In that case, Olivia suggested upon seeing their uncertainty, I'd like some chicken and potatoes with broccolini, if possible, please. You can just heat up the leftovers we had from last night. No need to make it all fresh again. Of course, miss. 
The two maids agreed and began working on her meal. Once they had completed their task, the maids informed Olivia, Miss, we'll take our leave now, unless there's anything else you need. No, I'm good. Go ahead and enjoy your evenings. Olivia smiled at them. Have a good night and good luck with your studies. She recalled that these two maids were part-time college students. Having joined recently, they still had to attend online night classes. Thank you. They nodded before departing from the kitchen together. She could tell from reading their thoughts that they appreciated her remembering details as they left. Unlike Monica, Olivia actually paid attention to the people who worked in her family's mansion. As soon as the maids left, Olivia quickly, ravenously turned her attention to her food. Given her current hunger, she was able to devour two generous helpings of leftovers and felt like she could even eat a third if one were available. At that moment, the living room door swung open and Michael entered the house. He was just now returning from work because a crucial meeting had kept him occupied back at his office in the city until about 40 minutes ago. Dad? Olivia, who had just set the table, perked up at the sound of her father plopping his briefcase on the living room couch. Emerging from the kitchen, she saw her father. Hey, you're back from work, she exclaimed. Yes, it was a busy day. Michael replied as he approached. You haven't eaten yet, right? Olivia recalled his tendency to forget meals when engrossed in work. Um, I guess not. Michael admitted with a slightly awkward smile. I got caught up and forgot. Olivia pouted, placing her hands on her hips. Don't you know you're not going to be healthy if you do that? Doesn't your stomach let you know when you're hungry? How could you forget to eat? In a daze, Michael remembered a similar admonition from his past and how Victoria would chide him about his eating habits, too. Dad, go wash your hands first, Olivia instructed with a helpless shake of her head. I just happened to heat something up. Is it the dish you cooked? Michael came to his senses and smiled. He had yet to taste a meal prepared by Olivia. I'm looking forward to it. Oh no, I didn't cook it. The maids did. But even if I did, my cooking isn't on par with yours, Dad. Olivia responded with a smile. <laughs> Michael nodded, jesting. All right, well, I'll eat just about anything, because you're right. I am starving now that I have the time to think about it. Dad, I told you. Olivia playfully rolled her eyes at him, her hair cascading down her back. She then turned and retreated back to the kitchen. Michael chuckled placing his coat on the sofa alongside his briefcase before washing his hands. Then he headed to the dining table and took a seat. Olivia returned to the kitchen, took out more leftovers from the fridge, and heated up her dad a large portion. And because she was still hungry, she heated herself a little more too. Then she wore heat-resistant gloves, lifted the hot plates, and carried them both out. Setting her dad's plate on the table before him, she cautioned Michael, it's hot, be careful. With that, she presented him with his dish. Instantly, the aroma filled the air. The rich, savory scent mingled with the delicate sweetness. Michael's eyes lit up. Well, this certainly looks delicious, he smiled. Yes, it's my favorite. I know it's simple, but I love it. At my mom's house, when I stay there, my godmother makes it for us. Olivia responded, my mom loves eating this. Of course. Michael nodded with enthusiasm. Your mom always enjoyed healthy, simple dishes. That's true. Olivia sampled another bite of chicken and potatoes, detecting a subtle savoriness in the gravy that came with it. Michael also tasted it and then asked Olivia, Have you wanted to learn to cook at all? My godmother taught me some things, Olivia answered, taking a bite of broccolini. She says I have a natural talent for it. Since I'm a promising student in culinary skills, she's given me a lot of guidance. Is that so? Michael mused. Dad? Olivia took the rest of her chicken thigh and put it on Michael's plate. Remember to eat during work. Given your stomach condition, neglecting meals could take a toll on your health. Yes, Michael agreed. I'll make an effort next time. Taking a bite of the chicken, he observed its tight yet smooth texture first encountering the fried exterior and then experiencing the soft, tender meat. He found the combination rather satisfying. Good, that's what I'd like to hear. 
Olivia blinks playfully. Oh, and Dad, could you buy me a laptop? A laptop? Michael pondered. What kind of laptop are you interested in? Just a laptop, Olivia clarified, adding, I don't want a desktop computer, but I need a new one because my old one is quite old and doesn't have the memory or data storage. I think I'll need for school or my gaming company. In that case, yes, of course, I'd be happy to get you something. Michael nodded in agreement. While well, he had provided his other daughter Monica with a computer ever since her elementary school years, Olivia hadn't received one from him, even when she reached high school or when she came to live with him. I'll ask my assistant Ansel to help you choose one tomorrow. Okay, Olivia responded with a smile and a nod. She had confidence in Ansel Parr's capabilities. After discussing the topic of the computer, Olivia shifted her gaze to Michael and playfully rolled her eyes. Dad, I came across a really eerie novel today. What kind of novel? Michael inquired. It's about a young girl and her family's company has a spy in it. The spy embezzles the main character's family assets. Subsequently, the protagonist's father loses everything and is betrayed by a trusted person, which leads him to take his own life with a gunshot. Olivia recounted while watching Michael's reaction. Then, the main character is still young and helpless. Her father dies again, leaving her and her mother defenseless. Stricken by poverty and unable to accept the suicide of her father, her mother hangs herself when the main character isn't home. Michael's hand trembled, causing the piece of chicken he was about to pick up to slip back onto his plate. When he moved his arm, he hit his coffee cup and some coffee spilled out, scalding his hand. The searing pain brought him back to the present. He awkwardly smiled and remarked, That's just a work of fiction. Authors often write novels to captivate readers. Indeed, Olivia concurred with a smile. I also think it's highly improbable. There are even novels about reincarnation, claiming that the main character returns to their youth after death, aiming to alter a tragic future. Is that so? Modern authors certainly have a flair for imaginative storytelling. Michael chuckled. The dead are gone for good. How could they possibly be reborn? Maybe we shouldn't expose the younger generation to such fantasies. Maybe, Olivia agreed, observing Michael's resistance to her earlier examples. She decided to ease up on her persuasion tactics. Wendy enjoys reading those types of stories and has even recommended some to me. It's crucial to differentiate between fiction and reality, Michael emphasized. Right now, your focus should be on your studies. For novels, you can indulge in them during your leisure time. Understood, Olivia acknowledged. Art is said to be a reflection of life, though, and sometimes it even transcends reality. Some novels are pure fabrication, while others may not be entirely implausible. Seeing that her father was slightly uncomfortable, Olivia took another bite of her food and continued. Anyway, I'm really enjoying the progress of my gaming studio. It may even evolve into a successful company in the future. Even if I had a spy in my company, I might be able to handle it because it would be that lucrative. Well, you don't have to worry about spies in your video game company because you have your family supporting you. Michael frowned. Exactly, I was just joking. Olivia replied earnestly, meeting Michael's gaze. No matter what, I have family members by my side. She felt a surge of determination to change the tragic outcome of Michael's suicide in her past life. With family support, there's no obstacle we can't overcome. It's good that you know. Michael heard Olivia's words and felt relieved. Children at this age could easily think too much, especially about dark things, and he didn't want his daughter dwelling on subject matters like suicide or betrayals or even having to work so hard on businesses while she was just a teen. Recently, he had also seen much news of high school students committing suicide. As a father, he was also quite worried. Olivia could see that he was worried, so she wanted to switch the subject so he would focus on something lighter. Dad, give your broccoli and potatoes a try. Olivia pushed the side dish towards him. How does it all taste? Michael took a bite and nodded with approval. It's quite delicious. The flavors were fresh, crisp, and balanced in saltiness. Good, I'm glad you're eating. Olivia chuckled, supporting her chin with her hand. She asked, 
Dad, you're working so hard these days. Are you happy? I'm managing. Michael considered for a moment. It's not just about happiness. People need to find purpose in their lives. Is the Johnson family's success your purpose? Olivia asked, probing gently. She aimed to gradually shift Michael's perspective during the conversation. Well, yes, Michael answered, though he wasn't entirely sure. But when he saw the sincere look in his daughter's eyes, he didn't want to deceive her. Dad, have you ever thought about changing your job? Olivia inquired further. Switching to a job you truly enjoy? I don't really have personal preferences, Michael replied with a slightly awkward smile. His career path had been dictated by his father, Jack. With no culinary talents, he was directed towards management, a rather unexpected turn of events. He had also dabbled in forming a band during his university years, which was probably the only time he had truly gone wild. Then dad, is everything planned by grandpa? Olivia looked at Michael with a tinge of sorrow. A person's career, life, and marriage were all orchestrated by others. Someone else custom-designed his entire life journey, from start to finish. Even his death, perhaps, was prearranged by others in Liv's past life. Michael had never truly lived for himself. That's right, Michael sighed, but it's been all right. He reflected on the relatively content life he had shared with Victoria during their years together. Dad, you're not young anymore. Have you never considered living for yourself? Olivia stood up, placing her hands on the table. Dad, if you don't chase your passions, you'll just grow old. <laughs> Michael was amused by his daughter's words. He reached out and gently tapped her forehead. I'm already this old and you're calling me an old man? Don't tease me. Covering her forehead with both hands, Olivia's expression was complex. Michael had lived under decades of mental constraint. He had become somewhat desensitized to the idea of personal aspirations. Attempting to change someone's mindset wasn't an easy task. Olivia knew this, but she couldn't afford to give up, and she didn't want to give up. She realized that based on Michael's current mindset, even if the day came when Grandpa Jack and Bruno drained the company and the New York side of the Johnson family went bankrupt, Michael might still choose the path of suicide. Once they finished the meal she prepared, Michael returned to his study, spreading documents across the table. He muttered, if I don't pursue my passions, I'll just grow old. Then he chuckled and shook his head. <laughs> what a child. The words of a child were truly intriguing, he thought. Perhaps he had been just like this when he was young. He couldn't quite remember. Letting out a sigh, Michael immersed himself in his work. Every now and then, he would recall Olivia's words from the dinner table. A sense of trepidation would rise within him. If he honestly had nothing, what would become of his wife and daughters? Michael's gaze was fixated on a fresh set of accounting documents that had just arrived. He furrowed his brows. One copy showed a bill for an upcoming project. Fifty million. He shook his head, dispelling the thought. He wouldn't do this, Michael thought. The bill was probably due to the recent establishment of the London branch, which likely required immediate funds. Regardless of everything, Michael was still Jack Johnson's oldest son. He couldn't believe his father would treat him that way. He just couldn't. Focus. Focus. Michael took a deep breath as if he were reminding himself. With one determined breath, he swept away the thought. Opening another document, he resumed his work. Olivia woke up on Sunday at almost 10 o'clock. It had been a while since she slept in so late. After freshening up and changing clothes, she was just about to begin her day when she received a call from Chris. Where are you? Chris's voice sounded playful. At home, what's up? Olivia opened her book and inquired. I'm at your doorstep. Come out for a moment, Chris said. Chris, could you stop with these surprise visits? Olivia shook her head helplessly, though she still got up. Wait for me. Sure thing, ma'am. After hanging up, Chris looked at the gift in the car with satisfaction. He was confident that Olivia would like this. As they stepped out of the house, Olivia spotted Chris in casual attire, leaning against Sven's sapphire blue sports car. He wore a warm smile, and the sunlight illuminated his face, 
rendering him quite handsome. Chris, what's going on? Olivia approached him and asked, hoping there was something important. I got a gift for you. Chris gestured toward the box in the car. Let Sven bring it up to you. Why me? Sven pointed at himself with bewilderment. Wasn't his role already as the driver and assistant to Chris? Why should he also become a porter? Enough with the chit-chat, Chris reprimanded. Ah, oh, you sir are ruthless, Sven remarked. Stepping out of the main driver's seat, he went to the back of the car and said, Can't I lend a hand? What is this? Olivia was puzzled. I don't need any gifts. You'll like it, Chris reassured her. I promise. Huh? Olivia glanced at Chris's expression and felt slightly dumbfounded. What was he talking about? Let's go. Sven exerted effort to lift the box. Move aside, move aside. The object was pretty hefty. No, what is this thing? Olivia followed behind Sven. Sven, don't take it to my room. Tell me what's inside first. The box was quite large. What could it possibly contain? It looked pretty weighty. Please know that this was Chris's idea, Sven replied with strain, hastily maneuvering the box toward Olivia's room. He strained to move it, unwilling to respond to Olivia's inquiries further. Monica, who was practicing her cooking skills in the kitchen, heard the commotion and stepped out. She spotted Chris passing by the living room on his way up the stairs. Chris! Monica's eyes lit up, joy flooding her heart. She quickly rushed back into the kitchen to cut a plate of fruit herself. She wanted to impress Chris anew. What's this? Olivia stared at the large box that had been transported into her bedroom, a frown creasing on her forehead. Could it be some sort of monitoring equipment or explosives? Open it and see, Chris suggested, his gaze fixed on Olivia. I think you'll definitely like it. So confident. Olivia scoffed, curling her lips. Chris always seemed godlike in his assurance. Opening the box, she revealed a tightly sealed foam board. After dismantling it, she uncovered its contents. A computer? Yes, Sven replied, panting lightly. This is a custom-built desktop assembled by Chris himself. Each component was state-of-the-art. Some core functionalities were retained while the main casing was modified, adding to its overall weight. This time, Sven didn't find the effort too taxing. Olivia, clear your desk, Chris directed her. Uh, okay? Olivia complied and started clearing her workspace. How much does this computer cost? Chris had assembled it personally, so it must be expensive. Five thousand? Maybe ten thousand? Olivia pondered, not wanting to owe Chris further favors. How about I pay you 5000 for this? I can't accept it for free. Oofed. Sven chuckled, lifting the computer onto Olivia's table. He playfully knocked on it with a fist. 5000 might not even cover the outer shell of this computer. Huh? That's quite an exaggeration. Olivia's lip twitched. She clearly found it hard to believe. This computer was just a computer. $5,000 wasn't enough for its shell? What kind of joke was this? The casing is bulletproof, Sven explained with a grin. Both his and Chris's computers were bulletproof as well. Given the sensitive information stored, it was crucial to ensure there was no security breaches. Huh? This computer is bulletproof? Olivia felt the immense divide between her world and that of the tycoons. Such a valuable gift doesn't quite suit me. This computer suits you perfectly. Chris affirmed, confident of his statement. It comes with a level one defense monitoring system. I can guarantee that no hacker for the next 50 years will be able to breach the defense I've put in place. In the future, you'll have a lot of confidential matters. This computer is well suited to your needs. Olivia was touched by Chris's words. Seriously, how much does it cost? I can pay you for it. She offered, having some savings. It's priceless. Chris held Olivia's hands. Let's try it out and see how it feels. Fine, Olivia agreed, booting up the computer. An initial password prompt appeared. After entering it, a dragon symbol emerged on the screen. It began to move, circling before facing Olivia. After the dragon's eye registered her gaze, the totem slowly faded, 
revealing the usual boot-up sequence. How is it? Pretty cool, right? Sven smirked. Yes, Olivia nodded. It's quite impressive, but can't others just use my computer to turn it on? Yes, they can, entering a separate system. Chris explained as he tapped a few keys on Olivia's keyboard, switching to another interface. They enter this virtual system. You can monitor their activities on this page within your own system. Chris referred it back to the initial system and displayed it to Olivia. Can I identify who accessed my computer? Olivia queried. Yes, it has an automatic monitoring feature. Chris demonstrated. What's this icon then? Olivia pointed at a commanding dragon icon on the desktop. Try clicking it twice. Chris smiled. All right, Olivia said, tapping it twice. Suddenly, a video window appeared, displaying Chris's face. Turning to Chris, she found him filming with his phone. This is a special channel for our video calls. Chris grinned. Olivia narrowed her eyes slightly. What was the point of such a basic feature? She dragged the icon to the trash can but found it unerasable. Hee hee hee. Chris smirked knowingly. Olivia rolled her eyes. Why did you install such a useless function? A sense of aversion towards Chris suddenly welled up within Olivia. How could it be useless? It makes finding you much more convenient. Chris countered with a grin. Isn't it already convenient? Olivia was incredulous. Chris had a knack for springing surprises any time. How could it be inconvenient? I said it's more convenient now. Chris insisted. He gave another teasing smile. Olivia couldn't help but roll her eyes again. Just then, a knock sounded on the door, and Monica walked in, carrying a plate of fruits. Sister, I noticed you have a guest, so I brought some fruits. Raising an eyebrow, Olivia quipped. Put them over there. Sure. Monica placed the fruit plate nearby and eyed the computer on Olivia's desk with a hint of jealousy. That computer's so pretty, it's silver and sleek. The design feels very futuristic, and it seems so lightweight. Whoa, it's even customized? She said, drawing closer. This was a gift from Chris to you, wasn't it? The thought left a twinge of unease in Monica's heart, but she continued. This computer is really nice. You're, like, very lucky. What's so lucky about me? Olivia chuckled. Chris treats you so well, of course you're lucky. Monica responded, smiling. Olivia regarded Monica quietly for a moment. Do you need anything else? If not, you know where the door is. Monica clenched her fist and offered a smiling nod. Of course. She then smiled at Chris and Sven before leaving. However, as soon as her back was turned, the smile vanished from Monica's face. Damn you, Olivia, Monica thought. I'm gonna make you look stupid and treat you flippantly one day, just like you did to me just now. Olivia watched Monica's departure and snorted. Turning around, she addressed Chris. Chris, what other functions does this computer have? Tell me quickly, and after that, you can leave. I need to focus on my studies. Chris's lip twitched. Why did he feel so aggrieved? I, um, I'll help myself to some fruit. Sven interjected, suppressing his amusement. He coughed awkwardly and walked over to the fruit plate that Monica had brought. While well, you two go over the computer... Chris sighed and went on to explain all the functions of the computer in detail. Got it, Olivia replied attentively. That's pretty much it, Chris said. If you encounter any issues while using it, feel free to ask me or Sven. All right, Olivia nodded, expressing her gratitude. Thank you. Despite feeling a bit exasperated by the video software joke, she acknowledged that Chris's intentions were good and that this gift was incredibly useful, kind, and thoughtful. You're welcome, Chris said, reaching out to pat Olivia's head. His fondness for those he cared about made words of gratitude unnecessary. Thanks isn't necessary. Olivia blushed, evading Chris's touch. She added, seriously, how much is this worth? I'll transfer the money. No need, Chris pondered for a moment. How about this? Let's exchange it for a favor. What kind of favor? Olivia inquired, raising a dubious eyebrow. I haven't thought of it yet. Chris smiled. We'll discuss it when I come up with an idea. Don't ask for too much, Olivia warned. What? You don't want to make a deal with me? Chris chuckled. 
First, I won't pressure you into doing anything you don't want. Second, you don't have to agree to anything beyond your capacity. Third, no need to go on. I'll do you a favor in return for this. Olivia interrupted Chris. She owed him that much by now. Besides, she sort of liked this ongoing, teasing relationship they had, even if it annoyed the hell out of her sometimes. All right, Chris agreed. Chris, should we go now? Sven asked, holding an empty plate. He had finished his fruit and was ready to leave. See you at school tomorrow, Olivia replied, waving her hand goodbye, and thanks again. Sure thing, Chris nodded, and he and Sven left Olivia's room. Olivia watched them go and let out a sigh. She now owed Chris another favor. The situation was spiraling out of control like a snowball, getting bigger and bigger, yet she knew it would continue on like this, part of her enjoying it. Unsure of what kind of request Chris might make, Olivia shook her head and resumed her seat in front of the computer. She needed to study this computer further. Down in the driveway, as Chris settled into the car beside Sven, he received an overseas call. After a brief conversation, Chris's expression grew much more serious. What's the matter? Sven glanced at him, concerned. He glanced again, focusing on Chris. Chris, is something wrong? My second granduncle is returning to the country. Chris's brow furrowed. My grandfather's younger brother. Who? Sven hit the bricks abruptly and stared at Chris in disbelief. That old man who cooks like a maniac? Yeah, my second granduncle. Chris confirmed, looking at Sven. Apologies. Sven pursed his lips. You can't blame me for being haunted by childhood memories. That second granduncle of yours is quite eccentric. I understand. Chris acknowledged that Sven's reaction wasn't his fault. His second granduncle was indeed rather unusual. Ah. Sven rested his head on the steering wheel. Just mentioning him gives me a stomach ache. He mentioned that he's coming to New York City to visit me, Chris said, highlighting the worrisome part. Please, no, Sven exclaimed, his face horrified. Chris, how about I go hide out in Italy for a while? Or maybe I could go to London to help Dave Simon. I think he needs my assistant urgently. Keep dreaming. Chris shot a glance at Sven. If Sven ran away, he'd be left with only Chris and Vera. Did Sven think he could just escape? Not a chance. Chris. Sven had a pained expression. He honestly didn't want to relive that nightmare ever again. Drive, Chris instructed. Chris. Sven looked at Chris hesitantly. Drive! Chris's tone became more assertive. All right. Sven sighed and restarted the car, although in his heart he remained opposed. Chris shared the news with Vera as soon as he reached home. What? Vera was taken aback for a moment, then she hastily packed her belongings. I'm gonna get out of town for a bit. I'll be back when he leaves. Forget about it. Sven confiscated Vera's suitcase. There was no escaping this, and Vera wasn't inclined to run away from things either. No. Vera wore a defiant expression. I don't want to be treated like a sitting duck anymore, it's too terrifying. Actually, second granduncle's cooking isn't that bad. Chris tried to reassure them. Of course not. He's like one of the ten greatest chefs in the world. Vera sighed. But he insists on cooking a massive spread and forcing us to eat everything I always end up practically throwing up after the meal. Eugh. Sven grimaced. Don't, don't talk about it. The memories of that stuffed duck were absolutely horrifying. Chris's expression wasn't much better, and his stomach churned as well. That period of time was truly a childhood trauma. Meanwhile, in a secluded villa by the Rhine River, an elderly man with white sideburns gazed at a photograph in his hand and smiled. He didn't know how those children were doing, and wasn't expecting them to miss him. That evening, when Michael returned home... He brought Olivia a brand new laptop. Oh, um, thank you, Dad. Olivia expressed her gratitude with a smile as she received the laptop. She didn't know how to break the news to her dad that she already had a computer in her room now. Liv, didn't Chris give you a desktop earlier today? Monica needled her older sister. She felt incredibly envious, but she maintained a smiling face. She asked, 
Why did Dad buy you another one? Hmm? Michael looked at Olivia, wondering if he had gone overboard with the purchase. What do you mean, another one? I had talked to him about computers earlier, so he unexpectedly bought one today before, um, before I could let him know that Chris got me one too. Olivia explained with a shrug. I didn't want to be rude, so I accepted it. That's good, Rachel chimed in. She knew that Monica had also received a computer a few years ago, and now it was opportune for her to get a new one. Rachel's gaze rested on the laptop Olivia held. Yes, it worked out perfectly. Olivia understood Rachel's thoughts and cut her off. She smiled and suggested, It would be convenient for me to have a laptop for when I'm at school, and then I can use the home desktop at home. I thought of the same for my own convenience, so this actually works. Well, given the situation, why not lend the laptop to your sister Monica temporarily? She's been using her current one for years. Rachel persisted, suggesting... You can take it back once she gets a new computer. She's facing a lot of stress studying in her classes right now. In fact, she'd probably be fine with using the desktop if you need the laptop for convenience at both home and school. But my desktop was a gift from Chris. It doesn't seem right to do that. Olivia responded, looking at Rachel. There weren't many people who dared to propose such an idea. Just explain it to Chris, Rachel proposed. It's just a family matter. It's not like you're lending it to a stranger. Then why don't you tell Chris yourself? Olivia was tired of arguing with Rachel. This woman would turn shameless when she became greedy. Rachel faltered, rendered speechless. How could she say something like that? Never mind. Michael intervened, sensing the awkwardness. He suggested, I'll have Ansel Parr arrange for a new computer for Monica tomorrow. Thank you, Dad. Monica promptly expressed her gratitude. Then she made a request. Dad, could you ask Ansel to help me set up the computer too? Of course, Michael agreed. Thank you. Monica's eyes lit up with joy. If Olivia had it, she wanted it too. Olivia lowered her head and offered a faint smile. This Monica was putting in a great deal of effort to mimic her speech and mannerisms but her underlying intelligence was still the same, profoundly lacking. In fact, the moment she decided to copy Olivia, Monica had already started looking irreparably foolish. Now Monica would be forced to pretend to be happy and even keeled all the time, something that didn't come naturally to her, and which required a taxing amount of effort, which was comedic to watch for Olivia. Monica? Michael directed his attention to Monica. There's still a month left before Chef Mario Vincenzo's event. During this time, you should strive to practice and put in extra effort. Okay, Dad. Monica nodded enthusiastically. She had set all her hopes on this opportunity to become a student of the Master Chef. Well, Rachel sighed with a pang of empathy, expressing, Monica's already putting in a lot of effort. The day of the mentee selection event by Chef Mario Vincenzo is almost as nerve-wracking as the day Monica took her high school exams. She's practicing cooking every day, and on top of that, she stays up late revising her recipes. It's not easy. Mom, I'm fine. Monica grinned, shaking her head. Despite the hardships, I'll endure. After all, I want to bring honor to the Johnson family. Silly child. Rachel fondly rubbed Monica's head and looked at Michael with a proud smile. Honey, look at how Monica has matured. Monica, Dad doesn't need you to bring glory to the Johnson family. I want you to be happy and pursue the life you desire. Michael had been contemplated many things lately. After realizing Olivia's intention to develop a game, he felt that it was better for his child to have personal interests rather than carry the burdens of the family. Since you've been putting in so much effort, perhaps, why not focus on preparing for your exams? There's not much difference between Chef Vincenzo's event and your studies. Dad, I want to do this, though. Monica replied, her eyes pleading. Although I'm young, I still want to contribute to the Johnson family. Besides, Uncle Bruno has already agreed. If I don't participate, it might affect Chef Vincenzo's impression of our family. 
Then how about letting Olivia participate in the competition instead? If it's about our family and not you specifically. That way you can concentrate on your studies. Michael proposed after thinking for a moment. He believed that even if Monica wasn't chosen as Chef Mario Vincenzo's disciple and mentee, her failure wouldn't tarnish the Johnson family's reputation. Both Monica and Rachel were taken aback by his suggestion. Olivia chuckled. Michael's suggestion was hilarious. She could see through his intentions. It was quite a feat for these two to make her look favorable in Michael's eyes. Little did they know that it was so easy. No, that's not necessary. Monica quickly changed her stance. Olivia's also working hard. She has even harder high school coursework to manage. Yes, Rachel joined in, attempting to mend the situation. Monica has prepared for this for so long. It would be a shame to not participate. Aside from that, it's also a valuable opportunity for her to grow. That's right, Dad, Monica affirmed. Participating is what matters. I promise I'll manage my time and mental state so it won't be too overwhelming. If you can handle your time well, then I suppose it's fine, Michael agreed. Sighs of relief escaped the mother and daughter as they heard Michael's response. With attention eased, Monica shifted her attention to Olivia. Does Olivia even know how to cook? Not really well, but mostly I just fool around and make things. Olivia smirked. How about we participate together? Monica quipped. She was determined to outshine Olivia during the event. After all, the Johnson family was known for its culinary skills. The one with the better skills would earn admiration, applause, and even flowers. Let's not. Olivia glanced at Monica. She had no interest in such matters. Olivia, this would be an excellent opportunity for improvement. Rachel chimed in, sensing Monica's intentions. The outcome isn't what matters most, it's the experience. You're right, Monica added. It can be seen as our family valuing the event more if we, the sisters, participate. Chef Vincenzo might even appreciate it as well. Why does his happiness matter to me? Olivia found it amusing. Olivia, how about giving it a try? Michael proposed. He didn't intend for Olivia or Monica to be selected as Chef Mario Vincenzo's mentees. His aim was simply to expose them to broader horizons and opportunities. All right, Olivia agreed reluctantly since Michael had already spoken. I guess I'll look into entering the competition. Rachel and Monica exchanged glances and their eyes lit up. Finally, the opportunity for them to take center stage had arrived. Meanwhile, among Olivia's group of friends, their video game development was in full swing, and Zach's involvement added even more strength to Olivia's team. His sister Hannah was instrumental in locating a reputable outsourcing company that offered reasonable prices. Each team member had their designated tasks, collaborating harmoniously while enjoying the process and gaining valuable insights. Unfortunately, things weren't going as smoothly for Wendy or Steve. Wendy, turns out you're not as great as you claim to be, huh? Steve folded his arms across his chest, observing Wendy who stood before him with her head lowered. Fixated on the ground, we agreed on creating 10 opportunities for me to be alone with Olivia. So why haven't you arranged a single one for me? This, it's not entirely my fault. Wendy's gaze remained downward as she mumbled. Liv's been really busy. That's precisely why we need to create opportunities, don't you see that? Steve scrutinized Wendy, who seemed completely bewildered, confirming that she didn't understand. With a sigh, he continued, Wendy, you need to be more vigilant. Wendy recoiled, feeling unjustly accused. How could she not be careful? She muttered. It was you who intentionally picked a quarrel with me. What are you muttering? Steve couldn't catch her words clearly, taking a step forward to hear her better. Uh, nothing. Wendy instinctively retreated a step while shaking her head. Why are you avoiding talking to me right now? Steve chuckled at the situation, moving closer. As Wendy tried to retreat once again, he playfully added, You're not allowed to hide. Reluctantly, Wendy ceased her retreat, lifting her head slightly to meet Steve's gaze. Now she found it easier to face him. Although her feelings for him persisted, 
The earlier struggle of being unable to speak to him had subsided. Wendy, help me find an opportunity quickly. Maybe this Saturday, the day after tomorrow? Arrange for you and Olivia to meet, and then I'll be there instead. Steve proposed with a mischievous grin. He intended to set up another scenario involving Jeremy. He wanted to witness Jeremy's reaction when he saw Steve and Olivia alone on a date. The prospect amused him greatly. I don't really want to, Wendy responded feebly. What? Steve was taken aback. Wendy, this is what you agreed upon before. Are you going back on your word? Are you not afraid that I'll publicly display that disgustingly cheesy love letter on the school bulletin board? Seriously? Wendy was bewildered, her gaze meeting Steve's as she stammered, You, you would actually do that. It's not just a threat. Her heart raced, and a rosy blush spread across her cheeks. Maybe, Steve admitted. He had no business reading other love letters. It was a matter of ethical boundaries, and he adhered to them. However, he couldn't resist playing with Wendy due to her amusing reaction. It's well written, so people should see it. Wendy was at a loss for words. She was upset he had read the letter in the first place, though maybe she shouldn't be. After all, she had written that letter for Steve, so he had every right to read it. Yet her current embarrassment made her regret ever letting him come into possession of it. She only wanted it back. You, you should return it to me. Why should I return it? Steve studied her with a playful smirk. You're the one who reneged on our deal first. Why should I give it back? Help me set up a one-on-one -on -one hang with Olivia and I'll return it to you. He paused before adding, I don't even need 10 opportunities, not even five. Now let's make it three times and I'll give the note back to you. Wendy's heart grew increasingly uneasy upon hearing this. What kind of person was this? It was one thing before, but now he knew that she liked him after reading her love letter. Yet he still wanted her to arrange a meeting with Liv. How could she develop any affection for someone like this? A strong sense of revulsion surged within Wendy. Her voice grew louder as she exclaimed, You clearly have feelings for Jeremy, so why are you pushing me to ask Liv out? If she had mistakenly believed that Wendy had feelings for Jeremy earlier and deliberately snatched him away to mock her, she could accept it. But now that he had read her love letter, why did he still insist on asking Liv out? Was he deliberately humiliating her? What, what are you saying? Who do I like? Steve's brain stalled. Since when had he developed feelings for Jeremy? You like Jeremy, you like Jeremy. Wendy's agitation grew with her words and her eyes welled with tears. If you like him, just admit it. Why are you tormenting me? Who said that? Steve's brows furrowed. He had intended to jest with Olivia and irritate Jeremy, but now he found himself entangled in this mess. I, I'm not telling you. Wendy was unwavering. She would never betray Olivia. We both know now. Wendy. Steve placed his hand on her shoulder. Don't forget that I still have your love letter. You have to agree to my request. Stop. Wendy's frustration deepened. Was this guy really this relentless? but I don't need you to help me ask Olivia out anymore. Steve was quick to rectify his mistake. He needed a way to fix this situation immediately. Wendy, pretend to be my girlfriend. I'll treat you well. Coincidentally, Wendy had feelings for Jeremy. As long as she cooperated, there would be no unnecessary complications, nor would rumors circulate that he was gay. A whirlwind of thoughts spun in her head. Wendy stared at Steve blankly, her eyes filled with disbelief and disappointment. You, you want me to pretend, pretend to be your girlfriend? Yes, pretend to be my girlfriend, Steve asserted. There's only a few months left in the school year. We can pretend until then, is that okay? A slap connected with Steve's face. Wendy clenched her lower lip, her gaze piercing into him. For a prolonged moment, Steve remained dumbfounded before a wave of anger surged within him. What the hell, Wendy, are you out of your mind? I hate you. I never want to see you again. Wendy's tears flowed down her cheeks like tiny pearls. The emotions were overwhelming. You despicable, insincere jerk. She spat out those words and hastened away with swift strides. Me? Steve was bewildered. He wasn't gay 
and yet she was accusing him of being so. How could he be called insincere? Despite his penchant for jesting, he had never played with someone's feelings before. How could he be labeled as such? The faster she ran, the more Wendy felt that something was off within her. She experienced a distinct unease. She didn't know how long she ran or where she ended up. Exhaustion forced her to halt, staring at the completely unfamiliar surroundings. She sank to the ground, hugging her knees as she wept. Why had she fallen for such a despicable person? Even though she knew her feelings for him, he had still treated her this way just because she wasn't attractive enough. Just because she wasn't intelligent? Just because she lacked money? Just because she was ordinary? This wasn't her fault. Steve's voice echoed in her ears, along with memories of her father humiliating her by throwing money at her face months ago. It's not my fault. Wendy repeated over and over as she wrapped her arms around her knees and bit her lower lip. Why did Steve treat me like this? Perhaps the fatigue from crying had taken its toll, but staring at the unfamiliar surroundings, Wendy felt lost and helpless. Retrieving her phone, she saw that only one bar of battery remained. Hastily dialing Olivia's number, she waited for her friend to pick up and then quickly uttered, Liv, what's the matter? Olivia replied quickly over the phone. She immediately noticed the hoarseness and sorrow in Wendy's voice. She asked, Where are you? I I don't know where I am. Wendy managed to say amid her sobs, I'm lost and my phone is about to die. Don't worry, share your location with me. Stay put and I'll come to get you. Olivia advised urgently, observing the darkening sky outside with concern. Don't wander around. All right. After a while of sobbing, Wendy hung up the call and shared her location with Olivia. Just as she sent the information, her phone automatically shut down. Left with no other choice, Wendy squatted down, awaiting Olivia's arrival in silence. Vera, let's call it a day for the tutoring session. Olivia closed her book, addressing her tutor. I need to pick up a friend. Of course, Vera gestured dismissively. If you have something to attend to, go ahead. Sven will be here to pick me up later. Thank you, I apologize for the interruption. Olivia smiled apologetically. Upon leaving the room, she instructed a maid to bring another plate of fruit to her room. Descending the stairs and reaching the entrance, Olivia realized that her favorite driver, Morris Pratt, had already gone home for the evening. Frustrated, she noticed her father, Michael, arriving. Eagerly, she greeted him. Dad, can you drive me somewhere? Of course. Michael noted his daughter's urgency and didn't even enter the house before heading back out with her. Are they kidding? Monica scoffed. Both Rachel and Monica were taken aback. Monica had specifically prepared a meal for Michael today. Why was he leaving so suddenly? It's all Olivia's doing. Rachel sighed, clearly annoyed. Olivia seemed to employ every possible tactic to win her father's favor. And even worse, it was working. Mommy, it's all right. Monica took a deep breath and assured. Chef Maria Vincenzo's recruitment competition is right around the corner. I'll make sure she regrets crossing us then. Behave. Rachel patted Monica's hand reassuringly. My Monica has grown and is becoming more patient, remember? Yes, yeah, I know. Monica nodded in agreement, determined to work even harder. She knew that her imitation of Olivia was getting better and better. Not only her expressions, tone, and gestures, but also her composed demeanor in various situations. She had mastered it all, and it proved truly effective. The more she imitated her sister's demeanor and mannerisms, the more her father seemed to like her and respect her. Fine. I'll behave, Monica pouted, waiting for the day she wouldn't have to pay attention to Olivia anymore. Meanwhile, Olivia sat in the car with her father, Michael, and typed an address on the GPS. Dad, this is the location we're headed to. All right, Michael agreed and steered the car toward the direction indicated by the GPS. Olivia, why the urgency to go there? Wendy is lost. She was crying when she called me and dropped me this pen for her location. Olivia's forehead creased with worry. 
It's already so late, and I'm quite concerned about her. Ah, I see. Michael nodded, and refrained from asking further questions. Wendy remained squatting, her legs growing numb. She still appeared somewhat dazed. She couldn't fathom why so many things were happening to her. As the headlights of a car illuminated her, Wendy shielded her eyes and heard Olivia's voice. Attempting to stand up, she realized her legs lacked strength and caused her considerable pain. Liv! Wendy! Olivia stepped out of the car and rushed to Wendy's side, supporting her as she teetered on the brink of collapse. What happened? Where do you feel uncomfortable? My legs. My legs are numb. Wendy grimaced while baring her teeth. You really can't move here. Let me help you. Olivia sighed and helped Wendy slowly into the car, guiding her to sit in the back seat. Once Wendy was inside, she spotted Michael. Hello, Mr. Johnson. Hello, Wendy, he acknowledged, glancing at Wendy through the rearview mirror. His silence spoke volumes. Wendy, how did you end up in such a remote place? Olivia's anxiety grew as she considered the possibilities. She couldn't help but express her gratitude that no harm had come to her friend. I got lost, Wendy murmured, avoiding mentioning what Steve had said. It was a painful memory, and she was too embarrassed to share it. This was her only shred of dignity left. I understand. Olivia sensed Wendy's reluctance and decided not to press further. You haven't had dinner, have you? No, Wendy nodded. She'd been summoned by Steve right after school, leaving her no time to eat. Dad, have you had dinner? Olivia inquired, looking at Michael. No, I just finished work. Michael replied while driving. Then let's eat first. I haven't eaten either, Olivia suggested, considering her father's well-being as well. How about a deli or some ramen or something quick? All right, Michael agreed, aware of a good ramen shop nearby. Feeling hesitant to eat much, Wendy considered declining, but she found herself unable to articulate her refusal. Both Olivia and Michael had gone to the trouble of searching for her, even if she didn't want to eat, she couldn't bring herself to dampen their spirits. Parking the car in the building's downstairs lot, Olivia asked curiously, Dad, isn't the gold and silver building a jewelry store? Do they serve food there too? Not within the building, Michael responded after locking the car. I'll take you both to a hidden noodle shop. Outsiders aren't aware of it. Ooh, okay, Olivia agreed taking Wendy's hand and trailing Michael. She was genuinely intrigued by her father's words. A noodle shop, unknown to outsiders? Navigating through the streets adjacent to the gold and silver building, crossing two more streets and entering an obscure alley, Olivia arrived at a tiny noodle shop at the alley's end. Is this the place? Olivia gazed at the shop with a sense of warmth. Yes, Michael affirmed ushering them inside as he greeted the individuals behind the counter. Is the boss here? Yes, welcome. An older man and a younger man were stationed behind the counter. The older man, middle-aged and energetic, appeared spirited and full of vitality. He seemed to be around Michael's age. <laughs> what brings you here, Michael? Oh my gosh, Michael, hi! The younger one stepped forward with a gentle smile. You know them? Olivia glanced at her father curiously. Olivia, this is my friend who played the drums when I formed the band in college. You can call him Jacob. The one beside him is his son, Dusty. Michael introduced, continuing. Jacob, this is my daughter, Olivia, and her friend, Wendy. Hello. Olivia greeted Jacob with a nod. But as she looked at the people around Jacob, her shock grew. She remembering encountering Dusty in her previous life but couldn't recall where. If her memory was accurate, Dusty was the top sniper for someone she couldn't recall. What was he doing here now? What would you like to eat? Jacob inquired with a smile. Today is my son's apprenticeship. You folks are in for a treat. My boy's skills surpass even mine. He won't let me down. Is that so? Michael chuckled. Then I must give it a try. After gesturing for Olivia and Wendy to sit, Michael placed his order. I'll have a portion of grilled noodles, keep it simple. Hmm, 
Wendy glanced at the wooden board menu on the wall and said, I'd like a serving of Sapporo noodles. Sapporo ramen, right? Jacob confirmed, then turned to Olivia. And you? Hmm. Olivia regained her focus and looked at the small wooden board. Pig's cartilage ramen. All right, have a seat. It'll be ready shortly. Jacob signaled to his son and turned back to Michael, seating himself opposite him. Mikey, it's been a while since you visited. I've been a bit occupied lately, Michael responded. It's been some time indeed. The ambiance here remains tranquil. Indeed, Jacob chuckled, self-mocking. Aside from you, there aren't any other customers around. I see. Michael shook his head with a hint of exasperation. At your age, you're still so lighthearted. Who allowed you to set up shop in such a remote location? I've heard it's quite a hassle to get here. Well, with property prices these days, who can afford to rent for a shop at a prime location? Jacob pointed towards the table. No need to mention it. Even this small place of mine will see a rent increase starting next year. Why not collaborate with me? Michael couldn't fathom Jacob's reasoning. With such remarkable culinary skills, confining oneself to this diminutive establishment seemed counterproductive. And there wasn't even two customers present. No need. I might as well open my own restaurant. Jacob dismissed with a wave. I can't handle your level of management. You spent three years steering the university ship. Graduating was a hard-fraught accomplishment for you. Why would I want to join your company? Jacob teased, though Olivia felt he thought there was some truth to his comment. Isn't that just inviting chaos? You're too reckless not understanding the gravity of things, Michael sighed. If not for his supervision throughout their university years, Jacob wouldn't have graduated. He skipped morning exams for the sake of sleep and missed afternoon ones due to lunch. Michael couldn't fathom why someone could be so undisciplined. Jacob, an audacious drummer, joined Michael's band, leading to three years of supervision and support until graduation. Enough about that, old friend. It's all ancient history now. Jacob switched his focus to Olivia. Your name's Olivia, right? Yes, Olivia nodded, observing Jacob closely. Her gaze was equally assessing while Dusty was a sharpshooter. What about Jacob? What was he? Your dad is quite the traditionalist, huh? Doesn't that make your life difficult? Jacob leaned forward, inquiring with a grin. No, I'm good, Olivia responded with a smile. My dad is pretty easygoing with me. Hmm, I see. Special treatment. Jacob nodded his head. Ah. His remark brought forth laughter from Olivia and Michael. Can they even compare? My daughter's far more sensible than we were at her age. She's the class president at Marshall High School. Michael spoke with evident pride. Wow, you must be as bored as your dad was. Jacob quipped, spreading his hands as he turned his gaze toward Wendy. Your friends with such a stick in the mud. You must have been like me in the past, right? Hmm? Wendy was momentarily taken aback. Liv isn't boring. She didn't detect his sarcasm. Um, sir? She asked, pivoting the conversation. Can I ask you something? Sure, what is it? Jacob inquired. It's about a shop like this. Wendy gestured around. The small shop, measuring merely 40 square feet, could accommodate only a handful of tables and chairs. Its decor was simple and straightforward. How much does it cost to open one? Planning to open your own shop, eh? Jacob scanned the premises and answered, I rented this place for 40000 a year. It's expected to go up to 50000 next year, given the current real estate prices. A year's rent is $50,000? Wendy blinked in surprise. It seemed quite affordable, yet it demanded a hefty annual sum of 50000 When would she ever be able to gather enough money for Desiree to open a restaurant one day? Shops in New York City do tend to be pricier. Michael nodded. This is the very low end of pricing, and you can see why. Nobody knows it's here. Don't worry, Olivia assured Wendy. She knew Wendy's dream was to buy a restaurant for Desiree, and she read her thoughts. It won't take us long once we're older. Olivia held confidence in their plan. 
She reckons that getting enough capital wouldn't be an issue when the time came. Even if Wendy couldn't purchase a restaurant outright, it would suffice for three to five years of rent for a decent place. They just needed to keep striving. Money would come. Mm-hmm. Wendy nodded without further comment. To Olivia, this seemed straightforward, but for her, it was a monumental challenge. Such was the difference between them. I promise, Olivia asserted, hearing her friend's thoughts. Together, they would accomplish everything they set out to do. Pork braced ramen coming right up. Dusty emerged with two servings of ramen, placing them before the two. He then returned to the kitchen, leaving a portion of Sapporo ramen pending. Olivia took a sip of soup first. Its savory and aromatic flavor was complemented by a hint of sweetness, and the velvety smooth texture carried the essence of the broth. Olivia's eyes sparkled involuntarily. It was the first time she had relished the soup this much. She scooped a spoonful and meticulously examined it, mentally dissecting its components. Onion? No, not onion, it's shallots. Wow, you've got quite the palate, just like your father. Jacob chuckled. If you and your father frequent this place a bit more, you might end up with all my secret recipes. <laughs> Olivia chuckled awkwardly, taking another bite of the broth. She looked up and remarked, I have a question. This crescent moon almond seems different from what I usually have. It's incredibly tender and... Stop right there, don't ask. Jacob interjected hastily. This is genuinely a proprietary secret recipe. I can't confirm or deny anything. All right, Olivia shrugged. Olivia tried this. Michael selected a piece of grilled meat from his bowl, placing it in Olivia's. Thank you. She accepted it and took a bite. The meat's fatty yet non-greasy consistency melting in her mouth brought a gleam to Olivia's eye. Observing Michael feeding Olivia, Wendy lowered her head slightly, her eyes filled with a mix of envy and sadness. Wendy, taste this. Olivia picked a piece of pig's soft bone from her bowl and offered it to Wendy. It's incredibly delicious. All right, Wendy nodded, accepting the bite. After a few chews, she exclaimed in surprise, It's really, really delicious. Soon, Wendy's order of Sapporo noodles was brought to the table. The bowl arrived steaming, adorned with a light layer of oily broth that shimmered like a golden, heavily woman loo. Delicately sliced mushrooms forming a cross, three pieces of fish cake arranged neatly, the allure of heart-shaped eggs and vibrant green vegetables. Visibly, this bowl of noodles was a feast for the eyes. Wendy sipped a spoonful of soup. The flavor started with a pleasant saltiness and transitioned to a gentle sweetness. The rich aroma was both smooth and warm, enveloping her entire being. Taking a substantial bite, her eyes slightly reddened and her glasses began to fog up. Remove your glasses, Olivia giggled. She reached over and gently took Wendy's glasses off. Seeing the misty shimmer in her eyes, Olivia found her utterly endearing. Don't you look lovely? Wendy wasn't the sort of girl who would stun people at first glance, yet even without her glasses, she remained truly enchanting. It was a subtle charm, much like Desiree, who possessed a classic elegance. Similarly, Wendy had captivating phoenix eyes. When her gaze was slightly lifted, tears pooling, she seemed akin to a little fox, an amalgamation of innocence and sorrow. Don't tease me, Liv. Wendy's cheeks tingled with a rosy hue as she lowered her head. She still didn't know her own appearance. She had never been considered a beauty. She was thoroughly ordinary. How could she ever be deemed lovely? I'm not. I was being serious, Olivia assured her friend sweetly. Keep eating, Jacob chimed in with a smile. In this world, a bowl of steaming ramen can work wonders. Besides, it's best when it's piping hot. Good point. Wendy dove into her meal, devouring it until both the noodles and the broth were gone. The heaviness in her heart was noticeably alleviated. The warmth of the ramen spread from her stomach to her chest, comforting her. Is it delicious? Olivia inquired, her smile beaming. 
It's delicious. Wendy pursed her lips. I feel like having another bowl. Can you really eat more? Michael raised an eyebrow, a bit surprised by Wendy's hearty appetite. Always. Wendy pondered for a moment. I can definitely manage a half bowl more. I wouldn't mind a little more either. Olivia added. Could I have another serving, please? Of course. Dusty, who had emerged from the kitchen, turned back at Olivia's request and re-entered the kitchen. Let's each have a bowl. Jacob proposed after some thought. There's enough to go around. But we'd end up wasting if we ordered two bowls. It's a lot. Olivia grinned. And we like sharing. Olivia looked at Wendy and smiled. She treasured Wendy deeply. Besides Victoria, Wendy was the person she cared about the most. Absolutely. Wendy nodded firmly. We don't mind splitting a bowl between us. Wendy felt that she and Olivia needed to remain close friends for the entirety of their lives, lifelong sisters. The fact that the perfect Olivia was willing to be her friend made her profoundly content. Her godmother Victoria treated her so well, and she dreaded the thought of being separated from Olivia. Youth is such a blessing, Jacob smiled, glancing at Michael. We're old now, truly old. Yes, Michael agreed, letting out a sigh. At least I pursued my passions in this lifetime, making it all worthwhile. Jacob smiled, his gaze drifting to the shop. Michael remained silent. What were his passions? What had he truly pursued? What did he love? Olivia lifted her head slightly to observe Michael chiming in. Dad, why don't you find something you're passionate about as well? Look how vibrant Jacob is. <laughs> this little girl sure knows how to speak her mind. I applaud you. Jacob grinned, pointing at Olivia. I'll add an extra heart-shaped egg for you. What does a child like her know? Michael gazed at Olivia, though his eyes lacked their previous certainty. Olivia met her father's gaze and sensed his wavering. A faint smile formed on her lips. His hesitation was all she needed to see. Once he began to waver, the rest would be easier to manage. Dad, you've dedicated over half your life to work. Do you think it's been worth it? Michael's eyes flickered. He found himself involuntarily pondering whether dedicating more than half of his life to work had truly been worthwhile. One more round of noodles. Dusty placed the steaming bowl of ramen noodles on the table. Michael looked at Olivia without uttering a word. However, his eyes conveyed something he hadn't shown before. A desire to push back. He wanted to push back against the unvarying routine of his life, the monotonous job, and even, even against his father, Jack. The last thought surprised Michael himself. What was he thinking? He averted his gaze, feeling awkward, and took a sip of water to steady his emotions. What was happening to him? Why did he suddenly wish to oppose his own father? Such a devilish thought. Olivia watched, reading his thoughts, and smiled. It's working she thought, stifling a smile. Now she just had to be patient. This is so incredibly delicious, Wendy said, licking her lips in satisfaction. Dusty, who had just arrived, saw his culinary efforts being appreciated. His lips curved upwards, a satisfied expression on his face. All right, let's head out once we're done, Michael declared, standing up. We should get home. How much is the bill? No need to worry, my treat. Jacob insisted. Just make it a habit to come by in the future. Oh, come on, take it. You don't have many customers. Michael pulled out a couple of hundred dollar bills and pressed them into Jacob's hand. Seriously, take it? We're leaving? Take care, then. Jacob waved his hand. Feel free to drop by whenever you're free. Absolutely, Michael nodded, leaving Jacob with a sense of nostalgia each time he saw him, as though he was reminiscing about the past Olivia shot a quick glance at Dusty before turning around, but in her haste, she accidentally knocked over the bowl. As the bowl teetered on the edge of falling, Dusty reacted swiftly, stepping forward to catch it, preventing a single drop of soup from spilling. Olivia's eyes sparkled and a smile graced her lips. Impressive skills, Dusty, she remarked, noticing Dusty's slightly awkward expression. With a playful tone, she added, I'll definitely be a frequent visitor. 
With that, she tugged at Wendy's wrist and followed Michael, who was making his way to the exit. After the trio had left, Dusty turned to his father, his expression somewhat uncertain. Dad, I... No need to worry. Jacob's demeanor shifted, his smile fading into a serious expression with deep eyes. Olivia isn't an ordinary individual. She probably recognized us from the start. She's just 16 or 17 years old, how could she possibly... Dusty's voice trailed off, a tinge of surprise in his tone. Remember, despite her connection to the Johnson family, there's the Park family backing her. Jacob mused, a faint smirk curving his lips. Exceptional talents arise in every generation. He patted Dusty's shoulder reassuringly. The world will soon belong to your generation. Olivia's no simple figure, especially with the old ghost park as her grandfather. True, Dusty responded, his expression a mix of emotions. Dad, how much longer must we remain hidden? Jacob's gaze grew contemplative. A while longer. The news of Chef Maria Vincenzo hosting a competition to take on an apprentice had spread like wildfire in the United States, igniting fervent discussions among chefs across the entire country. With only 12 spots available in the competition, the news that the Johnson family of Manhattan had secured two spots reverberated throughout New York City's major news outlets. The continuous barrage of news reports propelled the Johnson family into the spotlight. On the day of his arrival in New York City, Chef Mario Vincenzo had therefore paid a personal visit to the Johnson Mansion to meet Grandpa Jack. Unfortunately, both Monica and Olivia were still at school and missed the encounter. Monica only learned about the visit when she returned home, secretly vexed that Rachel hadn't informed her earlier. If she had known, she would have taken a leave of absence to ensure she left a positive impression on Chef Mario Vincenzo, enhancing her chances in the competition. Olivia, on the other hand, was not particularly invested in this affair. Her participation in the competition was more driven by her annoyance with Monica's arrogant attitude. The chef recruitment competition was slated for the following day. The day before the competition, Monica diligently practiced at home, and midway through, Bruno returned to provide her with personal guidance, lending her a sense of reassurance. The next morning, Michael personally accompanied both Olivia and Monica to the competition venue. Perhaps seeking to mimic Olivia's style, their outfits for the day, from color to style, were nearly identical. Olivia shot a sidelong glance at Monica, but didn't say a word. Meanwhile, Monica realized her oversight. She should have dressed more elegantly than Olivia today. However, her mind had been preoccupied with speculating about Olivia's choice, causing her to opt for the same attire. Upon arrival at the main venue, Security guards were inundated with reporters and photographers. Various announcements rang out, and while Olivia remained silent, Monica enthusiastically waved and smiled, driven by her determination to emerge victorious. The competition had captured people's attention, with live streaming available online, since cooking shows were so popular. Chef Mario Vincenzo was once named one of the top 10 chefs in the entire world, yet his generation of culinary masters was aging, and their successors, the rising stars, stood poised to replace them one day. Chris, my dear, Sven called out while watching the TV. Olivia's on screen. Vera, holding a plate of freshly washed blueberries, joined Sven. Monica, by her side, is becoming quite irksome. She's blocking Olivia from the camera's view. Who would want to see Monica, though? True, having such a lovely appearance is advantageous, Sven commented, his gaze fixed on the television. Could you scoot over a bit? Chris too abandoned his computer desk for a spot on the couch. As the trio settled in, the doorbell rang. Who could it be? Sven quipped. Did one of you order takeout? No, the two replied in unison. Perhaps Vera made an online purchase again? Sven queried. No. Vera's eyes remained glued to the television. Sven, you're so exasperating, just be quiet. Sven pursed his lips, feigning hurt. The doorbell continued to ring. Sven, please go and open the door. Vera and Chris both frowned and said simultaneously. Sven protested his innocence, but stood up and approached the door to open it. Who is it? 
As the door swung open, Sven laid eyes on a smiling elderly man in a double-breasted suit. The man sported vintage sunglasses and held an eagle-headed cane in his hand. Sven's brain seemed to stall for a moment. Then, before the old man could say a word, he abruptly shut the door. Who was it? Vera inquired curiously. The cultured sound of the door being closed was rather loud. Could it be a door-to-door -door advertisement? Um, Sven hesitated and then said, Your second granduncle has arrived. He's already here? Chris and Vera responded in unison, rising from their seats. Why was this so sudden? There wasn't even a phone call. How had the old man located them? Quick, open the door! Vera urged. Only then did Sven spring into action, reopening the door. The elderly man was still outside, wearing a forced smile tinged with a hint of displeasure. You mischievous brat! The old man raised his walking stick and playfully tapped Sven's behind. Why'd you slam the door like that all of a sudden? You startled me! Oh, no, 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 Theodore, there's a misunderstanding. Sven's backside stung, and he grinned. Then he explained, I, I haven't seen you in ages, I got too excited. That's more like it. The old man shot him a glance and entered with a smile. Where's my little Christopher? Granduncle Theodore! Chris's lips twitched. He was already 18, so it felt awkward for his second granduncle to address him as little Christopher. Hey, Fatty V is here too! The old man pinched Vera's cheeks and remarked, You look just like your older sister. Theodore, hi! Vera's lips twitched a few times. Why did he have to bring up that nickname from her childhood? Back then, the old man would always cook for them, and once they started eating, they couldn't stop. She used to eat so much that she'd vomit. This food was more nutritious, but it had contributed to her round childhood figure, leading everyone to call her Little Fatty V. This humiliating nickname motivated her to shed those extra pounds, and she maintained her slim and proud physique since then. Her childhood baggage, Vera wanted nothing to do with it. Look at you three, are you eating properly? The old man observed them, a frown creasing his brow. Come on, come on, let me cook for you. No, no, no. The trio's stomach seemed to convulse at the very thought. They hurriedly interjected. No, 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 we're not hungry. You three are just like when you were little. You'd always say you weren't hungry, but you'd out-eat everyone. The old man reminisced with a smile. The three were rendered speechless. Of course they wanted to eat his food. Theodore here was one of the oldest, most revered chefs in the world. He was from the generation that taught Mario Vincenzo. How could they turn down his cooking? But after consuming his dishes, they would be so full because he always made so many dishes. Grand Uncle Theodore, Vera grabbed the old man's arms decisively and said, Come, let's watch TV. This chef Mario Vincenzo is taking on an apprentice. You must watch this closely. That brat is appearing on TV to take on an apprentice? The old man frowned. I'm at a loss for words. Each new generation is more showy than the last. Chef Mario Vincenzo's generation is so extravagant. Not one of them can hold a candle to me. And you don't see me parading around television. Absolutely, you're so right. None of them can match up to you. Sven, too, swiftly caught hold of the old man's arm. But let's watch TV anyway first. Tune in. Sven? Chris chimed in hastily. Hurry and order some food. We've got some fantastic pizza in this city. Get one for Theodore, too. Got it. Sven immediately stood up and heard the old man say while engrossed in the TV, I'll take double cheese. After entering the competition venue, Olivia immediately noticed that it was significantly quieter than the bustling outside. The attendees inside consisted solely of a bunch of reporters, the contestants themselves, and the television production that was airing the competition on TV. The atmosphere within the immaculate venue exuded a sense of solemnity. The floor, constructed from ivory marble, supported 12 square tables covered in white cloth, neatly arranged in two rows of six. 
On the venue's right side, there lay a food selection area stocked with a wide array of fresh ingredients from the sea and land. Olivia glanced around, realizing that she and Monica were likely the youngest participants in the competition. The rest of the attendees, dressed in professional chef attire, appeared to be in their 20s or 30s, presenting a more formal demeanor. After a short while, Chef Mario Vincenzo captured everyone's attention when he made his entrance. He appeared to be in his 50s and donned a meticulously combed white suit, polished Oxford leather shoes, and a medium build. His expression exuded seriousness, and his eyes possessed a sharp, penetrating gaze. Chef Mario Vincenzo was flanked by Olivia's uncle Bruno and her half-brother Edward. Wow, they must be really important in the culinary world, Olivia thought upon seeing them. Observing this, Monica couldn't help but swell with pride. She was well aware of the impressiveness of her uncle and brother. She cast a cold, disdainful glance at Olivia, her eyes oozing arrogance as if to say, Did you witness that? That's my younger brother, Liv. Olivia, however, paid no heed to Monica's disdainful look. Her primary concern was the nature of today's challenge. Regardless of the outcome, she believed that receiving guidance from a renowned chef would prove useless in her mission back home anyway. Meanwhile, Desiree and Wendy anxiously stood before their television. Desiree glanced at Chef Mario Vincenzo's appearance and curled her lips in disdain. How could someone so pompous be deemed her goddaughter's mentor? Nevertheless, she recognized that this presented an opportunity for Olivia to learn. She had even imparted some of her own modified family recipes to Olivia for Liv to use in the competition. Ah, Wendy exclaimed, holding her cheeks with both hands. Liv is so beautiful. She's the most stunning person in the competition. Look at how proud you are, Desiree remarked, shaking her head with a smile. You're a good friend, Wendy. I'm thrilled Liv is on TV. How exciting. I think Liv is even more attractive than most TV stars, Wendy pouted. Yes, there's no denying that Liv is beautiful. Wendy's heart brimmed with joy as she genuinely wished for Olivia's victory. Today marks Chef Mario Vincenzo's official recruitment competition. I kindly request that all the reporters in attendance turn off their camera flashlights and ensure they remain quiet so as not to disturb the contestants. Thank you for your cooperation, Bruno said. He was the one representing Chef Mario Vincenzo as he hosted the competition since Maria was known to speak very little except about food. He was dressed in a tuxedo and exuded an air of politeness. His smile was as warm as a spring breeze, and his voice remained calm and composed. His appearance won the admiration of many housewives watching on their televisions at home. Sir, may we commence? Bruno asked Chef Mario. Yes, Chef Mario Vincenzo nodded slightly. Let's begin. Very well then, Bruno stepped forward and announced. The first round of the competition is titled Stewing. The ingredients for this round are all located on the right side of the venue. Contestants may arrange them as they see fit. The time limit is three hours. Bruno raised his wrist to check the time on his watch, noting that the minute and second hands both pointed to 12. He declared, Start. Stew. Desiree, watching in front of the TV, was taken aback. Her family recipes that she had given Olivia didn't include any stewed dishes. At this point, it would all come down to Olivia's ingenuity. Nevertheless, Desiree remained confident in Olivia. After all, Olivia had displayed remarkable culinary talent during this period. Upon hearing the competition rules, Monica's lips curled with pride. She had diligently trained for this and it was Bruno who had taught her the art of stewing. Not a single detail eluded her, and she had mastered all of Bruno's cooking techniques to perfection. She was determined not to lose to anyone in today's competition. Stewing, Olivia mumbled as she walked slowly towards the contestant area on the right side of the venue. While other contestants scrambled for the best ingredients, Olivia observed quietly. After carefully examining all the ingredients, she nodded knowing exactly what to do. She stepped forward to select a few ingredients, which had previously been the subject of fierce contention among others. 
However, by the time it was her turn, the remaining components were less exquisite. Olivia let out a sigh of disappointment. Adhering to the recipes ingrained in her memory, she placed all the required items into her bamboo basket. Some of these had already been snatched by others, prompting Olivia to substitute them with other options. When Olivia returned to her square table with the basket, she received a close-up shot from the cameras because she was the last one to return. Why does her selection look so different from everyone else's? Wendy furrowed her brow. I didn't see such poor ingredients when the camera panned earlier. It's because Liv was too slow. Desiree also expressed mild concern. Speed and observation were crucial skills for a chef, and it seemed Olivia had deliberately started evaluating from the very beginning. Come on, Liv. Wendy nervously clenched her fists. All she could do was silently encourage Olivia. Inside the venue, Olivia diligently washed and sliced all the ingredients. By the time she finished cutting, Monica had already begun preparing the soup base. Monica's adept movements earned nods of approval from many in the room, and the cameraman even captured her extensively. Who wants to see her? Give us some shots of Liv quickly! Vera held a slice of pizza in her hands and furrowed her brow. This girl's no good. Theodore furrowed his brow and shook his head at Monica. Her actions are too robotic. This kind of blind imitation without engaging her brain doesn't suit a chef. Exactly! Vera had witnessed Monica's cooking before while tutoring Olivia at the Johnson Mansion. The meticulously measuring repetitive actions and preparing the same dish day in and day out had almost made her sick. She had thought at the time that this person was incredibly peculiar. How could a chef only cook a single dish? Little chubby girl, who is this Liv you're talking about? The elderly man asked curiously. She's that girl, the really beautiful one. Vera pointed to the girl in the corner of the television. She just picked a bunch of subpar ingredients. Just as Vera finished speaking, the television switched to a close-up of Olivia. This girl. Theodore chuckled. This girl has potential. He could tell that this child was genuinely enjoying herself when cooking. Only when one was happy could the food they made truly taste good. Upon hearing this, Chris's thoughts churned. Theodore, maybe you should take her on as your apprentice, Chris suggested. The elderly man smiled and responded, Oh, I'm far too old to take on new apprentices anymore. All of the chefs my age are. The old man waved dismissively and continued watching television. He remarked, Besides, talent like this girl probably won't slip through that old geezer Muriel's fingers. Everything has its order. If this girl becomes his apprentice, I can't possibly snatch her away from him. I'm just an old man, so don't torment me about taking on new apprentices. What a shame, Sven mumbled as he finished the last bite of pizza. Chris's gaze remained fixed on the television. Olivia appeared calm and composed, as if she relished the act of cooking. The faint smile on her lips added to her charm. It seemed that Chef Maria's recruitment competition had captured the attention of the entire country. In a remote country villa in England, a TV also broadcasted the event. Inside, a husky barked excitedly at the TV. It scratched its front paws against the screen urgently. Its voice filled with enthusiasm. Its eyes were locked onto the figure on the TV, and its eyes seemed moist. What's wrong with Betty? The maid responsible for the husky felt a bit uneasy. After hesitating for a moment, she decided to call her boss. She reported the situation concerning Betty. It's okay. The man sighed and glanced at the TV screen in his car. I'll return home now. After hanging up the phone, the man looked at the beautiful figure on the TV and furrowed his brow slightly. It had been so long, but it appeared Betty still hadn't forgotten Olivia. A pang of jealousy welled up from the depths of his heart. On the TV, the girl bore a satisfied expression as she used a spoon to taste her fresh, delicious stew. Not bad. Olivia nodded in contentment and proceeded with the final steps. Two and a half hours had elapsed by now. Despite her deliberate pace, she still had time. She added the final seasonings, closed the pot's lid, and adjusted the heat to a low flame for a slow simmer. At that moment, Monica had completed all her tasks. She silently counted down in her head. Three, 
two, one. As she reached one, Monica turned off the flame and raised her hand to signal that she was finished with her stew. A contestant has completed their dish, Bruno announced. He nodded with satisfaction. He exchanged a glance with Edward, who then approached Monica and personally served two bowls. He sampled one himself and handed the other to Chef Mario Vincenzo. Nice, Chef Mario Vincenzo remarked after tasting it. The taste is quite good. Sir, what do you think? Bruno inquired. Well, Chef Mario Vincenzo commented, the soup is fresh and fragrant. It would have been even better if the fire had been turned off ten seconds later. It's not easy to find such skill in the younger generation. True, Bruno agreed. He had deliberately provided Monica with a slightly earlier time than expected, knowing that perfection could reveal flaws, especially in front of Chef Mario Vincenzo, the judge. Upon receiving such a high evaluation, Monica couldn't contain her joy. Her cheeks flushed with excitement. She could sense all the cameras aimed at her, so she put on a perfect and composed smile. Monica's heart danced with elation. She had awaited this moment for so long. Olivia, do your best. Monica softly whispered to Olivia, slightly turning her head. Her voice was hushed, ensuring she wouldn't disturb the other contestants. Yet it was enough for viewers in front of their screens to read her lips. Clearly, she was offering encouragement to her half-sister. In an instant, the internet exploded with praise for the sweet little angel, Monica Johnson, who was a skilled, quick cook and who kindly wanted her sister to do well too. Olivia merely curled her lips and remained silent. Following Monica, the other contestants completed their dishes. After Chef Mario Vincenzo tasted them, he provided evaluations one by one. The praise varied, and none received the same high award as Monica, which delighted her even more. The last to finish was Olivia. Feeling it was time, she turned off the flame and raised her hand. Now, our final contestant has also completed her dish, Bruno announced to the TV cameras before he signaled to Edward. Edward curled his lips in disdain. What could that despicable person accomplish? Olivia observed as Edward approached her table and directly lifted the stew's lid. The stew's delightful aroma immediately filled the entire venue. Bruno and Chef Mario Vincenzo's eyes lit up. Edward frowned as he served himself a bowl of soup. After tasting it, his expression changed. The flavor was remarkably delicious. He examined the ingredients in Olivia's stew and found them identical to those of the other contestants. Yet the taste, even if he begrudgingly admitted it, he couldn't replicate such a flavor. Even with a recipe, he might struggle to match this taste. An unsettling feeling crept into Edward's heart. Could it be that Olivia was a genius in this field? Impossible. How could this person be better than him? His mind raced. Edward offered another bowl of stew to Chef Mario Vincenzo. Unnoticed by anyone, he discreetly sprinkled a small amount of salt hidden under his nails into the bowl. Seeing the salt dissolve rapidly, Edward curled his lips slightly. This unique salt had initially been prepared primarily for Olivia in Boston. Monica was determined to secure it, so Bruno had enlisted Edward's assistance. Supposedly, he was tasting the stew first to help Chef Mario Vincenzo with his evaluation. However, in reality... Bruno had arranged for him to assist Monica in eliminating formidable competitors. Fortunately, the other dishes had all fallen short of Monica's standards, or so he believed. After Chef Mario Vincenzo tasted the stew, his expression grew complex. The flavor was exquisite, but the excess salt slightly marred the perfection of the dish. Nevertheless, he determined Olivia was indeed a promising talent. If he could mentor and refine her, she could become a remarkable chef. With this in mind, Chef Mario Vincenzo raised his head and inquired in a low voice, What's her name? Who? Edward muttered inwardly. The girl in the yellow skirt. Chef Mario Vincenzo clarified. Edward looked at Monica, who was also dressed in yellow. He rolled his eyes and responded, 
She is my sister, Monica. Very well, Chef Mario nodded. Soon, after a few more rounds that went the same as the stewing round in the competition, after Edward rigged each judging in favor of Monica, the results were in. Chef Mario chose Monica as his disciple. Upon hearing the outcome, Olivia couldn't fathom how she could lose to a cooking machine, while Monica sported a look of genuine surprise. She had emerged victorious. In fact, when Olivia's dishes were unveiled, she'd been shocked and fearful of losing. But as her name was announced, Monica was overwhelmed with joy. After declaring the winner, Chef Mario Vincenzo exited the venue. The camera swiftly turned their focus on Monica, who waved at them with a triumphant smile. Olivia had not anticipated losing to Monica. She lowered her head and sighed, then proceeded to tidy up the table where she had cooked. Following the crowd, she exited the venue. A reporter seeking to exploit the contrast between the sisters captured her actions. Witnessing Olivia's behavior, the reporter's initial intention of belittling her shifted. Graceful loser, the title for a news piece flickered through the pop culture reporter's mind, and the outline of a report began to take shape. As they left the venue, Michael approached them and patted Olivia on the shoulder. You did exceptionally well. I am so, so proud of you. Thank you, Olivia replied, curling her lips into a smile. Michael's gestures managed to alleviate some of her despondency. Just as Olivia emerged from the venue, Monica also appeared. As the victor, she received the warmest welcome. A horde of pop culture bloggers converged upon her, their cameras flashing incessantly, as they debated which questions to pose. Reality cooking competitions have been so big recently, and everyone who tuned into this one would want to read about the contestants over the coming days. Monica maintained a smile and graciously answered the inquiries that piqued her interest one by one. Darn it. Something's not right. Sven punched the air back at Chris's penthouse apartment. How could a beauty lose? Exactly, there must be some hidden rule or something. Vera chimed in, frowning as she turned to the elderly man. Theodore had just praised Olivia as a promising talent. How could she lose to Monica? Vera asked with a touch of frustration. What do you think, second granduncle? Me? The elderly man narrowed his eyes. I suspect that old man Vincenzo has lost his marbles. A second granduncle. Chris gazed at the lonely figure of Olivia on the television and then at his elderly relative. Are you really not bothered by this? Yes, how could I not be bothered? Theodore furrowed his brow. He believed that if he personally mentored her, this young girl would eventually surpass everyone in her skill. There were countless individuals who could cook skillfully, mastering knife techniques, heat control, and ingredient pairing. However, the essence of cooking wasn't solely about techniques, precision, or research. It was about genuine enjoyment. This young girl relished the cooking process wholeheartedly. The elderly man could sense that she possessed the same essence he had cherished. She wasn't fixated on technique or research. She simply reveled in the experience. People these days are excessively pragmatic. For such individuals, reaching the pinnacle of culinary skills often proved elusive. Paradoxically, those who harbored no ambitions, those who didn't even consider cooking a lifelong pursuit, were the ones who effortlessly surpassed themselves and grasped the true essence of cooking. In the realm of cooking, once ingredients were selected, sliced and placed in a pot with heated oil and added water, followed by seasonings, the process remained the same. What truly really mattered was the heart behind it. And this young girl, Theodore, saw that heart. What are you waiting for? Ask her to be your apprentice, Chris urged. If Chef Mario Vincenzo wakes up, it will be too late. Hey, don't rush me. Let me consider. Think it through. Theodore hesitated. Theodore, after this opportunity passes, it may not come again. Sven interjected when he noticed the situation. This so-called amazing Chef Mario Vincenzo was hardly worth Olivia's attention. If she intended to actually learn from a true master, she should seek out one of the original true greats, like Theodore. He taught people like Chef Mario everything they knew after all. Chris is right, Theodore. Liv possesses both character and talent, Vera added. Why the hesitation? Give me a moment, I need to think. 
Theodore grappled with his decision. It was such a remarkable talent. You take your time, Chris said, seeing the old man's hesitation. He realized there was something he could try. Under his breath, he muttered, Olivia, I'm doing my best to help you. You should seize this opportunity. Meanwhile, in Michael's car, Olivia gazed out the window at Monica, still smiling during her interviews. Liv couldn't fathom why she had lost. It didn't make sense, but she decided to let it go. Perhaps her skills simply weren't as good as the others. Olivia sighed and leaned her head against the car seat, taking a moment to rest. Elsewhere, however, it wasn't only Theodore Jones who was moved by Olivia's performance. There was someone else watching the television who was similarly stirred. This Mario Vincenzo guy is getting more and more muddled with age. He even missed such a remarkable talent, remarked an elderly lady in her 60s. Her coiled hair was adorned with an elegant star-shaped brocade. She reached for a white porcelain teacup in front of her and turned to the person beside her. Rory, what do you think? Chef Rory Chang furrowed his brow slightly, doubt flickering in his eyes. I find her technique rather familiar. Now that you mention it, the elderly lady paused, her hand hesitating. The elderly lady was named Chef Carol Zarin. This girl's cooking reminds me of so many other people's. Yes, Chef Chang mused, his brow furrowing. Let's not discuss this further. I should be going. Why are you leaving? The elderly lady was taken aback and stood up. You've only been here for two days. We haven't had a proper catch-up session. I'm heading to New York City. Chef Chang replied with a feeling that he might find his daughter this time. New York City? Chef Zarin glanced at the TV, clenched her teeth and said, Wait, I'll go with you. What are you planning? Chef Chang was perplexed. I think that girl who lost has a keen eye. Chef Carol Zarin retorted. Mario Vincenzo has grown senile. When it comes to identifying talents, my eyes are sharper. She snorted and playfully pulled on her earlobe. I want this girl as my apprentice. What if I want her as my apprentice? Chef Chang furrowed his brow. Nonsense. Chef Carol Zarin scoffed, rolling her eyes. Maybe you'll go to the city and find your daughter. And maybe your daughter has a child, and if so, then you'll surely teach that child how to cook. So let me have this Olivia girl. Chef Chang paused, recognizing the possibilities. If he did have a grandson or granddaughter, it might be a perfect chance to pass on his legacy. All his former apprentices had established their own families. If he were to select a successor from his own mentees, he might find a satisfactory one. However, he had spent all these years searching for his daughter. He had missed the prime opportunity. In any case, Chef Carol Zarin shrugged, I like this girl and I'm taking her on as an apprentice if she'd like to work with me. She extended her slender index finger and pointed at Chef Chang. Anyone who wants to challenge me can try. She smiled mischievously. No one's challenging you. Chef Chang remarked with a frown. Decades have passed, yet your arrogant and domineering personality hasn't changed one bit. It's all thanks to your three brothers. Chef Carol Zarin muttered in a low voice. Although she and her generation's best chefs weren't biological siblings, their relationship resembled that of close kin. What made it exceptional was their mutual appreciation and respect for each other's culinary skills. Each of the great chefs specialized in different culinary domains. Their preeminent leader, Theodore Jones, was known for European cuisine. The second of the great chefs, Franco Alva, specialized in seafood while Divine Chef Chang focused on Asian cuisine and Chef Carol Zarin's expertise lay in grains, meats, and farm-to-table. Although they had planned to travel to New York City together, they found that due to inclement weather, all flights were grounded for the next three days. This left the two of them in a state of bewilderment, forced to bide their time. Meanwhile, in New York City, Michael brought his two daughters back to the family mansion. As they disembarked from the car, Monica halted in front of Olivia. Liv, it must have been quite an ordeal for you to compete with me in today's competition, Monica declared, lifting her chin with an air of arrogance. Especially since today I, Monica, am the star. It wasn't an ordeal, 
Olivia replied, casting a glance at Monica. But you, are you tired of copying others? Even if you win, it'll be a victory achieved with my approach. Monica, such a meaningless victory. Cherish it. Observing Monica's increasingly displeased expression, Olivia smiled and continued. Sometimes I genuinely admire you. I mean, being able to be as proud as you are while being as ridiculous as you are. That is a talent. It's like being excited to be basic. Monica clenched her teeth, her eyes filled with fury. It appeared that imitating Olivia had become a habit for her. Regardless of her actions, her first thought was always, what would Olivia do? This kind of thinking constrained her actions and even began to influence her thoughts. You only won because you were doing what Olivia would do, Monica thought, and that thought was a thorn that deeply pierced Monica's heart. Observing Monica's thoughts and the subsequent shift in Monica's expression, Olivia smiled and walked past her, entering the Johnson family mansion. She anticipated what would transpire in the living room, but decided to disregard it. She still couldn't fathom how she had lost. Olivia stretched out on the bed. The comfortable mattress and soft blanket instantly eased her senses, and she closed her eyes, ready to take a nap. However, just as she was on the verge of drifting into slumber, her phone rang, abruptly waking her. She groggily reached for the phone and answered it with a casual, Hello? Hey, Francis said. I saw the TV. Don't worry, winning and losing are part of the game. You're still the best in my eyes. Thank you. Olivia replied, touched. And I have good news for you. The game we created caught an investor's attention when it was showcased at that video game creating contest I think I told you about. We also advanced to the next round. We got a slot in the finals along with an advance reward of $50,000 to keep creating our game. And the game is already generating income through downloads and in-app purchases. Olivia's eyes widened. We're making six figures in weekly sales for the game. Francis replied with evident excitement. Since we're making money, why don't we give everyone a share of these profits now? So some of our friends can make back their initial investments? Olivia inquired. Sure. Francis agreed. How much per person? Olivia pondered briefly before asking, What's the cost of renting a well-located space in New York City for a private restaurant? For a smaller one, I'd guess around ten to 20000 a month should suffice, Francis estimated. Then each person will receive 60000 Olivia decided. Wendy had been feeling rather down lately, especially regarding her wish to open a restaurant with her mom, Desiree. So Olivia wanted to give her some funds to help her put away to open the restaurant sooner rather than later. This way, Wendy would have something of her own to look forward to. Sounds good. Francis confirmed. I'll discuss this with Millie, who's managing the funds. All right, Olivia said after a moment's thought. And if we pay out the profits now, we might not have enough funds at the moment to continue with all our operating costs, so I'll contribute additional funds. I'll do the same, Francis declared. With the game's remarkable success, borrowing another large sum from his father wouldn't be a problem. Agreed. It's settled then. Olivia concluded before ending the call. She intended to share this great news with Wendy, who had been going through a tough time lately. It had been a hectic period, and she hadn't been attentive to Wendy. Furthermore, Wendy had faced some challenges. She hadn't seen her interact with Steve Shook either, and it appeared they were avoiding each other, harboring a mutual dislike. Now that the chef's recruitment competition had concluded, it was an opportunity for Olivia to have a heart-to-heart -heart with Wendy but Olivia's phone rang before she could even dial her number. Olivia's lips curled into a smile when she saw it was Wendy. Hey, Wendy said as soon as she picked up. Let's go eat ramen. She was grateful that Wendy wanted to treat her to ramen, remembering how the warm noodles had comforted her during a difficult moment. Olivia agreed. All right, let's go back to that place we went before with my dad. Or is that too pricey? No, it's fine. Wendy responded determinedly through the phone. She didn't mind spending a bit more if it would make Olivia feel better after her defeat in the competition. All right, Olivia said. So what time should we meet? Anytime works, Wendy replied. 
I have no other plans today. Her words stumbled a bit, but she was determined to be there for Olivia. In that case, Olivia checked the time and suggested, let's say six o'clock. I'll come to your place to pick you up. Okay, Wendy agreed with a nod. Phew, Olivia sighed, exhaling deeply. She pushed her worries aside in one breath. She had received good news from Francis and a comforting call from Wendy. Olivia felt that the competition's outcome was no longer the most important thing. She had people who cared about her. After she was contemplating this, a dozen or so messages flooded in, all from concerned classmates. Sam Feinstein even sent a humorous selfie to lift her spirits. As Olivia looked at Sam's silly photos, she burst into laughter. Shortly after, she received a video call from Millie, and they chatted for a while before ending the call when they ran out of things to say. As the time neared to contact her driver, Morris Brad, Olivia grabbed her backpack and was about to leave. However, when she checked the contents, she realized her wallet was missing. In the process of searching for it, she stumbled upon the concealed gun she kept in her drawer. With a slight frown, Olivia strapped the gun to her thigh. Monica's success today might make her a bit reckless, and it was better to be cautious. Guns were prohibited in her house, so it was safer to carry them on her person. After arranging her skirt, Olivia left her room. As she descended the stairs, she could hear boisterous laughter coming from the living room. Both Bruno and Edward had returned to celebrate Monica's victory. Rachel was still glued to Monica, treating her like a treasure. However, as soon as Olivia entered the living room with her bag, the laughter abruptly ceased. Liv, your sister has achieved such a big accomplishment this time. Don't you have a few words of congratulations? Rachel asked provocatively. Congratulations, Olivia replied curtly and turned to leave. Wait a moment, Monica called after Olivia. Liv, our family is going to the Grand Imperial Hotel to celebrate later. Our grandfather has invited many guests. Won't you join us and experience the grandeur? Of course, she was implying that Olivia should be grateful for the invitation. No, Olivia waved her hand dismissively. I'm not interested. I have work to do. You can go ahead. She had plans to enjoy ramen with Wendy. She glanced at her father, Michael, who was sitting on the sofa, and added with a smile, Wendy is treating me to ramen. Hearing this, Michael understood her intentions and nodded, saying, Go ahead and enjoy yourselves. Okay. Olivia agreed and swiftly made her way out of the house. Now that her father had given her blessing, no one could stop her. As they watched Olivia leave, Edward clenched his fists in anger. How shameless could Olivia be? She had clearly lost, yet she could still smile and go out for ramen? Shouldn't she be hiding in her room drowning in guilt or shame? After leaving her family's mansion, Olivia got into Morris Bratt's car to pick up Wendy. During the ride, Morris tried to offer some comforting words, to which Olivia responded with a smile. Olivia's resilience earned a silent thumbs up from Morris. Upon picking up Wendy, Olivia instructed Morris to park the car in the same spot Michael had taken the girls a few days earlier. They then proceeded to search for the ramen shop they had stopped by before. Finding the noodle shop was a breeze and its lights were still on. Olivia and Wendy exchanged smiles, holding hands as they approached. Just as they were about to reach the shop, a gunshot suddenly rang out, making Olivia's heart skip a beat. The sound was all too familiar. Olivia frowned and turned to Wendy, saying, Wendy, wait here. If you sense anything is wrong, run, okay? What's happening? Wendy asked, her voice trembling. Did you hear gunshots? What's going on? Don't ask questions, just listen to me, Olivia said, gently rubbing Wendy's head. She continued, stay safe, I'll go check it out. She carefully proceeded toward the noodle shop. The owner of the shop was a good friend of her father's, and she couldn't bear the thought of something bad happening. As she approached the half-closed door, her heart sank when she caught sight of bloodstains everywhere. Her gaze followed the trail of blood, revealing several lifeless bodies. Then another gunshot echoed. A person fell before her eyes, gasping for breath. Blood poured from a chest wound, and he seemed to want to say something, but died before he could utter a word. Olivia bit her lip, 
trying to hold back the overwhelming emotion. Jacob, she whispered, realizing that he was the shop owner, the same one who had been jovial with her just days before. Witnessing someone she knew die in front of her was an excruciating experience. Save, save my son, he whispered. Olivia saw the movements of Jacob's lips and nodded in response. But how could she save him? She had no idea how many people were inside. She retreated a few steps silently, changing her angle to get a better view of the situation. This time, she saw only two individuals who were still alive. One was a man in a black suit, holding a gun to Dusty's temple. Dusty, in shock, stared at his father's lifeless body, still unable to comprehend his sudden loss. Dusty, your father was a sharpshooter, but he chose the wrong side, the assassin said. We already agreed to withdraw. Why won't you let us go? Dusty's eyes burned with anger. They had hidden in this secluded place. Wasn't that enough? I'm sorry, but I'm just following orders. The assassin replied apologetically. I'll reunite you with your father now. Dusty clenched his fists, his eyes still locked on his father's corpse. Why had this happened? What had he done wrong? He thought. Why are we suffering this fate? He couldn't accept it. He refused to accept it. Dusty held his breath, anticipating that the gun pressed against his temple would blow his head off. To his astonishment, though, it was the assailant who collapsed instead. Oh, God. Olivia exhaled, relieved that her less than stellar marksmanship hadn't caused her to stumble. Surprisingly, the silencer in her gun had proven effective, and the final bullet had been spent. She had thought to use her powers, but she didn't want to hurt Dusty, and she figured, with very little time to think or plan, that she had a better chance sparing Dusty's life with a single bullet than her powers, which she hadn't been working on for some time. Dusty, still in shock, stared at the person before him who had just saved his life, holding a gun in both hands. The hitman, although injured, wasn't dead. With one hand clutching his abdomen, he attempted to aim his gun at Olivia. He seemed determined to take someone down with him, even in death. Dusty suddenly regained his composure. He seized the assassin's gun and fired three shots into the man's heart. Even after expending all the bullets, he kept pulling the trigger, creating several more clicking sounds. Olivia winced at the deafening gunshots. She realized her earlier lapse in judgment. Her shooting had been subpar resulting in the assassin's painful, protracted demise. After ensuring there was no more immediate threat, Olivia approached Jacob and crouched down beside him. She gently closed his lifeless eyes with her palm. Jacob, I saved Dusty. You can rest in peace now. Dad! Dad! Dusty walked toward his father's lifeless body, his steps heavy. Dad! A flood of precious childhood memories flashed before his eyes. Dusty knelt beside the lifeless body, his hands resting on the ground on either side of it as he bowed deeply. I'm so sorry, Olivia murmured, realizing there were no words she could offer to truly comfort him. Such a traumatic experience defied any outsider's attempts at solace. Ah! A scream pierced the air from behind Olivia. She swiftly turned her hand still clutching the silver gun that she hadn't had time to stow away. Wendy! Olivia called out. Wendy had been worried that Olivia might follow and witness something horrifying, but she never expected the scene that would greet her. Her legs gave way, and she crumbled to the ground in shock, her eyes locked on the gruesome sight before her. Wendy, don't be afraid! Olivia hurriedly approached her. Ah! Wendy cried out, cowering behind Olivia her eyes wide fixed on the gun. Liv, you... Don't be afraid. Olivia discreetly concealed the gun under her skirt. Liv, did you... Did you kill someone? Wendy's voice trembled. Though she hadn't seen it, the sound she'd heard left her little doubt. Her eyes filled with fear and concern. The idea of someone taking another person's life was horrifying and surreal to her, something she never imagined would be a part of her life. It was the sort of thing she associated with news reports and movies, not a reality she had to face. No. Olivia shook her head. My shooting skills aren't good enough to kill someone. She reached out and drew Wendy into a comforting embrace. 
don't worry, you're safe with me. Wendy hesitated for a moment before hugging Olivia back. The shocking scene had rattled her to the core. Let's stand up first. Olivia gently helped Wendy to her feet and guided her outside. Wait here for me. There are some things I need to take care of. Please be careful. Wendy watched Olivia with worry. She didn't want Olivia to go back into that house filled with death, but she understood that Olivia was different. Wendy knew she couldn't help, and the best she could do was not be a burden. She obediently stood by, waiting for Olivia to finish dealing with the situation. Olivia returned to the noodle shop and questioned Dusty. Who did this? Dusty slowly raised his head to meet Olivia's gaze. He hesitated for a moment before uttering two words. I think they're Franco Alva's men. Olivia couldn't be sure, but she thought she may have heard Vera or Chris mention that name before. Maybe she had read their thoughts and heard it that way. She wasn't sure, but she took out her phone and dialed Chris's number. Chris, hi, it's me. Liv! Chris's voice held a surprise. He had some good news to share, but he couldn't get a word in before she interrupted. Chris! Olivia cut him off and relayed the noodle shop's address. There are multiple casualties where I am. Can you come help with the situation? She added. In return, I have something I think you'll want. All right. After hanging up the phone, Chris instructed Sven to gather a team and set out immediately. Chris and his men were quick. In less than half an hour, they had handled everything and cleaned up the ramen shop so that it looked like a simple robbery gone wrong. They would handle the assassination attempt themselves, they decided, without the police getting involved. Police had a habit of getting in the way of revenge anyway. Their guns didn't have silencers, Olivia remarked. I'm concerned there might be follow-up issues. No worries, leave it to me, Chris assured her, giving her head a friendly pat. All right. Olivia led Chris to meet Dusty. Chris, this is Dusty. Jacob, the owner of this restaurant, was Dusty's father. Olivia explained, momentarily pausing. He was just caught up in an unfortunate incident. It seems someone was after him, and that someone was sent by a man named Franco Alva. Chris's eyes flashed with disgust. It was clear the name meant something to him. Chris, Dusty is a remarkable individual. Olivia remarked, a wry smile on her lips. I've brought him to you. It'll be up to you from here. With Dusty's cooperation, Chris could have a potential ally. Afterward, Olivia turned to Dusty. Dusty, if you seek retribution, follow Chris. He'll assist you. There was plenty she didn't understand about Chris, but one thing she knew for sure was that he knew how to look after people, especially if they had a common enemy. With that said, Olivia exited the ramen shop. This place held cherished memories for her, especially the day she'd heard a wise stranger say, In this world, there's nothing sorrowful that can't be eased with a hot bowl of noodles. But now, Olivia couldn't fathom why this father and son duo was relentlessly pursued. What fate awaited Dusty in this merciless world? In this unforgiving reality, Lean was futile. Olivia's and Dusty's only recourse was to confront their enemies head-on and fight with unwavering determination. Only by taking on gods and demons alike could Liv hope to protect those she held dear. I'm ready to fight for those who try to hurt me and those I love, she thought. Observing Wendy still huddled at the store's entrance, Olivia approached her. Wendy, it's over now, let's go, she said, coldly, determined. Okay. Wendy nodded, her complexion still paled. Witnessing such a gruesome scene for the first time was bound to leave her shaken. She rose to her feet, gripping Olivia's hand tightly, wanting to speak but uncertain of where to begin. It's going to be okay, Olivia reassured her, sensing the worry in Wendy's eyes. She offered a smile. Let's go, I'll take you to get something to eat. They had just witnessed such horrors within that room. How could they even think about eating? Wendy thought. She was slightly unsettled by her friend's cool exterior. How could Olivia seem so unbothered by what had just happened? You can join me, Olivia suggested with a smile. I can't let something like this affect my appetite. There will be many more such challenges ahead of us. A flicker crossed Olivia's eyes. 
but Wendy wasn't sure if it was fear or excitement. Let's eat, Liv said resolutely. We need to be prepared for what's to come. A chill went down Wendy's spine. Wendy had truly lost her appetite for dinner. She managed only a few bites before Olivia decided to accompany her home. Liv walked Wendy to her doorstep, exchanged a few reassuring words, and then entered the elevator. As the elevator doors began to close, Olivia spotted Wendy rushing over, frantically trying to pry the doors open with her hands. Panic filled her eyes and her lips quivered, as if she had something urgent to convey. Olivia sensed that Wendy was still deeply frightened. Today's events had indeed been terrifying, and witnessing such violence for the first time would unnerve anyone. It was perfectly natural. Olivia couldn't help but recall her own initial fear when she had first entered a gunfight. At that time, she had been terrified of herself. Liv, Wendy's trembling lips barely formed words. Promise me you'll be okay, promise me you're okay, and you're not getting into anything bad. Olivia was taken aback, her gaze fixed on Wendy's concerned eyes. She smiled faintly and nodded firmly. Don't worry, Wendy, I'm going to be more than okay. She would not just survive and be okay. She would thrive. She would live better than anyone else and she was determined to witness the world she despised crumble before her eyes. Seeing Wendy's lingering worry, Olivia continued, Remember our plan? You, me, and Millie are going on vacation together during the summer break, and you're going to live happily ever after. Yes, Wendy nodded and then stepped back. She watched as the elevator door slowly closed. Well, a plan is a plan, and I won't let anything get in the way of that, Olivia said just before they fully closed. She smiled and continued on her way. Liv returned to the Johnson mansion about an hour later. Originally, she had planned to enjoy a ramen meal with Wendy after her competition loss, but fate had certainly thrown them a curveball. Because Wendy was still recovering from the shock and remained silent throughout the evening, Olivia had forgotten to inform her about the money they'd earned for their game. I'm back, Olivia greeted her father, Michael, who sat on the sofa. Michael hadn't removed his suit yet, suggesting he had recently returned from a dinner engagement. Dad, where is everyone? Given Monica and Rachel's typical behavior, they would have been sitting on the sofa, eagerly awaiting her return to boast about their day. They haven't returned yet from their party at the hotel. I have a headache, so I came back early. Michael replied with a forced smile as he greeted Olivia. I see, Olivia nodded understanding the situation. The limelight today had been on Monica and Bruno, rendering Michael something of an afterthought. Without further words, Olivia approached the sofa and gently massaged her father's temples with her fingers. Feeling better? Much better, Michael sighed in relief. Then he suggested, Liv, how was your dinner with Wendy? What'd you order from Jacob's place? I heard you went for ramen. I'd like to go back too. I'll take you there the next time I get off early, and I'll have Jacob personally prepare the meal because he's the best. Dad? Olivia's fingers halted as she interrupted Michael's words. She didn't know how to phrase it, how to convey the grim reality that his friend had just died at the hands of an assassin right in front of her. She simply didn't know what to say. What's bothering you? Michael couldn't help but be curious about Olivia's hesitation. Is something wrong? Did you not have a good time with Wendy? No, Olivia replied, taking a deep breath. She decided it was time to gently break the news to her father. Liv! At that moment, Chris entered the mansion. Chris? Olivia was taken aback and Michael stood up. Mr. Johnson, if it's all right, I need to have a word with Liv. Chris nodded to Michael and signaled Olivia to follow him. Liv, come with me. All right. Olivia agreed and followed Chris out of the mansion. She wondered why he needed to speak to her at this time. Shouldn't Chris be with Dusty? Once outside, Olivia saw Sven's sapphire blue sports car parked there. Sven waved to her from the driver's seat, and Dusty, dressed in all white, stood nearby. Liv, Dusty wants to stay with you for now, now that his father's gone, Chris said to Olivia. Chris seemed to understand that if Dusty was near Olivia, 
he could protect her, which put Chris at ease. Chris had investigated Franco Alva today after Olivia mentioned the name, and he found that Alva had, in fact, dispatched assassins to take care of Jacob and Dusty. It was remarkable that this father and son had held their ground so well without any preparation, and that only one was successfully killed. But Chris wanted to find out more about why they had been targeted. Olivia was momentarily surprised before she approached Dusty. She asked, Dusty, are you sure about wanting to stay with me? I am, Dusty nodded. Your father was like a brother to my dad, and you saved my life. So I will save yours should you ever need it. He recalled his father Jacob's last words before his death. There was something exceptional about Olivia, and despite Chris's immense capabilities, Dusty had a strong sense that Olivia's future accomplishments would be equally remarkable, if not greater. It was a gut feeling. If you wish for vengeance, staying by Chris is your best option, Olivia stated frankly. However, Dusty's words today touched her heart, and she hoped to have his assistance. It was assistance that would be dedicated to her cause. I know, Dusty nodded, gazing earnestly at Olivia. But I trust your family, and I feel more comfortable staying with you for now if that's okay. Very well, Olivia said to Dusty after contemplating the matter. My father is inside the house right now. Can you inform him about your dad? They were best friends and I can't bear to tell him. I will, Dusty said solemnly and made his way toward the mansion. Liv, I'll pick you up tomorrow night, Chris said, his voice tinged with mystery. You owe me one favor. What kind of favor do you want me to fulfill? Olivia felt like she'd become a genie's lamp for Chris, always granting him new wishes. I have an older family member visiting the city who was keen on your cooking after seeing you on television, Chris said with a cryptic smile. I'd like you to prepare some dishes for him tomorrow. It's very important to me. Fine, Olivia said. This favor, after all, seemed harmless enough. Cooking for an old guy? Why not? Liv shrugged as Chris got back into his car. Watching the sapphire blue sports car receding into the distance, Olivia let out a sigh. It appeared that she needed to prepare an exceptional meal tomorrow and to consider the old man's food preferences. With these thoughts in mind, she headed back to her mansion. Upon entering, she found Dusty standing near the sofa, while Michael lay on it with an incredulous expression. Just a few days ago, they'd been joking like good friends, so it was shocking to see such an unexpected turn of events. The police reported that someone entered the shop with a gun and robbed us, Dusty explained, his head slightly lowered. I haven't gone out to restock the store or else... Dusty, this is all fate, Michael sighed, standing up and patting Dusty on the shoulder. You can stay with us and consider this your home while your father's affairs are settled if you'd like. Dad, which room should Dusty sleep in? Olivia inquired as she approached Michael. I'll have the maids prepare it. The guest room on the left on the second floor, Michael recalled and replied after some thought. All right, Olivia nodded and arranged for the maid to clean the room. She had a reasonable recollection of that room. It wasn't very large, but it had good sunlight and lighting, lacking the humidity of Olivia's room. It was a decent choice. Mr. Johnson, don't be too disheartened, Dusty comforted him. My father used to say that he dreamt of opening his own Japanese restaurant and becoming a chef like the one in Midnight Dining Hall back in college. At least he realized his dream. Yes, Olivia chimed in. The last time I saw Jacob, he also said that his life wasn't lived in vain. I take solace in that, Michael sighed and looked at Dusty and Olivia. I should head back to the study, Liv. You show Dusty around the house. Of course, Olivia nodded. Michael sighed and ascended the stairs to his study. Dusty, let me give you a tour, Olivia said, leading the way as she pointed out each room in the house. When they reached her bedroom, she opened the door and said, This is my bedroom. We're neighbors, so to speak. I see, Dusty replied. Facing away from Dusty, Olivia spoke softly. Dusty? I lack the background and power of Chris Jones. Every day I'm practically making things harder for myself, because it seems ever since I moved here, there are countless people who want me dead. 
Her voice maintained its gentle and steady tone. Dusty silently watched Olivia as she spoke these words. She read his thoughts and said, It will take a long time to reach the heights you're imagining I could reach. So while I understand that you want to stay by my side to make sure I'm safe, I don't know if it'll be that worthwhile for you just yet. It might be more of a risk than a reward. Are you truly prepared for this? This was her final inquiry to Dusty. She didn't want to hold anyone back and had her own path to tread and goals to attain, all of which required time. I'm aware, Dusty replied with determination. That's good, Olivia said, turning around to face him. The maid should have finished cleaning your room. Let's go take a look. All right, Dusty nodded. Olivia closed her bedroom door and led Dusty to his room. As they entered, a maid finished tidying up and nodded at both of them before departing. Dusty stepped into the room, recognizing it as his new place of residence. If you need anything, let me know. I'm going to see my father. He must be devastated, Olivia said, patting Dusty's arm before heading to Michael's study. She knocked on the door. Come in. Michael's voice came from within. Pushing the door open, Olivia found Michael turned away, wiping tears from the corners of his eyes. On the desk in front of him lay a photograph. As Olivia approached, she could see it was a picture of Michael with his band from back in the day. He looked young and unassuming, quite different from his current mature and composed self. The shorter guy beside him had an arm draped over his shoulder, creating a playful contrast. In the blink of an eye, so many years have passed. Michael sighed. Dad. Olivia walked to his side, resting her arm on his shoulder. I'm sorry. Thank you. He patted Olivia's shoulder, then continued. Your uncle Jacob might not be reliable, impulsive in his actions and thoughtless, but he's more meticulous than anyone else. Yes. Olivia listened attentively. All right. Michael sighed. At least he lived doing what he loved. Michael's gaze shifted slightly, contemplating what would have happened if it were him who had passed away. He lowered his head, peering at the photograph on the table. What if it were me? Dad, don't talk like that. Olivia scolded him, her brow furrowed. I know, I won't. Michael looked at Olivia, then at the photograph. Liv, do you think it's too late for me to pursue my dream now? It's never too late. Olivia's eyes brightened. Is that so? Michael seemed genuinely moved. Dad, you have to believe in yourself, Olivia said, holding his hand excitedly. After all this time, she had finally convinced him. No matter your age, as long as you have a dream, you must pursue it. Liv, how's your game project progressing? Michael asked, his gaze fixed on her. It's going really well. Olivia smiled and nodded. Our game is in a contest right now where the winner gets a bunch of money to help take their business to the next level and make more investment money. Not only have we reached the finals, but we're also making six figures per week. She looked at him, her beautiful eyes shimmering. Dad, would you be interested in investing? She didn't really need her father's investment but she was hoping to get her father to transfer a large portion of his money into her company's account so she could keep it safe from his brother Bruno before he took more money from Michael's company. She wanted to make sure Michael still had money after Bruno bled Johnson's food dry. Investment? Michael considered this proposal, intrigued by the idea. Yeah, Olivia confirmed. Right now, I've invested nearly a million in the game studio. Francis put in the same, and Steve Shook invested a lot too. However, most of the money had already gone into the game development. You invested nearly one million? Michael looked at Olivia in surprise. Liv, where did you get a million? I... Olivia hesitated. How could she explain her source of funds? Was she going to say she exchanged stolen weapons for money? Olivia rolled her eyes and replied. Well... Do you remember that guy that came and took me away earlier and left me a box of gold bars? She couldn't help but admire herself for thinking on her feet. Oh, Michael nodded. In that case, I'll give you two million to further invest. Two million? 
Olivia was about to accept when she hesitated. Michael still had his own wealth within the Johnson family, but if things continued the way they were going, Bruno would drain all the company's assets. Eventually, Michael would be left with a mere shell filled with debts. Olivia definitely didn't want to see that outcome. She thought it might be better to slowly withdraw Michael's money bit by bit and work toward a solution over time. Dad, making games is much more expensive than you think. Olivia started to sound worried. We currently have only enough funds for creating simple single-player games. To expand and develop further, expenses will grow considerably. Right now, it's already challenging for us to finance the next steps. We can't secure enough funds. Olivia observed Michael's expression as she continued. Why don't you help me raise the funds? How about 10 million? 10 million, that's a substantial amount. Michael looked at Olivia. A sum of money was trivial to him, but handing it over to a high school student, Michael was worried that Olivia wouldn't be able to resist the temptations of the world. Actually, 10 million is only enough for us to complete the basic development of this single player game. Olivia explained, her eyes shining with enthusiasm. She led Michael back to her room, intending to show him their game. Dad, you'll understand when I show you our game. Olivia guided Michael to her room and seated him in front of the computer. Turning on the computer, the system recognized that someone other than Olivia was using it, so it switched to the virtual computer system. Olivia navigated the game's contest official website and found their game. The game had gained considerable popularity in the contest, as Francis had mentioned. The creative team used numerous strategies to boost its visibility. The game even received a front-page banner recommendation from the official website. Clicking on it, Olivia explained the game's details to Michael. Dad, have a look. Our game currently has seven levels, and you've seen the messages. We've garnered a lot of attention, and many players are eagerly awaiting the release of the next levels. How many levels do you plan to create? Michael inquired. Well, Olivia replied, this part of the story will conclude after 10 levels, but it will feature a completely open ending. The outcomes depend on the player's reactions. If they really enjoy the game and there's a market for it, we'll release a sequel. The second game will be our flagship mobile game, not a single player like this. A mobile game? Michael glanced at Olivia. Then what is this game about? In essence, this game serves as a test for us, Olivia explained. We plan to make a series of subsequent games in the same characters as part of a marketing strategy to build, like, brand loyalty. That sounds like a good idea, Michael nodded. Such marketing strategies were quite common in the business world. But we need strong financial support, Olivia stated. I'm not considering financing at the moment. One reason is that the company hasn't been formally established yet, she clarified, mostly because we're all still high school students. Our studies obviously remain our top priority. The primary reason for her decision was that Olivia, along with her other team members, were still minors. She didn't want to burden anyone else with the responsibilities of being the company's legal representative. Yes, Michael agreed. Education should always come first. That's correct, hence we're facing a financial challenge right now. Olivia placed her hand on Michael's shoulder and continued. So, Dad... Would you be willing to invest for now? I can't promise huge returns, but I believe we will have year-end dividends. <laughs> Michael chuckled, finding it amusing when his daughter suggested giving him a year-end bonus. All right, send your company's bank account details to Ansel Parr. Tomorrow, I'll have him contact you about it. Thank you, Dad. Olivia expressed her gratitude enthusiastically. This was just the beginning. She needed to move quickly transferring as much as she could to prevent Michael from losing everything. While Grandpa Jack and Bruno could do as they pleased, she only needed to keep an eye on her father's assets. Olivia's joyful expression brought a smile to Michael's face. His current situation at work was uncertain, and if he could save some money for Olivia, it would be good, he figured. If the circumstances he hoped to avoid truly unfolded, he wouldn't want to see Olivia and Victoria living a difficult life again. While Victoria's family was still around, he couldn't rely on help from afar. He didn't know whether they would return to the U.S. or not, so he had to be prepared. With sufficient funds in hand, 
Olivia contacted Francis that night and asked him to continue monitoring the game's progress. Francis was ecstatic when he learned that another big investment would be available for further development. Originally, they had only managed to complete the seventh level due to funding constraints. Wendy's script, in fact, extended to the tenth level. With this additional funding, they could actually finish the game. Francis was even more excited than Olivia. He had a deep appreciation for the final ending in Wendy's conception of the game. He believed that once the game was completed, it would captivate players. In the world of games, reputation is often more important than marketing. The following day, Olivia prepared the menu she intended to create for Chris's older relative. After sending the list of ingredients to Chris, he arranged for someone to handle the purchases. In the afternoon, Chris arrived to pick Liv up. Observing Olivia and Chris getting into the car together, Monica clenched her fists, trembling with anger. She had won, hadn't she? So why wasn't Chris paying attention to her? What's happening? In the presidential suite of the Orchid Hotel in New York City, Chef Mario Vincenzo pointed at the picture of Monica smiling in a magazine and exclaimed, The apprentice I had wanted is not her. There's been some sort of mix-up. Edward lowered his head, his palms and forehead slick with cold sweat. Sir, didn't you ask which one was in the yellow skirt? I told you it was her. No, I meant the other one. Chef Mario Vincenzo quivered with anger. He clearly desired another girl with a similar appearance. What's the name of that other girl from the competition? Edward gritted his teeth, filled with reluctance. He had manipulated Olivia's dishes. Why did his mentor still favor her? Her name is Olivia. Bruno hurriedly interjected to smooth things over. The sisters are very close, they often dress alike, and their actions are similar. It's easy to see how Edward made the mistake. I don't want this Monica girl as my apprentice, I want Olivia. Chef Mario Vincenzo insisted, frowning. Since he had called for the recruitment competition, he needed to choose the best apprentice. Edward and Bruno exchanged concerned glances. Now that the whole country had already heard Monica was Chef Mario Vincenzo's chosen apprentice, naming a new one at this stage would be a major humiliation. How could Monica face New York City society if this became public knowledge? Sir... The entire country is already aware that you've taken Monica as your disciple. Changing your choice now would bring shame to the Johnson family. Please reconsider. Bruno implored anxiously. Edward, apologize for your mistake. Sir, I deeply regret my mistake. Edward adverted his eyes. Chef Mario Vincenzo snorted in response. What about this? Bruno presented an idea. You and my father are both from the same area. Why don't you tell the public that you're doing my father a favor by nominally accepting Olivia as your apprentice as well? If she performs well in the future, you can officially take her as your apprentice at that point. Not a bad idea, Chef Mario Vincenzo mused, thinking it might be a viable solution. He said, I'll leave this matter to you. Thank you, sir, Bruno said. No matter what, he had to protect Monica first. Meanwhile, Olivia had already arrived at Chris's residence. After inquiring about the guest preferences and dietary restrictions, she began her culinary work. The timing couldn't have been better. Just as Olivia served the final dish and turned to add the finishing touches to the stew, Vera returned with the elderly man. Theodore, you must be hungry after your shopping trip. Please, come and eat quickly, Chris called out. There are so many historical sites in New York City. Vera said with a smile. Today, they had intentionally taken the old man's sightseeing. They had invited him to tour the city, but in reality, it was to provide Olivia with the time to prepare a table full of dishes. We've only visited a third of the places on our list today. I'll take you to the rest another day. Theodore remained silent from the moment he entered the door, his expression growing increasingly serious as the delightful aroma of the dishes filled the air. He took a deep breath attempting to identify each dish on the table. Come, Sven urged, gesturing for the old man to clean his hands with a wet towel on the table. He then assisted him to a seat. Please have a seat. I'll take your crutch for you. All right, Theodore acquiesced, sitting at the table while his eyes surveyed the spread. The chief had already considered his preferences. The dishes were all well-suited for an elderly person like him. 
with a focus on preserving freshness and maintaining a lighter flavor. The combination of meats and vegetables, along with the colorful presentation, was visibly appealing. Give it a try, Theodore, Chris offered, extending a pair of utensils. The old man accepted the utensils, picking up the nearest steamed bass and savoring it with care. He narrowed his eyes in satisfaction. The dish was expertly prepared. The fish's inherent taste was perfectly balanced, accompanied by a subtle hint of lemon fragrance. The bass, naturally tender and delicate, melted in his mouth. As he chewed, he could discern the fish's fibrous texture between his teeth and lips. Having sampled the bass, the old man proceeded to try a serving of stir-fried vegetable strips. The chef had stir-fried them quickly to retain their natural moisture, highlighting their crisp texture. This was a challenging skill to master given the delicate balance required between temperature and timing. The old man noted the varied thickness of vegetable strips, recognizing that the chef's knife skills were still a work in progress. After tasting each dish, the old man finally set down his fork, a meaningful smile curling his lips. What's the matter? Unable to discern the old man's intentions, Sven asked, Is there something wrong with the flavors? Are you youngsters conspiring to trick me? The old man quipped, giving the three of them a meaningful look. His intent was clear. They needed to be less formal and more sincere. Not at all, Vera replied with a slight pout. We just wanted to welcome you properly. You've come all the way to New York City and we couldn't let you leave without enjoying a good meal. That's right, Sven chimed in. We only know one chef who can cook this well, and that's why we invited her here. With your exceptional culinary skills, it's hard for us to be impressed by ordinary fare. Sven's praise lightened the old man's expression considerably. Theodore, Chris addressed him, leaning slightly forward and placing his hands on the table. What do you think? Are you interested in taking on this girl as your apprentice? The old man, smart since he was young, felt torn. He had been tempted yesterday, but wasn't he still hesitant? Maybe he would regret not taking in such a talented individual. However, he also felt like he was past the days of teaching others how to become master chefs. Just as he grappled with his dilemma, Olivia emerged with soup in hand. She set the pot of soup in the center of the table, lifting the lid to release an intoxicating aroma. Here you go, Olivia glanced at Chris, unsure of what name to use. Theodore, Chris reminded her. Theodore, the soup is ready, Olivia smiled, offering a bowl of soup to the old man. Let me know if there are any dishes you find unsuitable or if you have any specific preferences. The old man picked up the bowl of soup and took a sip before setting it down with a heavy sigh. Olivia was perplexed. Could her stewed soup really be that unpalatable? She had faced a similar situation during yesterday's competition, even losing to Monica. The old man scrutinized Olivia and asked, Young lady, do you want to become my apprentice and learn the art of cooking? Upon hearing the old man's proposal, Olivia momentarily froze. Then she shook her head decisively. I'm not interested. Why would she want to become his apprentice and learn cooking? She already had her godmother Desiree to teach her how to cook. Besides, her goal was to establish a game company, not a restaurant. She believed that happiness was the key when it came to cooking. And if she was forced to cook for her job, she wouldn't be happy doing it. Are you out of your mind? Vera couldn't help but roll her eyes in exasperation upon hearing Olivia's response. This was an opportunity that many people could only dream of in their lifetime. Why would this seemingly naive girl decline it? Sweetie, you should hurry up and accept him as your mentor. What are you waiting for? Sven urged impatiently. They had gone to great lengths for this opportunity. Ah, ah, ah. The old man laughed heartily. Do you even know who I am, little girl? Oh. Olivia glanced at Chris and then at the old man. You're Chris's grandpa's brother or something, right? His older relative? <laughs> the old man chuckled again. Chris, you really didn't tell her anything. There was no need, Chris replied, 
confident that once the old man saw Olivia, the matter of taking an apprentice would be settled. Good, good. The old man expressed his satisfaction. He looked over at the dishes on the table and asked, Are these all your signature dishes? More or less, Olivia nodded. She had chosen light and delicate dishes because she knew that the guests they were inviting were of an older generation. She understood that such cuisine was easier on the digestion of elderly individuals. Young lady, you're not willing to become my apprentice, the old man asked, gazing directly at Olivia. To be honest, I don't have much interest in pursuing a career in cooking. I've never considered becoming a chef or anything of the sort. Olivia replied, rubbing her hands and offering an apologetic smile. I have more important goals that I came back to life for, she thought. I find joy in cooking and I can do it freely. However, adding the burden of a profession might make it less enjoyable. You have a point, the old man agreed. In that case, consider this as learning the essence as a hobby. How about it? Thanks to me, you won't be bound by any obligations. You can continue doing as you please. I'll fulfill my role as a master, imparting knowledge and answering your questions. Hmm? Olivia was taken aback, studying the old man closely. What exactly did he mean by fulfilling his role as a master? As the saying goes, a master instructs and answers questions. The old man clarified, that's all I can do. Thank you for your kind offer. Olivia said with a grateful smile, but I'll have to pass, unfortunately. While she enjoyed cooking, she didn't wish to dedicate too much time to it. She had other pursuits to focus on. Are you crazy? Vera exclaimed, stomping her foot in frustration. Liv, do you know who this person is? Yes, your older relative, Olivia replied. No, he's Theodore Jones, the leader of the most world-renowned generation of chefs are responsible for basically all modern cooking. Sven interjected, rolling his eyes. Sweetie, do you have any idea how much effort we put into convincing him to take you on as an apprentice after we saw you lose to your half-sister in that competition on TV? Why don't you appreciate this incredible opportunity? He's a world-renowned chef? Olivia was taken aback. She had only ever met one of those old celebrity chefs when she met Chef Chang whom she had encountered at the Cooper family banquet, where Beatrix Cooper tried to make her look bad. You're Theodore Jones? Yep, the old man chuckled while nodding. So how about it? Learning from me isn't a bad deal, is it? Feeling tempted? But aren't you retired? Olivia asked, tilting her head as she looked at Theodore. Theodore's mouth twitched at this point. Did they really need to bring up that matter? That's not important. Chris interjected, giving Sven a significant look. Little girl, Theodore said, clearing his throat as he addressed Olivia. If you want to become my apprentice today, you'll need to decide now. Olivia gazed at Theodore, acknowledging that this was a remarkable opportunity. With his backing, she could not only establish herself in New York City, but also gain influence throughout the country. However, the responsibilities and obligations that came with it were significant. Olivia pursed her lips and glanced at Theodore, deeply moved yet cautious. There were certain things she needed to make clear first. What are you waiting for? Sven urged, knowing full well how temperamental this culinary master could be. If he decided to go back on his word later, even a herd of a buffalo couldn't change his mind. Theodore, Olivia said, smiling faintly as she raised the corner of her mouth. I appreciate your kindness. I'm genuinely tempted. But there are a few conditions I'd like to clarify. First, I won't leave New York for the time being. Her quest for revenge had yet to be completed and she couldn't leave. Second, I won't make cooking my profession. It was her passion, not a job. Third, if I become your apprentice, I'll respect your rules but I'll also uphold my own. I hope you won't force me to cook things I don't want to cook. It was better to establish certain boundaries in advance. Very well. Theodore clapped his hands in satisfaction, impressed by Olivia's level-headedness. His identity and status didn't intimidate her, and she was willing to negotiate. 
This showed mutual respect and a rare combination of intelligence and strong will. I agree. All right, then I'll be your apprentice. Olivia smiled. Good girl. Theodore nodded with a smile. Now that I've accepted you as my apprentice, I'll visit your home tomorrow. After all, I should meet your father. Okay, I'll prepare everything. Olivia agreed. No need, I'll visit them before I depart. Starting tonight, I'll be quite busy. Theodore stated. He looked at Chris and said, You'll handle the details of my visit, won't you, and get everything ready? Of course, I won't let you down. Chris affirmed. What does he mean, get everything ready? Olivia asked, puzzled. It's a significant event for him to take on a new apprentice, Chris explained with a meaningful smile. We want to give it the importance it deserves. At night, Chris and Sven escorted Olivia home. While in the car, Olivia couldn't help but feel that the events of the past two days seemed like a dream. During the chef recruitment competition, Olivia lost to Monica and felt inferior to a cooking machine. Yet, she had now become Theodore Jones' apprentice after capturing his attention. Her life had taken a roller coaster like turn, which could only be described as fantastical. But when she thought about it, it made sense. Her entire experience of being reborn was already wild enough. All these new twists and turns were just par for the course. We're here, Sven announced, bringing the car to a steady stop at the entrance of Yee's mansions. He glanced at Olivia through the rear view mirror. I'll see you tomorrow. See you tomorrow, Olivia replied with a smile and nodded. As she stepped out of the car, Olivia was surprised to see that Chris had also exited the vehicle. Is there something you need? Come with me for a moment, Chris said, taking hold of Olivia's wrist and leading her toward her house. How will you thank me? Olivia realized that she owed Chris another favor. How would you like me to thank you? You act so independently every day, Chris teased, his eyes twinkling. Liv, aren't we even closer now? Blushing slightly at Chris's teasing, Olivia stared at him and playfully said, That's right, your older relative is my mentor, so really, I'm sort of hanging out with a generation older than you. You should probably call me auntie now. Aunt, Chris raised an eyebrow. This girl was quite clever. Despite him helping her, she was trying to tease him. Without warning, Chris stepped closer, his arms encircling her waist. He leaned in and whispered in her ear, I'll call you aunt, but shouldn't you also call me the guy you have a crush on? You! Olivia's face flushed red, her ears turning crimson. She tried to push Chris away, but he took a step back, smiling and waving his hand. Sleep well, auntie. Your crush has to go. Chris, you are so... so... ugh! Olivia wanted to respond, but found herself at a loss for words. All she could do was stomp her foot in frustration. In high spirits, Chris settled into the sapphire blue sports car, patting Sven on the shoulder. Let's go, brother Condor. Huh? Sven was momentarily bewildered. Why was he suddenly Brother Condor? That was never his nickname before. Chris was becoming increasingly eccentric. Sven thought as he started the car and pressed down on the accelerator. Hearing the engine's roar, a sly grin spread across Sven's lips. He had an insatiable love for this sound. The mere thought of a day without the chance to drive a sports car sent shivers down his spine. It would be worse than a death sentence. He accelerated along the road, which was devoid of other vehicles at that moment. The pedal pressed firmly against the floor, creating a symphony of wind whistling, tires gripping the road, and the sheer thrill of speed. Sven's excitement swelled with every passing second. He relished this exhilaration. Sven, it's about time, Chris reminded him, glancing at the scenery flashing by the window. All right. Sven reluctantly eased off the accelerator. Just as he did, a black Bentley came hurtling toward them. Its momentum was terrifying as it charged forward against the traffic. Damn it! Sven cursed and quickly swerved to avoid a collision 